Good evening. This is Sergeant X. They say that ghosts and the like just don't exist. That when a person passes on, he just lies quietly, not bothering another soul, so to speak. You believe that, don't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, did you ever hear about the skull that walked? No? Then listen, my friends, to the Mystery Playhouse. I guess uh, superstition is a pretty hard thing to down completely, isn't it? I mean, uh, under certain circumstances, almost anybody can get the creeps and get them good. I guess most of us are a little bit afraid of the unknown. For instance, uh, taking a midnight stroll through a graveyard isn't exactly your idea of fun, is it? And I don't suppose you'd particularly go into ecstasies if you happen to witness a good gory murder, either. Well... There's a fellow I know who thinks this all comes under the heading of good, clean fun. His hobby is horror, and he likes to tell stories along those lines. I think he has one for you right now. Wait till I try this door here. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host. Well, come in, won't you? Yes, how are your spirits this evening? Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Our spirits are fine, too. Would you like to see them? Oh, it's no trouble at all. Now, um, which would you care to see first? The spirit or the body? Oh, well, the body is right over there on the floor. And the spirit is right next to it. Oh, oh, you can't see it. I forgot to tell you, you have to be one in order to see one. (laughs) Shall we get started? Well, naturally. Now, uh, turn out the lights. No, no, you won't see any ghosts in the dark, but (laughs) they'll be able to see you. Far from town, there are a group of three hills. On the summit of the highest of them is the Cruz estate, owned by two brothers, Arthur and Carl. At this moment, Carl and his wife, Lucille, are digging a hole at the entrance of the estate, planting young poplar trees. Carl, I think it's deep enough. Oh, I think we ought to go a little deeper down. Oh, here comes Spear. You're digging in? Yes, we're going to plant a whole row of Lombardy poplars. Mm-hmm. You you mean right here? Yep. We're going to line both sides of the road. Well, perhaps you'd better let me do it. I, I'm your caretaker. I should do the garden. Sue, <laughs> do look upset. What's the matter? Well, where you're digging is an old Indian burial spot. There's a curse on it. Oh, don't worry about it. Fair. You don't believe it? Of course not. Lucille and I don't go in for superstition. Yes, but it, it's no superstition, sir. It's uh... You hit a rock. Uh-huh. Oh, it sounds like a rock. A little hollow. Dig it up, whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, come on. It's a skull. Yes. A skull. The Spears is right. This place must have been an old Indian burial oh, ground. Please put it back. No, oh, keep it. Carl, perhaps you'd better put it oh, back. No. Please, please bury it again, Mr. Cruz. It will bring bad luck to all of us. No, Spears, that's just a silly, silly superstition. Well, uh, what about the rest of the skeleton? Well, well there doesn't, doesn't seem to be one. No. Just a skull. Uh, uh, you bring it into the house, will you, Spears? Oh, no, uh, I'd rather not. All right, I'll take it in myself. But don't either of you mention this to my brother, Arthur. He's terribly scared of things like this, and he's just gotten over his nervous breakdown. Carl, perhaps you should put the skull back. What? Seal, you're not being taken in by this hokum about curses, are you? That sounded like my wife, Mary. She was cleaning the windows. Good heaven. She fell out of the window. Mary. 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 
But she's unconscious. Please do something. You must do something. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do, Spears. She hit her head against a rock. She's dead. <laughs> Spears. He's quieted down. I can't understand it. There's only one rock underneath the window, and Mary hit that. That one rock. There isn't even a pebble around for yards. Well, don't go imagining things again, Arthur. Spears kept talking about a curse. Spears believes in pixies and gremlins, too, don't forget. Well, I feel rather funny about it all. Oh, Carl, maybe you'd better switch some more lamps on. This living room feels gloomy. Oh, let's cut this nonsense out. Wait. You hear anything? Oh? No, I don't. Yes. I think it's coming from the ceiling. What's well, coming from the ceiling? I don't hear... What is it? What? It must be the beams. I sometimes do that from the heat. It's not the beams. It's too regular a sound. What room is directly above us? It, it's an old bedroom. We use it as a storeroom now. It hasn't been opened in years. There's a lot of old things from years back, Lucille. Did you put the skull in the skull of Dora? Yes, I did. What are you two whispering of... It's coming down the stairs. We'll take a look at several minutes. So far... <laughs> look! At your feet, Carl. The skull. How, how did it get down here? It came down the steps. Seems to be looking up at us. A skull. How, how did it get into the house? Carl found it while digging. Spears said it belonged to some Indian. Spears was right. There is a curse on the house. We'll all be killed. I'm leaving. I can't stand it. Well, Carl, what are you going to do with the skull? Well, lock it up in the closet. Lock it. Carl, you'd better bury it again. No, I... I can't do that, Lucio. If I do, it means I believe in all this tummy rot about ghosts. Well, then suppose you tell me how a skull could open a door and then come bouncing down the steps. I don't know. Maybe someone's playing a trick on it, dear. What happened to Mary was no trick, Carl. Nor is this, and you know it. Well, whatever it is, I- I'm not going to bury it. We'll keep it locked up in the closet. Oh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, yes, What is it, Spears? Well, it it isn't my place to tell you, sir, but I... You're referring to the skull, aren't you? Yes, sir. Well, it won't bother us anymore. The whole thing's some queer trick. I've got it safely hidden in this closet. I'm putting a lock on the outside. But the lock isn't going to do any good, sir. It will break through the door, just like the last time. I don't think anything like that can happen again. I'm the only one that has a key to this lock. If the skull wants to break out... Have to come to me for the key. How are you feeling, Arthur? I'll never feel right in this house again. Oh, nonsense. Why don't you put a light on? Arthur, it's it's morbid sitting here in the dark by yourself. We're all going to die. Don't be ridiculous, Arthur. Where is the skull? Where it can't get out. Tomorrow I'll take it into town and let the police look at it. Tomorrow will be too late. Look, I, I'm getting tired of this. You've got to get hold of yourself. You, you'll go completely to pieces. You think I'm a coward, don't you? Oh, Arthur, no. You're not a coward. You're just a victim of your own exaggerated imagination. Wait. There's someone at the door. Oh. I'll open it. Who is it? I... I don't know. No one came in. Something came in! For heaven's sake, put the light on! The skull. I... I can't believe it. You can't believe it. (laughs) There it is. Grinning at you from the floor, but you can't believe it. You don't believe in these things. I... I put a lock on the door. Locks aren't going to help... Nothing is going to help. We're all going to die. It 
uh, it's an hour later now. Arthur has gotten over his hysteria, but he is still terrified. I'm not going to spend another night in this house, Carl. But, Arthur, there's got to be some logical explanation. I'm not in the least bit curious. I just want to get out of here tonight. I'm going to go with him, Carl. Lucy. Lucy. Well... Perhaps we'll bury it again. We'll put it back in the same place we found that it. That won't do any good. It's too late now. Don't be ridiculous. If it wants anything at all, it wants to get buried again. I'm sure all this mysterious business will come to an end as soon as we bury it. The house won't ever be the same. Oh, stop it. Both of you. You're acting like a couple of scared children. We'll put the skull back where we found it and, and we won't be bothered by it anymore. Spears! Spears! Uh, yes, Mr. Cruz. This... This skull... Let's take it out and bury it in the same place where we found it. I'm glad you reconsidered, sir. It's the only way. I don't seem to remember the spot. Well, it's on the other side, sir, right near the entrance road. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Here it is. Yes. But the hole we dug, it's not here. I... I filled it in, sir. Oh, well, we'd better dig it up. Yes, sir. If you'll hold the skull, I'll dig it open. We might as well do it right. I know exactly how deep it was. If you don't mind, Miss Cruz, I'd rather not touch the skull. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. There. I'll put the thing back. But it... It doesn't seem to want to go back. No, I just missed dropping it into the hole. Uh, hold the flashlight down here. Yes, sir. Well, that does it. Oh, I hope we'll have no more trouble. Well, Carl, did you bury it? Yes, same place. That's all. Forget about it, shall we? Maybe it's easy for you, Carl. But I won't forget about it for a long time. Neither will I. I'll be having nightmares about it for months. I don't know what's gotten into you, Lucille. You're never easily frightened. I'm not. But skulls that roll by themselves give me a funny feeling. Mm. Well, uh, look, come on, let's play cards, huh? Cards? We don't need more than three hands to play. We'll forget the whole crazy business, huh? Okay? I might as well. All right, steal the cards. Okay. You. Yeah. Now, well, we're getting back to normalcy, huh? Arthur, that's your card. That wind came up suddenly. Who's first? You are. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, nine done. You'll go, Arthur. Come on, Arthur, throw a card. I think I hear something. Of course you do. The wind. No, I... I thought I heard a rapping sound. Look, just pay attention to the game and stop listening for sound. Here's my card. You threw a club, diamonds for suit. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you hear that? What was that? Sorry, the wind blowing the shutter. Oh, come on, let's play. Throw a card, Arthur. There's someone at the door. It isn't the wind. Someone's outside. All right, I'll open the door. No, no don't open it. Please, Lucille. Sitting here frightened isn't going to do us any good. We've got to open the door. Don't open it, Carl. Who is it, Carl? What? Uh... It was it's nothing. It's just the wind. You're lying. Your face is white as a sheet. I know. It's the skull. It's come back. I, I tell you, it's nothing. It, it, just the wind. Nobody was there. I'll see for myself. Hey! The skull! Mrs. Cruz, I, I didn't hear you knock. I didn't. I want to talk to you, Spears. Uh, yes, Mrs. Cruz, but it, it's rather late. You've been up late before. Oh, yes, but it, it's just that I'm tired tonight. I, I don't mean to be rude. You've been doing a lot of night work? What are you referring to, Mrs. Cruz? Spears, you don't really believe in skulls that move around by themselves, do you? Well, I, I warned your husband about it. It's a curse. Is it part of a curse for a skull to use a trowel to unbury itself? Your trowel? My trowel? 
Oh, you're mistaken. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not. I just came from there. Why would I want to do anything like that? Mm -hmm. Why? Why well, I'm here. I'd like to know why. Please, Mrs. Cruz, I I'm tired. We'll talk about it in the morning. We'll talk about it now, Spears, right now. Get out of my room. All right. I'm going straight to the police. I've got the trowel. We'll see if the skull left any fingerprints. You won't do that, Mrs. Cruz. Oh, yes, I will. All right, Spears, just sit right where you are. I'll shoot. Oh, please. Put the gun down. Start talking. Well, it's all a mistake. If you don't start talking, I'll shoot. In self-defense. Did you dig up that skull? Well, I... I did you? Yes. Yes, I did. And you rolled the skull down the steps. The first night it was in this house, didn't you? Well, it was only a joke. I... And you also managed to open the closet. Yes, but I... Whose skull is it? I don't know. You're lying. That skull has something to do with you. I checked up on it. Your first wife disappeared. Perhaps the police can identify the skull. Oh, please, don't go to the police. I... Well, it was my first wife, Jane. I, I killed her. I didn't want your husband to bring the skull to the police... So I tried to scare all of you away from here as the safest measure. Go on. Yes. Wait a minute. Who rolled the skull into Arthur's room? It wasn't me. It must That's have been... That's right. It was me. Perhaps you and I can work things out. I tried to frighten my dear brother-in-law Arthur away so that I can have complete ownership of the entire estate. You see, Arthur is leaving tonight. Yeah. Perhaps we can help each other. No one has to know of our little conversation. No one is going to know. Well, now that we've both accomplished our purpose, maybe it would be the best thing to bury the skull again. Yes. We'll do it now. Well, here we are. Let's hurry. They'll miss me if I'm out here too long. Perhaps we'd better dig another hole. It doesn't matter. Will you hold the skull? No. I... But now... You haven't suddenly gotten squeamish, have you, Mrs. Cruz? Put the skull in the ground and dig that hole. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? The skull. Look at it. What about it? Smooth. Can't you see? Well, that it is it, just the wind pushing it. Hurry up. There. Yes, there. It's deep enough now. Hand me the skull. Oh, I forgot you. You won't touch it. All right, I'll get it myself. What's the matter? My hand. I can't get my hand out. The jaws. Clamp yes. down. Your hand. Please. Help me. You've got to help me. Help me. Something. You've got to do something. You've got to let go. Oh, please, Jane. Jane, darling. I didn't mean to kill you. You're my wife. I, I didn't mean it. It was an accident. Please don't believe me. I, I'll do anything. Hey, you. Oh, no. No, Jane. No. Oh. How is she, Carl? Oh, pretty bad. The doctor says it's hopeless. There's nothing more I can do. Her hair is turned completely white. She's just out of her mind. Horrible. Spears died this morning. He never recovered consciousness. Died of fright. Everything else seems to make sense, but I, I don't understand how the skull could have clamped its jaws on his hand. When he picked it up, he must have picked it up upside down. The lower jaw, which swings on a hinge came down. He was so frightened that his hand froze to the skull. Spears was just frightened to death. <laughs> I want that skull. Yes, sir, I want it as a knocker for the inner sanctum door. Good night. Pleasant <laughs> dreams. <laughs> well, uh, 
thank you very much, friend Raymond. Your sense of humor is really quite refreshing. That is in a ghoulish sort of way. <laughs> we'll be trying your creaking door again soon for some more laughs. All right, now, let's look in on the green room where the players are rehearsing the next performance in the Mystery Playhouse. Follow me, please. Come. Hey, Dexter, how's it feel to be both a spy-catching hero and a prospective bridegroom at the same time? At the moment, it feels like being a 13th sardine and a tin built for 12. My doghouse is always like this. Hey, finish your story, Stanley, about Dexter reporting the German agent that, uh, what's his name? Quartz. Quartz, yeah. Well, Dexter here figures that Quartz is up to something, so he tips off the FBI. Yeah. Hey, hey, you guys, take a look at that gal in the black dress. <laughs> That's fine thought for a guy who's about to get married. Well, go on, Stanley. <laughs> Dexter's only trying to change the subject. Well... Following up Dexter's tip, the federal men trapped Quartz. Uh-huh. That was six weeks ago. <laughs> so today, in three minutes, in fact, Quartz is going to get quite a shock. Quite a shock. You mean they're going to... That's right. At six o'clock, that'll be less than three minutes now, Quartz is being electrocuted. You ought to read the newspapers, Lieutenant, and find out about things. Well, when you've just got back from the canal zone, you're likely to neglect the newspapers for the first few days. <laughs> hey, the guy behind us. Oh, what'd you say, Dexter? The guy behind us. One in the black dress. Oh. Mom's too thick. I can't even turn around to get a look at her. Hey, go on, Sammy. What was this court after? Clams of a new type mortar, wasn't it, Dexter? Mortar? Oh, I, I can't say. Oh, don't be such a clam. But it's taboo, I tell you. Well, don't get sore about it. Oh, who's sore? Come on, come on. Let's get out of this mob and find some less crowded joint, huh? Oh, take it easy. Let's have at least one drink here now we finally got to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! Oh, what the heck? Well, what's the matter, Dexter? Somebody step on your corn? Oh, no, it... Felt like someone stuck a needle in my hand, but the way I'm wedged in here, I can't even lift my hand to see. <laughs> Probably a pen scratched you with all these women about. Hey, Dexter, according to the clock on the wall there, Quartz is being executed right this second. Hey, it's kind of close in here. Let's get out and get some fresh air. Take a look in the mirror over the bar, Stanley. That woman behind me. Mm-hmm. That's what Dexter's been muttering about. The brunette in black. Smooth. Hey, do you know her? What makes you think I know her? Well, I thought she nodded at you. Just my natural good looks. <laughs> I never saw her before in my life. It's uh, kind of close in here. Let's get out. I can hardly breathe. Oh, stop clowning, Dexter. Quit leaning on me. What's eating, Dexter? Just because he's going to be married. In three days. <laughs> you shouldn't have mentioned married, Stanley. From the way he's leaning on me, he must have faded. <laughs> That's all the fright. <laughs> Come on, Dexter. Take your weight off of him. Oh, I'd lose that care of myself. This. Say, Stanley. He has painted or something. No kidding. Oh, Dexter's a practical child. Oh, this isn't a joke. He's all gray about the lips. Huh? Look at him. I'm holding his wallet. Oh, Dexter. Dexter, Dexter, what's the matter? Dexter. Hey, what's the matter? What's the matter? Is he all right? What's the matter with him? He's all right. No. He isn't. I, I think he's dead. Well, it's impossible. Is, uh, is there a doctor here? Oh, open his collar or something. Just a little late there. Lieutenant, what on earth happened? The doctor, maybe he can tell us. Hey, doctor, why are we here? Ralph, here, let's have a look. Oh. Help me turn this man over. Sure. Mm. Looks like he's been suffocated. Doctor, is he dead? Oh, yes, he's dead all right. They can't be. O- only a minute ago, he-, he was standing here talking with us. He said something about somebody sticking a needle in his hand. What's that piece of black paper on the back of his right hand? Yeah, what? Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Hmm. It's thin black cardboard. Perfect circle, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. With a tiny hole in the exact center. Hmm. Well, that's a funny There's a small puncture in the skin on the back of the right hand. Right over the place where this circular piece of cardboard was. A drop of blood caused the cardboard to adhere to his hand. Somebody better call the police. The police? Why? Because it looks as if your friend here has been murdered. But he couldn't have been murdered. I was standing right beside him all the time. No one to leave. Everybody stay right where you are. And you over there. Call the police department and ask for homicide. <laughs> Detective Sergeant Locke. Are you the doctor who called headquarters? Yes, that's right. Who's the guy on the floor? What happened to him? Willard Dexter. As to what happened to him, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? 
Who was nearest Dexter at the time? Well, the lieutenant and I were with him. That's and right. I was behind him, and so was this lady. Oh, you were, huh? How about that lady? Yes, I guess that's right. Okay, then I want to take you two ladies, and you, lieutenant, and you, mister, aside for questioning. We'll go in this office here. All right, doctor, would you come along too, please? Of course, sergeant. All right, just step in. Or... All right, Blondie, you two. Oh, I can't. Ten minutes Go on, time. get in there. Am I arrested? Are you? Look, Blondie, you will be in just about one second if you don't get in there. Oh, all right, but don't call me Blondie. Hey, Durkin, don't let anyone in here. Right. Now, we'll get a little privacy. Uh, Lieutenant, let's have your story first. Well, we were standing in the crowd. Your name? Lieutenant Max Lerbach. Okay, go ahead. Well, Stanley and Dexter and I were at the bar. In what order? Order? Oh, uh... Well, Dexter was on the right. I was in the middle, and Stanley was on the left. All right, go on. Dexter said that someone stuck a needle in his hand. Then suddenly he went limp and fell to the floor. Sergeant, on the back of his right hand, I found this little black cardboard disc. Yeah. Under the disc is a small wound, and I've made a study of poisons. I believe that this man, Dexter, was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes. There's a poison which, taken internally, may do no harm at all. But the smallest bit introduced directly into the bloodstream... Causes almost immediate paralysis of the nerves which control the breathing. What poison? Curare. Huh? There's a trace of what seems to be curare on the underside of that black cardboard disc. And you'll think he was murdered? It appears probable. Your idea, Doctor, is that someone jabbed a poison-coated needle into Dexter's hand? A minute or so before he collapsed. Now, where would a guy get this stuff? Well, certainly not from the average drugstore. Curare is made by the South American Indians. It's a very rare in this country. Say, Stanley, did you notice... Dexter died at the same time Quartz was executed. Say, I hadn't thought What's of that. What's that? The spy who was electrocuted? Yes, Sergeant. Dexter was the clerk in the Army Ordnance Department who suspected Quartz and tipped off the FBI. Yeah? It couldn't have been a coincidence that they both died at practically the same minute. You don't suppose... I don't suppose anything yet. Hey, Sarge. Photo and fingerprint boys are here. Right away, Dagan. Now, everyone, just sit tight a minute. Say, that's a rather unusual way to kill somebody, don't you think? I wonder if that police sergeant is right, and the killer really is one of those four people. Well, it's too bad our time is all up, or we could stay around and find out. I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next time when we present the entire story of Death in the Doghouse. This is Sergeant X, closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. Forces Radio Service.
Beyond that in this cave by the restless sea to reveal the horror in man's mind. Listen to the weird circle. Listen to the waves. Listen closely, for you will hear the crying of lost souls. Our story discloses the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city to a large house in the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Oh, that's strange. Very wonderful. Well, hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra. I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroat. Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, <laughs> The man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charm. Oh, but my husband loves me, Jim. Must be my fatal fascination. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well... There's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra. The strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes, very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? The one in the picture. What? <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Sandra. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 please. Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture. Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. Well, what do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. Door slammed by itself, too. Woo! Tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happened. All right. Mrs. Browning! <laughs> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Paul, Paul, look. It's a child's footprint right there in front of me, a wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Looks like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby ass. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. Gasping cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold at any rate. <laughs> You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive, almost anyway. Sandy, the footprints. 
They disappear. Oh, maybe, it's, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? Uh, No. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, God, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago, my husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning, how much will you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for release. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? (laughs) You will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? Sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you. Day and night. (laughs) I'll never get you on a leash. I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling, and I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, you're not going to take Blackie with you. Well, of course I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. Here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. (laughs) It was such a nice day. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat. (laughs) Call My chubby aunt. It is him. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you and... You noticed me? You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but... Well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Mr. 
keep walking, Sandra. I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Well, of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, Pet. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now, come on, stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile. But I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> that door again. Insidious feeling doors opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for ghosts. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. <laughs> quiet, quiet, Black. <laughs> don't scare somebody. <laughs> A dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. <laughs> Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. <laughs> Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. Coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Oh, Mrs. Browning, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Browning. Oh, Paul, stop this horrible thing. Cutting. 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 It's horrible. It's all right, Sandy. All right, darling. Oh, it's, it's gone, hasn't it? Yes. It's gone. But Mrs. Browning... tells Detective Hodges that a flesh-and-blood woman gets bumped off by a ghost. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind, we'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Oh, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh, Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. 
Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happened. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, oh, Pat. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. <laughs> it's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see, it's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. Oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. Here, Blackie, come here. Come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie. Poor doggie. You don't like the ghosties, do you, Pat? Poor, poor Blackie. Hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. If people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone, couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where'll I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Oh, uh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room? It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. Shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand reaching out from the wall. The letters. It's got the letters. Great, Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of, of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around us! Sandra! Sandra! Ah! Your will against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool, succumb. No, no, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No, no, I will not admit your will. Sandra, you're safe now on your own home. Just lie still, darling, and drink this. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sandra's recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. 
Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room, which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me, I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but Paul, The room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try it. Did you hurt yourself climbing that partition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. That's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful of your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an ice box. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. Bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look. Here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint, faint, and as if something unearthly is moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. No, the blasted thing. <laughs> oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves, so my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Oh. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. And this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul, Paul, look. Look in that corner. Mr. Richards, you, you are alive. Yes, alive, quite alive, because I will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. Deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then. I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything. I will the specters of the past to re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow. It's here with us, closing in. Yes, oh. closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down! Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards! No, you're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's gonna crumble. Paul! Sandra! Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the petition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richards' body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean he's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world.
From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me... Well, I'd like to tell you the easiest way I know to get the reputation of being the perfect host. Next time friends come over for dinner, before you sit down to the table, serve glasses of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. I say Petri Sherry because Petri Sherry is extraordinary Sherry. You can tell by looking at it. Hold it to the light. Notice how clear it is. Notice its beautiful deep amber color. And you can tell Petri Sherry is unusual from just a whiff of its fragrance. And, of course, in the last analysis, you can tell just how fine a wine Petri Sherry is by tasting it. That's the best test of all. And that's where you'll get the most pleasant surprise because Petri Sherry really tastes wonderful. A flavor right from the heart of the grape. So serve Petri Sherry to your family and your friends and serve it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's not keep him waiting. Come in, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You'll forgive me if I, I don't get up, won't you, my boy? Of course, Doctor. What's the matter, a touch of rheumatism? No, no, I've played 18 holes of golf today. <laughs> I hope that when I'm your age, Doctor, I can be half as sprightly. Oh, it's very nice of you, but if you don't mind, we won't discuss the uh, question of my age. <laughs> so drop your chair, make yourself comfortable, and I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, from the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a spooky story. It was, Mr. Bartell, it, it certainly was. Towards the end of November in the year 1895, a dense yellow fog had settled down over London. For four or five days, it was impossible from our rooms in Baker Street to see the outline of the houses opposite. A real London pea super, huh, Doctor? Yes, my boy, and it became most depressing. The first day, Holmes had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of criminal references. The second and third had been patiently occupied with a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day, on pushing back our chairs after breakfast, we saw the greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes, Sherlock Holmes' impatient and active nature could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting room, chafing against the inaction. After several minutes of these perambulations, he turned to me and spoke. Anything of interest in the paper, Watson? Oh, there's news of a revolution, a possible war, and of an impending change in the government. Nothing to interest you, though. <laughs> no crimes of any importance. The London criminal is certainly a dull and unenterprising fellow these days. Look out of the window, Watson. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the foggy depths. What a day for a thief or a murderer. He could roam London as the tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces, and then... Evident only to his victim. Well, that's a cheerful thought, I must say. Hello, hello. I wonder who that is. Probably a visitor for Mrs. Hudson, or perhaps the local plumber has finally condescended to pay some attention to the faulty gas jet in our hallway. I don't think you're right on either count. I can hear Mrs. Hudson's footsteps on the stairs. Come in. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? 
Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but there's a gentleman to see you. Says it's most important, and he asked me to give you this card, Oh, thank sir. you. Oh, Mother Mahali, eh? Show him up, please, Mrs. Hudson. Very good, sir. Mother Mahali, and who's he? I've not had the pleasure of meeting him personally, but I'm quite familiar with his scientific uh, reputation. Scientific? Oh, in, in what does he specialise? Oh, I, uh, I suppose one might refer to him as one of the greatest authorities on all matters connected with the occult. Do you mean the fellow dabbles in supernatural stuff and all that sort of thing? Hmm. I mean, my dear Watson, that uh, Walter Mahali is an extremely intelligent man with a thoroughly comprehensive and scholarly knowledge of his field and an intense belief in the existence of the supernatural force. Now, here he is to speak for himself. Oh, come in, Harley. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, you're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Harley? How do you do, Doctor? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Thank you. <laughs> well, you fellows are probably wondering who I am and what's brought me here. Well, we're not wondering who you are, Mr. Harley. My friend Holmes is just telling me of your scientific eminence. I'm flattered that you know of me, Holmes. Just the same, you're wondering why I'm here. Naturally, sir. Well, since you know I'm a student of the occult, I'll get right down to my problem. Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of... The Headless Monk of Trevenice Chapel. Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Harley. An apparition to be counted among our more intangible national treasures, I should say. I'm sorry to appear stupid, but I have never heard of the Headless Monk of whatever it is, Chapel. Well, then, let me tell you about it, Doctor. Yes, I wish you would. Trevenice Manor in Cornwall was once an abbey. It was expropriated during the reign of Henry VIII, and several of the monks were killed in some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the minor difficulties attendant on such an act. But one of the murdered monks, a certain Brother Hugh, the chapel organist, was persistent. He still haunts the chapel today. He still plays the organ. And since he was beheaded, he always appears headless. <laughs> it's a charming little legend, Mr. Harley, but you don't expect us to believe it's anything but a legend, surely. Ah, <laughs> sceptic, eh? How about you, Mr. Holmes? I'm extremely curious to know why you've come to see me, Mr. Harley. I'll tell you why. I have a rare opportunity to investigate the phenomena. You see, the son of an old friend of mine, a young fellow by the name of Leonard Miles, is secretary to the owner of Trevenice Manor. He asked me to stay there, and I find the invitation irresistible, particularly since the phenomena have curiously increased of late, Mr. Holmes, almost as though some more mortal agency were motivating them. Oh. Now, I see why you've come to me, Mr. Harley. I knew you would, Holmes. You see, I'm like my good friend and fellow investigator, Karnacki. I believe in being prepared to meet phenomena on either the natural or the supernatural plane. If the phenomena are real, then they fall legitimately in my field. Uh, whereas if, um, as I'm sure you suspect, they are being contrived by human forces, then you think uh, that's more of my department, eh, Harley? Exactly. Well, what do you say, Holmes? A little trip to Cornwall would be a nice few days. We... We'd probably escape the fog down there. Ah, oh, the places with the weather, Watson. What? I'm much more concerned with the fog that surrounds the appearances of the headless monk of Trevenis Chapel. And Mr. Harley, I accept your invitation with pleasure. There's still time to catch the Cornish Express. We can be at Trevenis Manor before the moon is up. think that we should go to the manor house first, Mr. Harley, instead of coming straight here to the chapel? No, I don't, Doctor. We'll see enough of the others when we're at the house. I couldn't resist taking a look at the chapel in the moonlight. You understand, don't you, Holmes? Oh, yes, perfectly. I must say, it's a fascinating piece of architecture. Yes, it's practically a ruin, though. I don't imagine it's been in use for some time. And yet it's been standing for well over, over 400 years, I should say. Let's explore inside, shall we? Hello? Who's this funny-looking fellow coming down the steps towards us? If I didn't hear the sound of his footsteps, I'd believe it was a psychic manifestation. He certainly looks as if he came from beyond the grave. Who be ye, gentlemen? And where be ye going? Well, supposing you tell us who you are first, my good man. Who be I? I be David Bendragon, sir. That's who I be. Stable and here at the manor. And I ask you gentlemen again, where you be going? We're staying at the manor, and we're just going to take a look at the chapel. Oh, don't he do that, sir. People that go in there don't often come out the way they go in, sir. Don't he do it, gentlemen? What are you talking about, my good fellow? I be talking about the ghoulies and the ghosties and the organ music that comes out of the nowheres. You, 
You've heard it? Of course I heard it, sir. Just like I seen the poor monk walking around without his head on. Take us into the chapel, will you? Uh, and show us where you saw the figure. Aye, that I will not, sir. Not for all the gold in Porth Call will I go back and chance seeing the poor lost soul wandering about without his head on. If you gentlemen know what's good for he, you'll not go in there either. Mark my words. Don't he go in that chapel. Extraordinary chap. Seems really frightened of the place. He is. But it's more than blind superstition that accounts for his reluctance. Uh, let's go in, shall we? Well, I suppose it's all right. Great Scott! Listen to that. The organ. The ghosts playing it. We are extremely fortunate. A psychic manifestation as soon as we enter. Remarkable. Psychic manifestation rubbish. Look who's sitting at the keyboard. It's Holmes. Holmes. What's the matter, Watson? What's the matter? <laughs> you frightened us to death, didn't he, Harley? Well, speaking for myself, Doctor, he disappointed me. I thought it was a genuine phenomenon. What do you think you're doing, Holmes? I thought you were still behind us. I'm sorry if I frightened you, Watson. I was curious about this organ. I slipped in by the side door ahead of you and tested the instrument. It's in astonishingly good condition for a disused chapel, don't you think, Harley? Yes, I do, Holmes. One might reasonably presume that someone tends it with great care. In fact, I would go further Who and say... Who are you? What are you doing in here? Uh, we are guests at the manor house, and we decided to pay a visit to the chapel before we paid our respects to our host. Oh, my father is your host. I'm Dorothy Brown. Oh, how do you do, Dorothy? Uh, my, my name is uh, Holmes, and these gentlemen are Dr. Watson and uh, Mr. Harley. How, how do you do, do Dr. Watson, Harley? Mr. Harley? I heard the organ music, and I was terribly frightened. You've heard of the legend, I suppose. You mean about the headless monk and the ghostly organ and music, Miss Brownlee? Yes, Doctor. And it's more than a legend, I assure you. That's why I rushed over here as soon as I heard it. It must have frightened all the servants within hearing distance. Why were you playing the organ? I was curious to see whether it was in good repair. <sighs> Obviously it is, Mr. Holmes. Well, my father and his secretary, Mr. Miles, are expecting you, I know. Let's walk over to the house, shall we? I'm sure you've seen enough of the chapel for tonight. Father, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do you do, sir? How do you do? This is my secretary, Leonard Miles. How do you do, Mr. Miles? Oh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson... I'm afraid Mr. Brown is rather angry with me. I hadn't told him that you were an expert on psychic phenomena, Mr. Harley. Well, I fail to see why the knowledge of that fact should make you angry, Mr. Brownley. I don't want you ferreting about into this so-called ghost business. There's been enough trouble in the neighborhood already. It's almost impossible to keep servants, and these Cornish people are incredibly superstitious. You haven't seen the ghost yourself, Mr. Brownley? Oh, of course not. There isn't any ghost, I tell you. You heard the mysterious organ playing? Hmm? Uh, well, uh, no, no, I haven't. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. Excuse me, sir. Yes, yes, what is it? Uh, David Pendragon is at the door. He's very anxious to see you, sir. Pendragon? Oh, oh very well. Tell him to come in. Uh, yes, sir. David? What does he want, I wonder? Pendragon, uh, that's the fellow we met outside the chapel, isn't it? He is. Quite a colourful character. Oh, he's a superstitious old fool, if you ask me. But he is a good groom. Yes, Pendragon, what is it? Begging your pardon, sir, but there'll be trouble at the chapel again tonight. I says to myself, David, tis your duty to go to the master, I oh, says. Oh, never mind, never mind. What's the trouble? As the moon was hanging low tonight, sir, I hears the organ a playing. But that was Mr. Holmes, my good man. Aye, that's what he thinks, maybe. But what I says to myself is, what made him play the organ? And then this very night, I saw the headless monk. With my own eyes, I saw that poor soul with his head off. Wandering in the moonlight. I saw that, sir, with my own eyes, I did. Oh, get out of here, you blithering old fool. And I'm warning you, if I hear any more nonsense about this ghost, you'll lose your job, you understand? Now, come along, be off with you. Aye, sir, begging your pardon, sir. Come on, I'll give you chaps a drink. Mr. Browner seems absolutely rabid on the subject of the ghost, eh? Yes, suspiciously so. What about he's trying to hide? And whatever it is, I don't think he'll be successful. In your profession, Holmes, you know that murder will out. It's true in my profession also. Try to suppress them as you may, gentlemen. Ghosts will out. Well, Holmes, 
this place may be haunted, but I swear that I never spent a better night anywhere. And I've never eaten a better breakfast. Pass me another kipper, will you, old chap? Oh, well, uh, Thank you. Uh, I heard you moving about quite late. Uh, have you been out? Yes. I had another talk with David Pendragon, as well as some of the other servants. It was quite illuminating. Ah, good morning, Mr. Harley. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm glad to see I'm not the only late riser. Oh, were you up late too, sir? Yes, I was, Doctor. I decided to ignore the veiled threats of Mr. Brownlee, and so I did a little investigating in the chapel. Uh, would you mind passing the teapot? And what were the results of your investigations, Mr. Harley? Well, there was no psychic manifestation, you understand, but I'm sure of one thing. That chapel is evil. Evil to the hearts of its stones. And I'll swear that evil does not stem from the hapless monk who was murdered there. Mm, you confirm certain suspicions aroused by my own investigations last night. There is evil here, Mr. Harley, and I think I know its nature. Unless I mistake every sign and reaction, someone has been initiating the local peasantry into the evils of the Black Mass. Black Mass? Good Lord, what a, what a shocking thought. My own sensations last night confirm your theory, Holmes. There is a coven here, I swear it, hiding its own obscene practices under cover of the haunting. Well, that sounds quite feasible. After all, the people are so superstitious that they'd keep as far away as possible from the chapel when they, when they heard the organ playing. Well, this problem falls into both our fields, Harley. The practice of black magic is a criminal offence. Well, perhaps it's just as well the old laws against witchcraft are still in force. I imagine, Mr. Harley, that you... Uh, have your own methods of combating such forces as we're up against? Oh, yes, Holmes. Though mine are not connected with the legal aspects of the case, of course. May I ask what you plan to do, sir? Well, I have several rather elaborate preparations to make, Doctor. It'll take me most of the day, I'm afraid. However, I shall explain them to you all uh, after dinner tonight. <laughs> It's very pleasant to sit here after a good dinner with a superb brandy at one's elbow <laughs> and listen to the piano being so, so charmingly played. You're very kind, Doctor. Won't you play something more, oh, Miss Brownlee? Really? I'd love to. Are you enjoying your stay down here, Oh, Mr. very Holmes? much, thank you. Both Mr. Harley and I have found the local folklore extremely interesting. I see. You fellows haven't been investigating the haunted chapel business again, have you? Oh, look here. If you have, I shall be very angry. It's abusing my hospitality. I told you distinctly I didn't want any more talk of ghosts. We are not talking of ghosts, my dear Mr. Brownlee. I have something even more important that I must fight now. It's possibly a little hard to imagine me as a crusader. Me, the stooped little man beside the four of you, as toweringly tall a quartet of men as I have ever faced. And yet, I am your St. George. What on earth are you talking about, sir? I'll tell you in secrecy. This mustn't reach the ears of the peasantry. I refer to myself as St. George because I go to wipe out an evil that lives in your midst, a living modern dragon. Oh, please, Mr. Harley. That sounds dreadfully frightening. And to rid you all of this fiend, I must cleanse the chapel, purify it, exercise it, remove its residue of psychic evil. That, gentlemen, is my mission tonight. <laughs> Dorothy! She's fainted. Get some smelling salts, quickly. I'm afraid you were a little too graphic, Mr. Harley. I'm sorry if I frightened the young lady, but I, I'm sure that after tonight she will have no further grounds for fear in Trevenice Manor. Holmes. Yes, old chap? Did, did you hear anything? Nothing but the owls and the clock striking midnight. I'm getting awfully jumpy. What do you suppose Harley's up to? I can imagine his procedure. Midnight. The crucial hour, I suppose, in his endeavors. I wish him luck. My own plans are not nearly as clear, unfortunately. I sense a guiding force here, but I lack the clues. There is something, Holmes. Listen! Great heavens! It's the organ in the chapel. And Harley's in there alone. Not alone. Listen to the organ. Feeling forth its madness. Come on, Watson. Something has gone horribly wrong. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. 
You know, a moment ago, I told you how much I thought you'd like Petri California Sherry, but I didn't tell you that Petri Sherry is the all-round, all-American wine. You can not only serve Petri Sherry before dinner, it's good after dinner, too. And, of course, later in the evening, when you're listening to the radio with some friends, a glass of Petri Sherry is just the thing. And, say, Petri makes two kinds of sherry, the regular and Petri Pale Dry. To make sure you get the one that you like best, do what I do. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri. Dr. Watson, that was a heck of a place to break off your story. Then let us continue it as speedily as possible, my boy. As soon as we heard that devilish organ music, Holmes and I rushed out of the house and raced in the moonlight down the path leading to the ruined chapel. By the time we reached the entrance, the organ music had ceased, and the tall, gangling figure of David Pendragon was standing in our path. You gentlemen be wanting at this Never time of night. That. What are you doing here? Oi, I be here because the gentleman gave me five shillings to stand outside here and see that no one disturbed him. Uh, That's why I be here. And nobody did come or go. He still be there, he be. But when you heard that organ music, why the devil didn't you go in? Organ music? I heard no organ oh, music, come on, sir. Watson. Great heavens. Look at him. We're too late. Poor devil. A knife through his heart. It's obvious who did it at full of Pendragon. I'll, I'll go and grab him no, before no, he gets no, away. Watson, he's not our man. This murder was planned with devilish cunning. It's a curious thing. There's no sign of a struggle at all. Looks like he just stood here and allowed himself to be stabbed. Are these uh, chalk marks with which the body is surrounded? Well, they're known as a pentagram, I believe. He thought it would protect him completely from the supernatural forces. Poor chap. For once his researches went too far. Yes, because they touched not on the supernatural, but upon natural evil. And remember, Watson, that only... Three people besides ourselves and David Pendragon knew of this vigil. Yes, Brownlee, his daughter, and young Miles, the secretary. Exactly. Um, go back to the house, will you? And bring them here. And perhaps we can lay a ghost by trapping a murderer. And that's all I know, Mr. Holmes. Well, you've not established much so far, Holmes. The three of them all swear that they were asleep and that they didn't hear the organ. Yes, and you can't prove otherwise, I Holmes. think I can prove that one of you was not only awake, but also murdered Mortimer Harley. But why should any of us want the poor man dead, In Mr. your Holmes? case, young lady, I confess that I find it hard to conceive a motive. Implying that Mr. Brownlee and I might have one? Well, Mr. Miles, you must admit that you're responsible for Mr. Harley coming here. And you, Mr. Brownlee, must uh, admit that you did everything in your power to prevent the dead man from carrying out his investigations. Why? What were you trying to hide? Nothing. It's just that I wanted to sell the manor house. All this talk about ghosts was giving the place a bad name. And if it had gone on, I'd never have disposed of the property. Well, speculation can get us nowhere. Let's get down to facts. Is there any other entrance to this chapel besides the two doors? None. Oh, there was an old smuggler's cave which came out near the organ lot, but Father had it bricked up some years ago. I had to. The tourists kept crawling in. Go and examine it, will you, Watson, old chap? All right, sure, huh? If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, it seems obvious who did this murder. You told us David Pendragon admitted that no one went in or out as he stood guard. He must have done it himself. Oh, the man's half-witted. And superstitious. He might have killed Mr. Harley because he was attempting to interfere with the ghost. And then played the organ to celebrate the occasion? I think you overestimate David Pendragon's capabilities, Miss Brownlee. Mr. Miles. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Pendragon is waiting outside. Would you be kind enough to ask him to come here for a moment, please? Certainly not. Uh, what did you find out, Watson? Well, it's easy to see where it was bricked up, but it's a solid wall now. No one could get in that way. But if no one came in or out, who else could have killed Harley except Pendrag? The ghost, or rather the person disguised as a ghost. The dead man expected a psychic manifestation. When he, uh, when he saw the supposed ghost coming towards him, he offered no resistance. He believed that the magical pentagram would protect him. Ah, there you are, David. Aye, here I be, sir, but I don't know nothing more than what I told thee. Oh, don't be frightened, Pendragon. All we want is the truth. That's what I told thee, sir. Then tell us a little more, will you? Uh, when you said no one had entered the chapel tonight, you meant that no mortal man had entered, didn't you? That I did, sir. But how could I say I'd seen the ghost when Mr. Brownlee here had told me I'd lose my job if I spoke of the ghost again? Oh, now we're getting somewhere. So you did see the ghost? That I did, sir. The poor soul walking through the moonlight with no head on his body. You saw it quite clearly? Just as clearly as I sees you now, sir. How tall was he? He was... Would you, would you mind standing against the wall, sir? Yes, of course. 
He was as tall as, well, his shoulders come to just where your shoulders come now, sir. A tall man, then, so we narrow it down to either you, Mr. Brownlee, or you, Mr. Oh, Miles. But this is utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. On the contrary, gentlemen, the case is solved. Which one of them was it, Holmes? Neither. Remember that the ghost is headless. That means that the imposter must have built up fake shoulders covering the head. On either of these men, it would have uh, brought their shoulders to the level of my head. Great Scott, it was... <laughs> Bravo, Mr. Holmes. I didn't think you'd catch me. Dorothy! No, no, I don't <laughs> believe... Miss Brownlee, I must warn you that... Keep back. Don't let any of you come near me. As you see, I have a revolver. Dorothy, for heaven's sake! Don't speak to me of heaven! <laughs> You thought I was a sweet little girl, didn't you, Father? <laughs> you didn't know your dear, demure daughter could murder a man, did you? Why did you kill Mortimer Holly? Because he was a meddler. For months I've been practicing black magic here. For months I've been building up the legend of the headless monk and the organ music. It made me so wonderfully alone, so gloriously free to practice the rites. And then he came here. I let him live that first night because I thought he was a fool. But on the second, when he said he was going to exorcise this chapel, to purify it, as he said, he signed his death warrant. <laughs> if you could have seen his face, if you could only have seen his stupid, toddled face as I plunged the knife into him. Dorothy! He bled so beautifully. Holmes, Holmes, she's mad as a hatter. What are we going to do? <laughs> Barry, give me that revolver. And let you take me to prison or to asylum. No, you'll never catch me. She's backing up the stairs, leading to the organ loft. Dorothy, Dorothy, come back. Don't try and swallow me. Look out. The railing's behind you. Oh, and turn my head. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, I... No! No! Dorothy. Dorothy. My poor little girl. Mr. Brownlee, the powers of evil are frightening. Your daughter had killed one man and might have killed more. She was insane. Hopelessly insane. Well, Doctor, that was quite an exciting story. You know, you and Holmes have worked on many cases that seem to deal with the supernatural. Yes, I must say, Mr. Bartell, that every one of them, when solved, disclosed the work of an evil mind rather than that of an evil spirit. The part I particularly liked about tonight's story was the organ music. There's something eerie, something almost ghostly about organ music. Yes, and there's nothing more beautiful. You know, I wish I could play the organ and write music for it. There's nothing like music to really express a thought. Yes, I can just imagine the kind of music that you'd write. Probably a catchy little ditty such as the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you drink, remember Petri wine. Oh, no, Doctor. Is that the way I affect you? Although on the level, you could probably write beautiful music to describe the way the grapes look on the vine in the sunlight. But what music could tell you about the Petri family and how long they've been making fine wine? You know, the Petri family has been making wine for generations, handing on down from father to son, from father to son, the knowledge necessary to transform luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. And when you see that name Petri on a bottle of wine, remember, you're not looking at a mere trademark. That name Petri is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle meets their unusually high standards. Petri wine is always good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me think. Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that started quietly enough as Holmes and I sat at a London dinner party, and yet, before the evening was over, we found ourselves involved in one of the most shocking scandals that ever rocked London society. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. 
and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. Taxi! Taxi! Uh, 4,500 Sutter, please. It's uh, kind of light, ain't it? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, comes this time of night, I figure a guy should order... Uh, 4,500 uh, Sutter, please. Yeah. Mind you, I, uh, I don't like to get personal. You Driver. Know, but, uh, yeah? Of all the cabs in San Francisco, most of them operated by drivers who mind their own business. Why did I have to get your cab? Well, I like... Who are you going to see at 4,500? My name is Simon Templer. I'm six foot one inches tall, and I have a birthmark on my right shoulder blade. My income for last That's year was... That's all right. Evading uh, the question, huh? I give up. I'm going to visit a man named Clarence Quigley. Clarence Quigley? Clarence Quigley. Uh-huh. Uh, you're going to see this uh, alleged Clarence Quigley <laughs> Look, about... Look, he's got a collection of paintings. I like to look at paintings. Maybe that will seem odd to you, but... Oh, come, uh, come now. No temper. Now, if I was your wife, you'd have to do better than that, you know. Oh. So how much do I owe you? And go away. Well, would you think I was soaking you if I suggested three bucks? I would. As uh, one man of the world to another, let's uh, make it three bucks anyway. Let's just be yokels and make it 50 cents. Here you are. Well, I... Hey... Hey, is that blonde giving you the eye of me? Blonde? Yeah, the one coming down the street towards us. Oh, yeah. Best, uh, best foot forward. I never saw her before in my life. Ellsworth, dear. Oh, Ellsworth, dear. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, but that's my neck you've got your arms around, Miss... Uh, a man named Clarence Quigley, huh? Driver, stop heckling. Look, Miss, whatever your name is, the way you're strangling me is a pleasant way to be strangled, oh, but... Uh, Ellsworth, dear, you... You sound so cool. I'm not Ellsworth, dear. I think I can honestly say I have never been Ellsworth, dear. You're not? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were. Or maybe I just hoped you were. Uh, don't you know Ellsworth, dear, when you see him? No, I don't, I guess. But, uh... I saw you, and then the name came to me, so I just thought... Uh, who is Ellsworth? I don't know. Well, I suppose a certain amount of confusion about uh, who or what Ellsworth is is understandable, but... that but isn't the worst. It isn't? No, you... See, not only don't I know who Ellsworth is, but... Yes? I don't even know who I am. I want to know in a general sort of way is uh, how Mr. Clarence Quigley is going to feel. Driver, would you mind concentrating on your driving? Uh, you know, he's liable to be frustrated, like uh, I'm taking you and a lady right back to where you started. My apartment, yes, because Miss, uh, Miss X needs help. Oh, I feel as though I'm imposing on you, Mr. Tim. Nonsense. The hour's late. You couldn't very well go wandering about the streets indefinitely. Especially in that hat. 
Anything wrong with my head? Not a thing. No, it's very charming and immaculate. Yeah, also, it resembles a bird's home away from home. Well, mister, we have returned from where we went away. Good. Miss X? Thank you. Huh? You're going to keep on being a yokel, huh? Here. Mm-hmm. This time only half a yokel. Well, goodbye. You know where I'm going? No. I'm going to lurk outside of Clarence Quigley's. I think tonight he's a fellow who needs a friend. I need one, too. Oh, come along now. There you go. Now, take your hat off and make yourself comfortable. All right. Oh, I'm so afraid. And oh, lost. quiet now. now. Let's take a look at your back. Here. Mm-hmm. Usual odds and ends. And they're compact, initialed. DM. DM, does that suggest anything? DM? Mm. No. No, it doesn't. Nothing means anything. All I remember is being outside an art gallery on Sutter. Hey, you're well-dressed. Compact's gold, no latch key, which means you probably don't live alone, which could also mean you've been missed. You're phony? Yes, the police, missing persons bureau. They, uh, uh, hello? Oh, get me Inspector Murray, hmm? Thanks, I'll hold on. I hope maybe they know about me. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, I just touched the back of my head. It's terribly painful. Come here. Huh. Yeah, a bruise the size of what I wish my bank account was. And there's the cause of your amnesia. Uh, hello, Inspector. Uh, Simon Templer. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> Inspector, your language is deplorable. Inspector, I'm looking for someone, a blonde. Uh, Inspector, no. No. Well, maybe, but not tonight. At any rate, the girl I'm looking for is around 22 years old, blonde hair, blue eyes, height five foot three inches, and thereabouts. Wearing a street suit, brown, white blouse with ruffles at the neck and... What? Oh, oh, you're looking for her, too. Her name's Dorothy Moore. Uh, why do you want her? Oh, I see. <laughs> and I, I guess you've got priority. <laughs> Goodbye. They want me. Yes, yeah, so it seems. Because I've been reported missing? Well, partially that. What else do they want me for? Murder. <laughs> Now, try another cup of coffee. Dorothy, I, well, I guess we'll call you that unless we get evidence to the contrary. Dorothy Moore would fit the initials on your compact. What am I going to do? You stay here and wait for me. Where are you going? Well, from the information I've been able to get on the phone, your guardian, a man named Matthew Schreiber, was shot and killed earlier this evening. You disappeared. That's all the information in the public domain at the moment. I'm going to look for more. At my house? Yes. Oh, shouldn't you turn me over to the police? Well, actually, I don't really know that you are Dorothy Moore. I'd like to know a little more about the murder itself before coming to any decisions. You mean you want to help me? Yes. And I need help, so, because... You see, what's so terrible about it all is that... I don't remember anything at all, so... I can't even say I didn't murder anyone. <laughs> Hello. Well, it's been fun meeting you. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute. Don't shut the door. Why not? I'm coming in. Oh, all right. I uh, hate to seem prying, but uh, who are you? Uh, Simon Templer. An attractive name, much more distinguished than mine. Oh, what's your name? Walters. Not the most glamorous name in the world, but I'm a butler, so I bear up. Good. Where is everybody? In the library. They're so well-bred. Oh, uh, who is in the library? Mrs. Atkins, the housekeeper, the Cassandra of our day. A gloomy lady prophesying disaster, hmm? Yes. And, of course, there's Mr. Tinsley. Mr. Tinsley? A strange fellow who spends a good deal of his time sitting on small horses and hitting a large ball with a long wooden stick. 
A polo player. Doesn't matter what you call it, it's no job for a grown man. Uh, what's his relationship to Miss Moore? Oh, let's not start prying, shall we? Expound. Well, to breach a confidence, he's engaged to marry Miss Moore. If and when she's found, and if she happens to be innocent of our guardian's assassination. Oh. Anyone else in the library? No, no, no. Mr. Schreiber, dear departed soul, is detained elsewhere at the morgue. He was shot in the library. Oh, that's a bad place to be shot. Usually fatal. Uh, suppose you take me to the library. Tell me, why did the police suspect Miss Moore? Because of me. You see, I told them that I heard shots in the house. I left my quarters on the gallop, ran towards the library. Just before I got there, the door opened and Miss Dorothy ran out. Ran down the hall and out the front door. Is that true? My dear Mr. Templer, if not, would I have told the police otherwise? I don't know. Besides, it, <laughs> it isn't good form to suspect the butler. The library, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Atkins, Mr. Tinsley, Mr. Templer. What do you want? I'm looking for Miss Moore. So, young man, are the police. Why? Her guardian was murdered. All his money goes to her, and she's disappeared. Perhaps she didn't murder Mr. Schreiber. But you wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> Perhaps I did. I hated him. Perhaps Mr. Tinsley there did. <clears throat> now, now, look here. Isn't he priceless? Now, look here. Such a typical phrase. So typical, I wonder if he can really be so stupid. I love Dorothy, and No there's... one has questioned that. But what is it about her that you love? The money she was to get when Mr. Shriver died? The money you wouldn't have got if you'd married Dorothy? Against Mr. Schreiber's wishes? Mr. Schreiber didn't approve of the marriage? He, uh, well, he hesitated about it, but uh, we were working on it. And then became impatient. Now, look here, there you have... There goes again. I resent that. Good. It is now on record that you resent it. Uh, how about Walters? Walters? Yes, what motive would he have? What makes you think he has one? Oh, I'm the hopeful type. Walters is a man with a criminal past... Whether or not he got tired of his upright life here, I cannot say. But it wouldn't surprise you. What may surprise both of you, however, is an odd fact. Dorothy Moore is suffering from total amnesia. Amnesia? What do you mean? She remembers nothing of her past, herself, neither name nor habitation. How horrible. How convenient. Wait a minute. How do you know that? Why get around? Well, then you must know where she is. You've got to tell me. Mr. I... Tinsley is now being the ardent lover. I can't tell you. Why? Well, whoever shot Schreiber, there's very little doubt that Dorothy saw the killer, but Dorothy doesn't remember. The killer, therefore, would have an urgent interest in getting hold of Dorothy before she did remember and making sure that she would never remember anything again. Well, uh, good night, you lovely people. <laughs> Dorothy. Dorothy? Dorothy? Dorothy! again. It's me again. Did you like the place so much the first time? Where's Dorothy? Miss Moore? Yes. Did she come back here? Back? From where? Uh, she was at my apartment. When I got there, she was gone. Oh, she did come back here. She didn't ring. Let's find out. Tinsley and Mrs. Atkins still around? Mrs. Atkins has gone up to bed, I think. As for Mr. Tinsley, I imagine he's something the whiskey. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, Tinsley, uh... What? Oh, it's you. Yes. Where's Dorothy? You're the one who knows. I'm the one who knew. Did she come back here? I haven't seen her. Walters, where's Mrs. Atkins' room? This way, sir. Uh, come along, Tinsley. I'd like both of you in sight. Uh, if you insist. Mrs. Atkins will not be pleased at having her sleep interrupted. I'm not pleased either. Uh, this is her room, sir. Oh, thanks. Go 
poor girl must be asleep. Yeah, then we must wake her up. Oh, she's a very sound sleeper. Yeah, then we'll go in and wake her. <gasps> wow. How do you like that? Mrs. Atkins. Strung up to a beam. Anyone got a knife? Yes. Yes, here you are. Now, we'll cut the rope and get her down. The bed's over there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, that's that. Is she dead? She's dead. Poor old girl. Although, you know something? What? She must have killed the old man. Shriver, I mean. Then she committed suicide. In, in remorse, I mean. For heaven's sakes, Templar, stop playing with that rope. But this is a very interesting rope. Is it? Why? Because it proves, you see, that she didn't commit suicide. She was murdered. <laughs> Yes, Inspector Murray. I understand you don't think that Mrs. Atkins committed suicide. I know she didn't. Well, while the boys are playing with fingerprints and stuff, uh, would you mind explaining to a poor benighted member of the lower intellectual classes, uh, I mean, uh, a cop like me... Oh, Murray, now stop pulling my leg. You're one of the brainiest men I know. Then why do you always beat me to a case? Oh, I'm prettier. Uh Uh-huh. Now, about this alleged phony suicide... Well, take a look at the rope with which Mrs. Atkins is supposed to have hanged herself. Now, let's see. The rope was thrown over the beam there. Mm-hmm. Oh, hmm. I'm afraid you're right, Templar. Yeah, it wasn't hard to spot. Her weight would have pulled the rope sharply down over the beam. The fibers of the rope, therefore, should have slanted upward. Uh, instead of which, they slant down, indicating that somebody put the rope around Mrs. Atkins' neck and then hauled her up. We were supposed to think that Mrs. Atkins committed suicide as a confession of guilt. Which leaves us where? In the Schreiber home. I'm more interested in where the girl is. Dorothy Moore? Uh-huh. Why? Because I have... Hey, Mary. Look, coming through the door. Oh, I'm not sure. Simon. Oh, hello, Dorothy. I don't know exactly how I got here, but I don't recognize the place at all. Yet I should, shouldn't I? Yes, you should, Miss Moore. Because this is where you live. But I'm afraid you're not going to stay very long. What? What do you mean? I'm placing you under arrest on suspicion of murder. You know, I love police headquarters. They're so romantic. Uh Uh-huh. Mary... How are you going to prove anything against that girl if she's suffering total amnesia? By proving that her amnesia is a fake. Oh, how? I have an alienist coming over here to look at one of our guests. I'll have him see Miss Moore, too. He's due any minute. I'll go get the girl now. (laughs) I wonder. The other door. Come in. Hello. Well, you're not Murray. I was supposed... Who are you? Doll, of course. What's the matter with you? What are you complaining oh, about? But I'm not oh, the one... Oh, come, that... come. We've got to get to the bottom of these things, don't we? I suppose so. Now, when you were a little boy, what did you want most of all? To be a big boy. Mm-hmm. Are you afraid of the dark? No. No? You are not afraid because uh, you have little friends who come to you in the dark, perhaps, eh? No. Now, why are you afraid of the dark? Oh, it's a long, long story. And, uh... You know, um, you don't look at all well. Well, I don't feel so good either. No, you should see a doctor. Thank you, thank you. I think I will. (laughs) Uh, Goodbye. Oh, uh, Templar. Yeah, Uh, your alienist was here, Murray, but he he left. Alienist? Mm. Well, I just phoned him and told him not to come. The district attorney wouldn't hold the girl. Insufficient evidence and ballistics and ran a paraffin test. No proof that she'd fired a gun. But uh, the man who was just in here, Dahl, I think his name was? Dahl? Uh-huh. He's not the alienist. He's the guy the alienist was coming to examine. He's nuts. Oh, dear. Hmm. Well, I guess you're happy now that we can't hold the girl. No, no, because while you were holding her, things were safe. Now, Mary, let's go visit. Go visit where? The Schreiber house. A house where two people have died. A house very convenient for murder. Yes? Ah, 
Eyes, no eyes, Walters. We're coming in. Yes, sir. Dorothy's home? Yes, sir. She got here when? Ten minutes ago, perhaps. Well, we'll go to the library. Yes, sir. She got here ten minutes ago, and... And then? She sat in this room for a few minutes, uh-huh. made a phone call, and went up to bed. She, uh, tried to phone you, Mr. Templer. I'll wake her up and get her down here. Uh, hold on, uh, Tinsley around? In the guest room, playing solitaire, I think. Get him down here, too. That I will, sir. And Walters. Yes? You come back, too. Sure. Having fun, Templer? I don't care very much for this stage of any case, but I... What are you doing with that telephone? Hiding it under the couch here. Are you being subtle again? Again? Oh, you flatter me. Simon. Uh, hello, Dorothy. Sorry to have had you wake. Oh, but I... I wasn't asleep. I was trying to remember. Uh, you will if you get the chance. Tinsley's here in the house, isn't he? Yes, he is. For uh, heaven's sakes, is a man never to get any peace? Uh, you know Inspector Murray, Mr. Tinsley? Oh, yes. The policeman. Oh, look, now get off your polo pony and where's Walters? By now, on his way to Canada, I imagine. Dorothy, get on the phone right away. The phone? Yes, mm-hmm. of course. Oh, well, there doesn't seem to be one in here. Perhaps in the next room. Why do you want me to phone? I don't. But you just said... Dorothy, didn't there used to be a phone in this room? Well, I don't know. I don't remember. Oh, yes, yes, you're amnesia. But you remember everything that happened since the blow on your head, don't you? Well, of course. But then equally, of course, since you were in this room a very little while ago, and since you, you used a phone in here, you should have remembered that. Why didn't you? Well, I don't know it. Slip my mind. No, Dorothy, it didn't slip your mind. You were merely being over-careful. What does that mean? It means that you are not now nor ever were suffering from amnesia. Why should I pretend to have amnesia? Because you killed your uncle. You knew you'd need something to help you out in court, so you wandered about until you found someone on whom you could try out your amnesia. That happened to be me. Oh, you're just saying those things without proof. Besides, there was a paraffin test. It indicates merely that you wore gloves when you shot your uncle. It indicates I might have worn them. If I'd shot him, you can't prove I did. I can prove your amnesia was phony, that along with some other things. How can you prove it? Very simple. Your hat. What? When you arrived at my apartment, you took your hat off, discovered a large bruise on the back of your head. That was to supply a plausible reason for your amnesia. But, Dorothy, as I remarked to the cab driver at the time... Your hat was immaculate, untouched. <laughs> you asking us to believe that the killer knocked you out and then carefully put your hat back on your head again? I'm not asking you to believe anything. I'm going. Oh, what a charming revolver. The one you used on your uncle? It still has bullets in it, so don't try to stop me. Uh, Dorothy, you didn't ask me how I could be so sure the killer hadn't done that business with your hat. I don't care. I'm so sure because of Walter's statement. Remember, he saw you rush out immediately after the shot? All right, you're smart, but you'll never stop me. Perhaps not, but Walters, who's right behind you, oh, will. Oh, no, you can't fool me well, with He that. wasn't trying to, <laughs> Miss Dorothy. I think I, I'd better... You're no gentleman. You knocked Miss Moore out with a bottle. Yes, sir. But but you said you were going to Canada. You misunderstood me, sir. I merely said I was going to get some Canada drive. Uh, now the bottle's ruined. That's too bad. Oh, never mind, Walters. No harm done. Inspector Murray, you'll take Miss Moore and I'll take an old-fashioned. <laughs> You have been listening to another adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, next week most of you will be enjoying a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. And while you're eating your Thanksgiving turkey and counting your blessings of the past year, think. Think for a moment of the millions of people who don't get enough to eat. Think, and then send your subscription right away for a food package to be delivered to some needy family in Europe. Send your contribution to CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night.
Tonight's script of The Saint was written by Lou Bitties. Our cast included Peggy Weber, Ted Von Els, Jerry Hausner, Tom Brown, and Daniel Hurley-He. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Thomas A. McEvity. Vincent Price is soon to be seen in Robert Lippert's production of The Baron of Arizona. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. My name is Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. I write stories. Charges have been brought against me by certain ignoramuses that I have never written a tale with a moral. By way of mitigating these ridiculous accusations, I offer the following unusual history, a history about whose moral there can be no question whatsoever. For you can see the moral in its very title, Never Bet the Devil Your Head. And note, please, that I do not bring in the lesson at the tag end of the fable as uh, others are wont to do. Very well. Here, then, I denounce my critics and beg no favor other than your close attention. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. Dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The world too long thought of Edgar Allan Poe as a door misogynist who concerned himself with black cats, gold bugs, pits, pendulums, and murder. Few realize, and fewer would believe, that this man of gloom had a sense of humor. This the workshop now seeks to prove in William N. Robeson's production of Edgar Allan Poe's satiric story, Never Bet the Devil Your Head. Starring John Daner, with music conducted by Amerigo Marino, and with Jack Johnstone as guest director. It is not my design to vituperate my deceased friend, Toby Dammit. He was a sad dog, it is true, and a dog's death it was that he died. But he himself was not to blame for his vices. They grew out of a personal defect in his mother. I recall a conversation I had with her when Toby was a mere babe in arms. Duties to a well-regulated mind, Mr. Poe, are always pleasures. It is my duty, and therefore my pleasure, to see that as quickly as possible my son learns the difference between right and wrong. <coughs> but must you flog him so, Mrs. Dammit? Babies like tough steaks are invariably the better for beating. It drives the evil propensities out. But my dear woman, my dear woman, you have the misfortune to be left-handed. I do not consider left-handedness a misfortune. No, you failed to understand me. Madam, a child flogged left-handedly had better be left unflogged. And deign to tell me why? The world revolves from right to left. If each blow in the proper direction drives out an evil propensity... It follows that every thump in an opposite one knocks its quota of wickedness in. Ha! That is a specious argument that does not warrant a reply, except perhaps this. <laughs> I was all too often present at Toby's chastisements, and even by the way he kicked, I could perceive that he was getting worse and worse every day. At last I saw, through tears in my eyes that there was no hope for the villain at all, and one day when he had been cuffed until he grew black in the face, that no effect had been produced beyond that of making him wriggle himself into a fit, I could stand it no longer, but went down on my knees forthwith, and uplifting my voice made a prophecy, a prophecy of his ruin. For the fact is that his precocity in vice was awful. At five months of age, he got into such passions that he was unable to articulate. <laughs> At six months, I caught him gnawing at a pack of playing cards. 
At seven months, he was in the constant habit of catching and kissing female babies. At eight months, he peremptorily refused to put his signature to the temperance pledge. No, no, no. Thus, he went on increasing in iniquity month after month, year after year, until in his youth... Mama, it is my desire to wear mustaches. And furthermore, I'll bet I can grow them. By the bill, book and candle, by Job's comforter, I'll bet I can. As you see, he had even contracted a propensity for cursing and swearing and for backing his assertions with bets. Not that he actually laid wagers. No, I will do my friend the justice to say that he would as soon have laid eggs. With him, the thing was a mere formula, nothing more. You see, he was detestably poor. Another vice which the physical deficiency in his mother had entailed upon him. And this was the reason, no doubt, that his expletive expressions about betting seldom took a pecuniary turn. It was usually, I'll bet you what you please, or I'll, I'll, I'll bet you what you dare, or I'll bet you a trifle, or else, more significantly still, I'll bet the devil my head. At all events, through this most ungentlemanly practice, the ruin which I predicted for Toby Dammit overtook him at last. For indeed, the fashion had grown with his growth and strengthened with his strength to the point that when he finally came to be a man, he could hardly utter a sentence without interlarding it with a, a proposition to gamble. Devil me, Mr. Poe. It is and remains my contention that these United States shall serve as an arrow to the target of liberty. Uh, my wager on that, sir. I'll bet you what you please. Toby, Toby, this habit of yours is an immoral one, and I feel constrained to tell you so. Pish posh, Mr. Poe. It is vulgar. I beg you to believe me. Twaddle. It is discountenanced by society. I say nothing but the truth. Tush! Gambling has been forbidden by an act of Congress. <laughs> I entreat you. I implore you. Utter foolishness. Then, by heaven, I shall have to knock some sense into you. <laughs> oh. Oh. That, sir, was a, was a dastardly thing to do. Should you venture to try such an experiment again, I shall necessarily return in kind, and you will rue the result. I'll bet the devil my head you will. Yes, there it was again. The quintessence of his abominable expressions. I'll bet the devil my head. But there was nothing more I could do. I quit the scene in desperation and in sorrow. However, I could not evade the fact that Mr. Toby Dammit's soul was in a perilous state. I resolved to bring all my eloquence into play to save it. I vowed to serve him as St. Patrick. In the Irish Chronicle is said to have served the toad. That is to say... Awaken him to a sense of his situation. So, I addressed myself to the task. I remonstrated with him, but to no purpose. I demonstrated in vain. I entreated. He smiled. I implored. He laughed. I preached. He sneered. I threatened. He swore. I pulled his nose. He blew it. And once again... Uh, I'll bet the devil my head that taught you a lesson. Toby, have you considered the gross impropriety of a man betting his brains like banknotes? Uh, -uh. Should you have I? adopted this mode of wager, I'll bet the devil my head with a pertinacity and exclusiveness of devotion that displeases me no less than it surprises me. Now, the truth is... I'll bet the devil my head I'm going to get another lecture from you. The truth is, there is something in the air with which you are wont to give utterance to this offensive expression, something in your manner of enunciation which, for want of a more definite term, I must be permitted to call queer. Oh? It is your soul I am considering, Toby. Otherwise, you must believe this. I would not be speaking to you of these matters when I am so aware of your distaste for them. For some moments, he remained silent, merely looking me inquisitively in the face, but... Presently, he threw his head to one side and elevated his eyebrows to a great extent. Then he spread out the palms of his hands and shrugged up his shoulders. Then he winked with the right eye. He repeated the operation with the left. Then he shut them both up very tight. Then he opened them both so very wide that I became seriously alarmed for the consequences. And applying his thumb to his nose, he made a disgusting, indescribable movement with the rest of his fingers. 
Finally, setting his arms akimbo, he condescended to reply. Mr. Poe, I will be obliged to you if you would hold your tongue. I wish none of your advice. I despise your insinuations, equivocations, adumbrations. In short, sir, your entire peroration. I am of sufficient age to take care of myself. Or is it your misconception to consider me still an infant? Sir, do you mean to impugn my character? Is it your intention to insult me? Are you a fool, sir? Tell me, is your maternal parent aware of your absence from the domiciliary residence? I beg you. I put this question to you as a man of veracity, and I will bind myself to abide by your reply. I demand once more, does your mother know you're out? <laughs> <laughs> Your confusion betrays you. I'll bet the devil my head she does not. And so I bid you, Mr. Poe, good day. He left my presence in quite undignified haste. It were well for him that he did so. My anger had been aroused. For once, I would have taken him up on his insulting wager, bet the devil my head indeed. And I would have won for Satan, Mr. Dammit's little head, because, you see... The fact is, my whereabouts was known by my mother. Ah, well, it was in the pursuance of my duty that I had been insulted, so I bore the insult like a man. And it now seemed to me that I had done all that could be required of me in the case of this miserable individual. I resolved to trouble him no longer with my counsel, but to leave him to his conscience and himself. But I must confess that although I forbore to intrude with my advice, I could not quite bring myself to give up his society altogether. Worse, I even went so far as to humor some of his less reprehensible propensities, and there were times when I found myself lauding his wicked jokes, uh, but with tears in my eyes, so profoundly did it grieve me to hear his evil talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the great horn toad, Mr. Poe, your aptitude for companionship, without censure or reprimand, has taken a turn for the better. It, it puts me in mind of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Greeley, who importuned a man of tender years to seek the western shores, remember? Yet, to my knowledge, he never made the trek himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Unsought advice is like a woman left waiting at the church. Uncalled for. <laughs> Well, perhaps... Uh, Zounds and hellions, sir. I'll bet the devil my head if you cannot agree on that. Well, uh, all right, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> Toby, 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 what's to become of you? Oh, your concern is, uh, you know, touching, Mr. Poe, but it smacks of your former attitude, and I shall have none of it. None, I say. Come, it's too fine a day to spend it on peradventure and mayhap pursuits. Let us stroll the roadside in the country lane, commune with nature in her pristine glory, seek the unfettered pleasures of the here and the now. Well, sir? Very well, Toby. Thus it was that we strolled out together, arm in arm, our route leading us in the direction of a river. Ah, there, Mr. Poe. You see, beyond the stream, that field of fluorescence. Would not the Roman goddess herself exclaim over its perfection? Hmm. It is beautiful. Beautiful? <laughs> By the sons of Saul, your words make a beggary of faultless grandeur. My friend, your jaundiced eye requires closer appraisal, and your stopped-up nose a clearer whiff. But it's only a field of trees and flowers. I can see it very well from here. Stuff and nonsense. If you possessed a wit of perspicacity, that same jaundiced eye would indicate a covered bridge within a stone's throw. We shall cross it, go beyond it, and wander lonely as a cloud. Uh, to steal a phrase from one of the English greats. Come now. <laughs> The bridge was roofed over by way of protection from the weather, and the archway, having but few windows, was thus uncomfortably dark and echoed resoundingly. As we entered the passage, the contrast between the external glare and the interior gloom struck heavily upon my spirits. Not so upon those of the happy Dammit, who offered to bet the devil his head that I was hipped. He seemed to be in unusual good humor. 
He was excessively lively, so much so that I entertained I know not what of uneasy suspicion. A certain species of austere Mary Andrewism seemed to beset my friend and caused him to make quite a tom fool of himself. <laughs> I'm a bird. I fly. Whee! Nothing would serve him but wriggling and skipping about under and over everything that came in his way, now shouting out and now lisping out all manner of odd little and big words. I really could not make up my mind whether to kick him or to pity him. And the Louisian transcendentalism! Whee! At length, having passed nearly across the bridge, we approached the termination of the footway when our progress was impeded by a turnstile of some height. Through this, I made my way quietly, but this turn would not serve the turn of Mr. Dammit. Paul, uh, this, this mechanism, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Are we cattle to be impeded in this manner? It's merely a turnstile. I passed through it without it's any... It's merely a turnstile. Well, me, I defy it. <laughs> How can you defy an inanimate object? By leaping over it. Uh, not only shall I leap over it, but I shall perform a buck and wing at the apex of my jump. Oh, but Toby, it's nearly five feet in height. <laughs> a bagatelle. Oh, you're a braggadocio. You cannot do it, and you know you can't. No? I'll bet the devil my head I can. You hear me? I'll bet the devil my head. <laughs> I was about to reply, notwithstanding my previous resolution, with some remonstrance against his impiety, when suddenly I heard, close at my elbow, a slight cough, <laughs> which sounded very much like the ejaculation... A hem. I started and looked about me in surprise. My glance at length fell into a nook in the framework of the bridge, and there upon the figure of a little old gentleman of, shall we say, venerable aspect, yes and of reverend appearance, for he not only had on a full suit of black, but his shirt was perfectly clean, and the collar turned very neatly down over a white cravat, while his hair was parted in front like a girl's. His hands were clasped pensively together over his stomach, and his two eyes were carefully rolled up into the top of his head. Upon observing him more closely, I perceived that he wore a black silk apron over his small clothes, and this was a thing which I thought very odd. Before I had time to make any remark, however, upon so singular a circumstance, he interrupted me. To this second observation, I was not immediately prepared to reply. The fact is, remarks of this laconic nature are nearly unanswerable. I am not ashamed to say, therefore, that I turned to Mr. Toby Dammit for assistance. Dammit, what are you about? Don't you hear? The gentleman says, ahem. I looked sternly at my friend while I thus addressed him, for, to say the truth, I felt particularly puzzled. And when a man is particularly puzzled, he must knit his brows and look savage, else he looks like a fool. Toby! Damn it! Uh, although this sounded very much like an oath, believe me, nothing was further from my thoughts. Damn it! The gentleman says, ahem! I do not attempt to defend my remark on the score of profundity. I did not think it profound myself, but I have noticed that the effect of our speeches is not always proportionate to their importance in our own eyes. But if I had knocked Toby on the head with the turnstile itself, he could hardly have been more discomfited than when I addressed him with those simple words. You don't say so. Are you quite sure he said that? Well, at all events, I'm for it now, and may as well put a bold face upon the matter. Here goes then. Ahem! 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 Strangely, the little old gentleman seemed pleased. God only knows why. He left his station at the nook of the bridge, came forward with a gracious air, took Dammit by the hand, and shook it cordially, looking all the while straight up in his face with an air of the most unadulterated benignity it is possible for the mind of man to imagine. Finally, he spoke. Well, well, Toby Dammit. Ah, uh, that's right, good sir. And what think you of my assertion and my wager? That you can leap the turnstile? Correct you are, and perform with consummate skill a buck and wing at the apex of my leap. I am quite sure you will win your wager. 
damn it. But we are obliged to have a trial, you know, for the sake of mere form. <clears throat> a trial, you say? <clears throat> My friend took off his coat with a deep sigh and tied a pocket handkerchief around his waist. He produced an unaccountable alteration in his countenance by twisting up his eyes and bringing down the corners of his mouth. <clears throat> I did not express myself aloud, but I thought this is a quite a remarkable silence on the part of Toby, damn it, and is no doubt a consequence of his verbosity upon a previous occasion. I wonder if he has forgotten the many unanswerable questions which he propounded to me so fluently on the day when I gave him my last lecture. Ah, uh, him! The old gentleman now took him by the arm and led him more into the shade of the bridge, a few paces back from the turnstile. My good fellow... I make it a point of conscience to allow you this much run. Wait here till I take my place by the style so that I may see whether you go over it handsomely and don't omit any flourishes of the buck and wing. A mere form, you know. I will say one, two, three, and away. And mind you start at the word Away. The little gentleman stood there a moment, looking quietly at Toby as though appraising him. Then he turned, walked away, and took his position by the stile. Again he paused a moment, as if in profound reflection, then looked up and smiled very slightly, tightened the strings of his apron, and took a long, long look at Dammit. I thought to myself, what right has the old gentleman to make any other gentleman jump? Who is he? If he asks me to jump, I won't do it, and that's flat, and I don't care who the devil he is. The devil, he... But what I said, or what I thought, or what I heard, occupied only an instant. The black-suited little man gave the word as agreed upon. One, two, three, and away! I saw Toby run nimbly and spring grandly from the floor of the bridge, cutting the most awful flourishes with his legs as he went up. I saw him high in the air, buck and winging it to admiration. I thought it a singular thing that he did not continue to go over. But the whole leap was the affair of a moment. And before I had a chance to make any profound reflection, down came Mr. Dammit on the flat of his back, on the same side of the stile from which he had started. At the same instant, I saw the old gentleman running off at the top of his speed. But ere leaving us, he had caught and wrapped up in his apron something that fell heavily into it from the darkness of the arch just over the turnstile. At all this, I was much astonished, but I had no leisure to think, for Mr. Dammit lay particularly still, and I concluded that his feelings had been hurt and that he stood in need of my assistance. I hurried up to him and found that he had received what might be termed a serious injury, quite serious. Quickly, I threw open an adjacent window of the bridge, and the sad truth flashed upon me. About five feet above the top of the turnstile, there extended a flat iron bar that served to strengthen the structure. With the edge of this brace, it appeared evident, the neck of my unfortunate friend had come precisely in contact. And alas, the truth is, he had been deprived of his head. He did not long survive his terrible loss. Despite the efforts of the physicians, he grew worse and, at length, died. So I bedewed his grave with my tears, worked a bar sinister on his family escutcheon, and assumed the general expenses of his modest funeral. Exit Toby Dammit. Toby Dammit, a lesson to all riotous livers, and proof absolute of my initial assertion that every tale should have, must have, does have, a moral. You have just heard John Daner in the CBS Radio Workshop's production of Never Bet the Devil Your Head, under the guest direction of Jack Johnstone. It was adapted for radio by Alan Botzer, with music composed and conducted by Amerigo Marino. Heard in the supporting cast were Eleanor Audley, Leon Ledoux, Dawes Butler, Richard Beals, and Howard McNear. 
Next week from New York, the workshop will present The Heart of Man, a dramatization of a surgical operation in which the heart itself is the principal actor. Hugh Douglas speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. On Losing One's Head, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Paula Santa. On Losing One's Head by G.K. Chesterton. When I was a little boy, I had an imagination though this has long been washed out of me by the wordy abstractions of politics and journalism. For imagination, real imagination, is never a vague thing of vistas. Real imagination is always materialistic, for imagination consists of images, generally graven images. There is a mad literalism about imagination, and when I had it, I turned everything that any one mentioned into a concrete body and a staring shape. Thus, I would hear grown-up people using ordinary proverbs and figures of speech. Pale, worn-out proverbs, battered and colorless figures of speech. But every one of those phrases sprang out of me as fierce and vivid as a motto written in fireworks. For some reason, I had a particularly graphic visual concept in the case of nautical metaphors. Thus, when I heard that my uncle on a sea voyage had got his sea legs, I pictured the most horrible bodily transformations in my uncle. Had my uncle now got four legs? Or had it been necessary for his two original and, to my eye, unobjectionable legs to be amputated by the ship's doctor? Did the new legs arrive as sort of extra luggage, or did they loathsomely grow upon him, like hair or fungoids, with all the awful unnaturalness of nature? I pictured my uncle's sea legs as two green and glittering members, covered with scales like fishes, and bearing some resemblance to the two fish tails with which exuberant Renaissance artists sometimes provided tritons and mermaids. Again, when I heard, in some seafaring connection, that the captain kept his weather eye open, I assumed with faultless infantile logic that he kept the other one quite shut. And in some dreams, I rather pictured the captain's weather eye as being some separate and eccentric kind of eye, like that of a cyclops, an eye of blue sky or lightning that opened suddenly in his hat or his coattails, and blazed through black fantastic tempests, a strange star of the storm. But there were many cases, even among more terrestrial and commonplace metaphors, where the material metaphor photographed itself on my fancy. One of them was the phrase about a man losing his heart. A man, considered as a material envelope, seemed so securely done up that how the heart could get out of the body was a problem analogous to that of how the apple could get into the dumpling. Perhaps, I mused, the phrase about a man having his heart in his mouth might throw some light on the somewhat revolting phrase, which spoke of a man with his heart in his boots, where there was clearly no thoroughfare. From this, my childish taste 
return with a certain relief to the easier and more popular picture of a man losing his head, which seemed the sort of thing that might happen to anybody. Indeed, by this dream of symbolic decapitation, I was much haunted in infancy, and am not infrequently inspired and comforted even to this day. Whatever other metaphors may mean, this metaphor of the lost head has some primary and poetic meaning, and I have written many bad poems, bad fairy tales, and bad apologues in my industrious attempt to find it out and declare it. The connection between the animal and intellectual meaning of it became close and even confused. I vaguely thought of Charles I as having lost his head equally in both senses, which is not perhaps wholly untrue. When I read of the miracle of St. Dennis, who carried his head in his hand, it seemed to me quite a soothing and graceful proceeding, like a gentleman carrying his hat in his hand. St. Dennis did not lose his head anyhow. He carried it in his hand as so not to lose it, as ladies do their ridiculous handbags. Indeed, this drifting and dancing dream of decapitation, in which kings and saints figured with gothic fantasticality, had some kind of allegory in the core of it. The separation of body and head is a sort of symbol that the separation of body and soul, which is made by all the heresies and sophistries, which are the nightmares of the mind. The mere materialist is a body that has lost its head. The mere spiritualist is a head that has mislaid its body. Under the same symbol can be found the old distinction between the sinner and the heretic about which theology has uttered many paradoxes more profitable to study than some modern people fancy. For there is one kind of man who takes off his head and throws it in the gutter, who dethrones and forgets the reason that should be his ruler and witness and the horrible headless body strides away over cities and sanctuaries, breaking them down and treading them into mire and blood. He is the criminal. But there is another figure equally sinister and strange. This man forgets his body, with all its instinctive honesties and recurrent sanities and laws of God. He leaves his body working in the fields like a slave, and the head goes away to think alone. The head, detached and dehumanized, thinks faster and faster like a clock gone mad. It is never heated by any generous blood, never softened by any healthy fatigue, never checked or warned by any of the terrible toxins of instinct. The head thinks because it cannot do anything else, because it cannot feel or doubt or know. This man is the heretic, and in this way all the heresies were made. The anarchist goes off his head, and the sophist goes off his body. I will not renew the old dispute about which is the worse amputation, but I should recommend the prudent reader to avoid both. End of On Losing One's Head by G. K. Chesterton The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I should say welcome to a continuing episode of the fascinating story of Queen Nefertiti and King Akhenaten. I'm delighted to help unveil the mystery of a civilization long ago blanketed by the sweeping desert sands of the Nile Valley. Because the glory that was Egypt has been dug from the tombs of Tutankhamun and other pharaohs, we today have the wrong impression that those ancients cared more about how they died than how they lived. Nothing could be further from the truth. Akhenaten, where's my daughter? She's on her knees, praying. Over there, in the temple courtyard. She's been there all day. What else would she be doing in the temple? That baby. A child of five. 
on her knees in this roofless temple, all day in this heat. Macatartan, daughter, darling child. Oh, no! Someone come here, come quickly! Help me! Our drama, The Head with One Eye, based on historic records, written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The excitement and interest in one particular Egyptian queen who ruled Egypt 14 centuries before Christ would have never begun had it not been for the discovery of an extraordinary plaster and painted portrait of Nefertiti herself, sculpted in sinuous relief. Go to any museum today, and you'll find a reproduction of this head and shoulders of a woman who can rightly be called the first free-spirited, emancipated female in history. If Nefertiti lived today, aside from her stunning looks and bearing, she'd be regarded as most modern. I now had two children. Makatatan, who is three, and Tutton Carmen, still a baby. Between being a full-time mother and a part-time supervisor of the building of a new city, a full-time wife to a pharaoh who devoted his every moment to establishing a new religion of one god, the time left to myself sped as fast as the falcon flies. Good morning, Queen Nefertiti. Good morning, Marianis. There are a great many state papers for you to deal with today. Don't I know it? I've been up for hours. You'll find my replies to the army for the request of 200 new chariots, bow and arrows, and so forth in the third gold box. My reasons for saying no are there to force. Are you going somewhere this morning, Nefertiti? Not likely. I've called a meeting of the sanitation department at 11. Why are you wearing your blue hat? The royal headdress? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's for him. Hutmus, the sculptor. He's supposed to be here. If being an artist, it means you have no idea of the time. I wish we could get along without them. But we can't. They are so irresponsible. They say he's the finest sculptor in Egypt. But what's all that got to do with your wearing a hat? He wants it for my official portrait. Now, Mariani, let's have what you brought me. Your Highness, Your Highness, Your Highness. I prostrate myself. Please forgive me. Is that, Miss? You are late. I am sorry, Your Highness. Go on, set up your easel and the sculpting stand and your plaster, whatever you like. I must go on working. The business of state cannot stop for us. Don't worry yourself, Queen Nefertiti. Oh, I'm delighted you're wearing the blue hat. It will set off your face magnificently. You don't mind working in silence, do you, Tutmus? It's a little hard to concentrate while we're chatting, and I have a table full of state matters that must be dealt with. Do you know my personal assistant, Mariani? Uh, uh. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, I'll just set up over here by the window where I shan't be in the way. Uh, oh, you have your little baby here in a crib. <laughs> Isn't he alive? He must be cut in common. I'd loathe being late, especially on such an important occasion as doing the Queen's head. You have no idea how much I've been looking forward to this day. What kept you? Well, I couldn't get through the Royal Road. It is so torn up. You wouldn't believe it. It's a battlefield of paving stones. I finally stopped my carriage and got to the palace on foot. I told them to tear up all that black pavement. Tear it up, get rid of it. If those builders can't find pure white stone, I'd rather they pack the earth down. At least it would be the right color. Now, uh, before we start, dear Queen, I uh, brought you a little something. Oh, I love presents. Will you unwrap it for me, Tutmus? Oh, a little statuette. Very nice indeed. What is it? A portrait, full length of your boy. Of who? Tutton Carmen. This is supposed to be him. You, you don't like it? Mariani, do you see any resemblance? Uh, there isn't supposed to be a resemblance. Why not? It's the custom, dear Queen. Custom? This dwarf, stick figure could be anybody. My great-grandfather, the General Horonrab, anybody. Nefertiti, I don't see how you can say that. It's a beautifully fashioned statuette. But it's not my son, Tutton Common. Your Highness, I really don't understand the fuss. What is it that you want? 
I want life. I want your art to imitate life itself. I've always hated our stylized portraits. I want reality in plaster, limestone, wood, anything. You mean to really look real? From now on, Tutmus, art must change. No more dwarf figures, no more scarecrows, no more lies. I'm not attacking you, dear Master Sculptor. I've far too much respect for that. Everyone knows you are Egypt's greatest artist. But if this new city, Amana, is to be the city of truth, then our art must be equally truthful. Realism? I can't wait to get started. Oh, my wondrous queen, if you only knew what you have done for me. I, too, have always hated those awful statues that tradition compelled me to carve, where everybody's face could be anybody's face. Let, let me get started. Uh, Nefertiti, uh, are you sure? The queen is always sure. Oh, my queen, you have reached my heart. All my life, I, I knew something was missing. And now, to carve and paint what I see, a real smile. <laughs> Over here, Tadmus. Yes, here, I've got a table in the corner. Oh, am I glad this day is over. That Nefertiti, she is one big package of surprises, I tell you. <laughs> you think you had a bad day? You just try being the scribe for Akhenaten and take down his dictation. He is so particular. Every single word. Nefertiti is quite difficult, too. Confused me completely. Wait till I tell you. <laughs> well, that's quite a royal pair we've got on the throne these days. <laughs> Uh, I almost quit today. You're joking. What? There isn't a scribe in all Egypt who wouldn't like your job. Yes, and welcome to it. It's nerve-wracking and thankless. No matter what I do, it's wrong. The fellow doesn't think I write fast enough. Only one thing keeps me from throwing the papyrus right in Akhenaten's face. What's that? Horace forbid. Yes, I'm afraid he'd have me killed. Oh, no, he wouldn't. The pharaoh is the last person in the world to order such punishment. Are you sure? Akhenaten is too concerned with his new religion and philosophies. He's a dreamer. And dreamers don't act. Not violently. Well, they're, they're an interesting pair. You have to admire them. A lot of my friends in Thebes have started to come here to Amarna. This is a new world, Mayhew. A new city. Yes, city of truth. Isn't that what they call it? I came to the palace today to do her portrait. Nefertiti wants her plaster portrait to be as lifelike as I can make it. Think of the opportunity. Tomorrow at noon we start. <laughs> we live in a wonderful age, my friend. Good morning, my queen. I've brought you the seven gold trays containing today's business. Put them in their usual place on my table. Mariani, have you seen my little daughter today? Nakatatan? No. Where is she? She didn't come to kiss me good morning. The pharaoh took her with him very early. They went to the Greek temple of Aton. Good. I like that. Remind me, Mariani, to inform the exchequer that when the workmen take time off to build their own houses on the avenue extension, they are to receive full wages. I'll make a note of that. What is it, Marianne? Why are you standing there in that funny way? Are you holding something behind your back? This little basket was left on the steps to your door. I don't know how it got there exactly. What are you being so mysterious about? A basket? It's a gift. Someone's left you a gift. For me? Where is that someone? Outside. Let me open the basket and see. Ah! <gasps> oh, a kitten from Persia. Oh, he's sweet, darling. Look how white and fluffy he is. <laughs> a kitten. No, wait. Is it Hornrath? General Hornrath. But it can't be. Why not? Why shouldn't the general of the Egyptian army visit oh. his queen? Hello, Mariani. Good day, General. Mariani, don't go. Stay. I, I had better. I'm beginning to get a little concerned about Mekatartan. She isn't used to being out in the sun that much. Oh, she's with her father. You told me so no harm can come to her. Dear, I'm worried. <laughs> I see nothing has changed. No, it hasn't. Mariani still does my worrying for me. Mariani, all right. Here, take the kitten. When Mekatartan gets back, you let her play with it. She'll love it. So white and soft and furry. Horror and Rab, thank you very, very much. You know what a kitten means to me. The one man, Mariani, who never brings me flowers. But always kitten. <laughs> I take my leave of you, Your Majesty. Tell my little daughter we shall call it Mew Mew the Second. How old is she? Almost six years old. 
Has it been that long? Let me look at you, dear General. You haven't changed. Well, not on the outside, perhaps. Well, you have blossomed, Nefertiti. Have I? As has your city of truth. What brings you to Amana? I need help. We all need help. In fact, we need a miracle, Nefertiti. Dear friend of my childhood, you never did waste time on small talk, did you? If we want to survive as a nation, something must be done immediately. Surely, if Egypt is in danger, you and the army can take care of any enemy. That's what I meant when I said we need a miracle. If the pharaoh has any influence over Aton, the sun god, now is the time to use it. Otherwise, my dear, beautiful Nefertiti, we are all lost. Did this really happen? Are those we have met, Nefertiti the Queen, Horan Rob the General, Putmus the Sculpture, Mariani, are they real? Did they live? They did. How do we know? By reading the inscriptions on the tombs, words on the scarabs, cuneiform correspondence between Asiatic kings and the pharaohs. Archaeology is pure detective work, and the solution is history. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Let me prove to you that so far as ancient Egypt is concerned, one word is worth a thousand pictures. Of our city of truth, Amarna today, nothing remains to be seen, only the ruins and your imagination. Picture this in your mind's eye. A complex of buildings eight miles along the Nile, three miles deep. Mansions of nobles and public officials, military and police barracks, storehouses, customs houses, workmen's houses, temples, and palaces. And the greatest of these, with hundreds of rooms and colonnades opening into sunken gardens and water lily pools, the royal palace is larger than Versailles and Fontainebleau combined. You see it? Of course you do. And inside that palace, Nefertiti and her visitor talk. What do you mean, General Horenrab, Egypt is lost? We must, without delay, launch a full-scale attack on the Hittites and wipe them out right at home before they can get their war machine started. We've heard nothing of this danger here in Amana. Why didn't Thebes inform us? Why should they? You've got no friends in Thebes. Not one government official, not a nobleman, not a priest. you mad. Yes, that's exactly what they say about Akhenaten and you, Nefertiti. Mad. In all the history of 18 dynasties, you both are the least liked of any reigning monarchs. Stop that. I, the queen of all Egypt, have not given you permission to talk like that. Nefertiti, I am not a stranger. I am Horan Rab, your general, supreme commander of the Eastern Armies. Now... Isn't this the city of truth? Or is the truth only for your subjects and not for yourself? I don't know why I make myself angry. What do I expect from Thebes? From those simple-minded, superstitious fools? I suppose as queen you could expect loyalty. You cannot ransack a temple and keep its high priest for a friend. You cannot take all the gold there is in the treasury and expect thanks in return. Such decisions are made here. Egypt is being governed from Amana. Egypt is not being governed at all. You and Akhenaten are concerned only with taking every sack of gold you can lay your hands on from Memphis to Luxor to spend on this, 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 this toy city. Colin Rab, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, of course not. I am stupid. I have no idea how much gold it takes for new streets and new houses and palaces and temples to Aton for this entire make-believe city. The price, Nefertiti, is the safety of Egypt. And there is no better use for gold than to build a new awakening. Ah, may Horus steal my angry tongue. What about your defenses, your army? What army? Exactly. What army? We have no army. It has been disbanded by order of your mighty husband, the Pharaoh. But why? Because that soft-headed, turn-the-other-cheek Akhenaten thinks everybody loves him at home and abroad. Because the both of you believe in love and peace, you think you think the rest of the world does. Now, Egypt is a great prize for the strong. Have you tried to talk peace with them? Certainly. Oh, the Hittites received me most cordially. King Hattie told me, oh, let us all disarm. You see, there is brotherly love. He wants peace. Oh, 
What a child you are. What he means is, we should disarm first. <laughs> Thank Horace he has no idea that there's no money to pay our troops. Or perhaps he knows there are spies everywhere. Now, I am here to ask for money and permission to attack them first. I am general of an undermanned, starved-out crowd of veterans. Now, will you talk to Akhenaten? Nefertiti, by all that is sacred to you, your ancestors, your love of Egypt, help me. Help Egypt. Oh, Nefertiti, I'm very worried. The child is not back. I hope she's still with the king. Of course she is. Her father wouldn't let her out of his sight. No harm can come to her. General Horonrad, thank you for the Persian kitten. It was thoughtful of you. If you will make yourself comfortable in the palace, I shall arrange for you and the pharaoh to discuss your needs this afternoon. As you wish, Your Highness, I take my leave. Mariani, give me my blue turban. It's time for Tutmus, the sculptor, to arrive. Yes. I wish I didn't have to go through this nonsense. Well, why do you? It's all my husband's idea. He wants Tutmus to make an exact likeness, then have copies made and placed in every single temple courtyard in Egypt. I don't believe in such public notice. But my husband does. My queen. Uh, queen Nefertiti. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, just a moment, Tutmus. Uh, yes, Mariani, do come in. I have some dispatches to go out. Uh, yes. y- your Majesty, could you not move so much? I told you in advance, Tutmus. I don't have the time to sit for you. If you can do your work while I do mine, we shall get along splendidly. Well, uh, could you hold your head a little higher? Oh, no, I, that's the hat, Your Majesty. My hat? This blue turban? You asked me to wear it. Oh, I, I know I did, but... What's wrong with it? I, I adore it, my queen, but there is... Uh, how can I say it? Too much hat. When you bend forward over the table while you're working, all I can see is the hat and no face. And Egypt loves. The face. Uh, may I suggest that, uh, uh, Mariani, uh, would you be good enough to tilt Queen Nefertiti's hat just a little to one side? Oh, all right. Uh, excuse me, Your Highness. Uh, like so. Ah, uh, Mariani, hold a hand mirror before the Queen so she can see the effect. Perfect. At an angle. What do you think, Nefertiti? Hold the mirror still. No! I wear the royal headdress so, straight. I do not wear it on one side. I never wear it tilted on one side. It's up to you, my queen, but... Tutmus, you may leave me now. I cannot pose any longer. Oh, as you wish. I- I'll just uh, cover the clay and the plaster and be on my way. Forgive me if I've been a little testy, but there is so much to do. Oh, for me, Queen Nefertiti, you can do no wrong. Is he gone, Mariani? Yes. Come over here to his sculptor stand. I want to look at what he's been working on. Now, I remove the cloth. What do you think? Oh, an extraordinary likeness, Nefertiti. Is that all? Do you wish me to be completely honest? Yes, I do. Your face, the expression, it's sad. Too sad. I thought so. That is how I felt today. Tomorrow, I must look happier. I knew it was true what Horan Raz had said. And it haunted me. Akhenaten, intent on being a spiritual leader, was failing Egypt as a leader of the living. And I was devoting too much of myself in creating a city of sun, of life, of art and joy. We had cut ourselves off from the rest of the nation... And the truth was, Amana could be neither Akhenaten's mausoleum or Nefertiti's Mecca, so long as swords were pointed at Egypt. Mehu, the scribe. Uh, what? You're not listening to me. Oh, oh no, no, I, I am, I am, Greg Farrow. It's uh, just that I, I look over there and it's a little warm in the temple center court, you understand. The sun uh, beating right down in the middle of the day, no roof, and, and that, that little child... That sun is our god. He is shining our way to everlasting life. Oh, oh I couldn't uh, agree with you more, uh, King Akhenaten. No. Where were we? Uh, oh, yeah, you had just said, I have built shrines and temples in honor of the gods. Wait. Who... Let me see that papyrus. Oh, imbecile. Dolt. Who told you in honor of the gods? It is God. 
G-O-D, singular. Don't you know what our religion is? It, it was an unfortunate slip. <sighs> See that the stone cutters get this much of the text. Don't touch a word. Yes, yes. Uh, King Akhenaton, your daughter Mekhetaton is still kneeling where you left her to pray several hours ago. Naturally. Uh, but, but she's very little, and it is very hot on the granite altar stone. I have asked no more of her than any pharaoh of his royal offspring. I want the prayer to Aton to be remembered, and when she knows it, she can get to her feet and run around and play. <laughs> Are you ready to meet with me now, Nefertiti? Ah, oh, Horanrath. What have you been doing? I used the past hours to explore your dream city. No question. It is a city of sunlight. It outdoes anything in Thebes or Luxor. I congratulate you on your imaginative planning. The gardens, the fountains. <laughs> you like it. <clears throat> now, wasn't it worth all the effect? Mm, the whole city shows the results of much preparation and thought. Years of it. Do you know, Horanrath? Before we could put up a single building, we had to sink wells for water, dig drainage ditches, set up workshops to cut and carve all the building materials. Uh, never, Iti. The same care and planning you've done for this city, you should be doing to preserve Egypt from outsiders. Don't say any more, please. I've been thinking a lot about what you said. One must face the truth. The sunlight and idealisms are truths, but so are black clouds and danger. You've made me realize that, Horan Rab. Mariani. Your, your majesty. Has the king returned? No, he hasn't. Or little Mekatatan. What's the hour? Five hours after high noon. If the king on the mountain will not come to his queen, then Nefertiti must go to the mountain. Come, Horan Rath, and you too, Mariani. We must go to the great temple and present my husband with the truth. Scribe, have you got that down? Uh, every word, oh, Pharaoh. Then add this. There will be 100 statues, each 13 feet high, uh, giving us one for each temple. They shall be conveyed by barge as far north as Memphis, as far south as Aswan, and each statue shall be erected on the same day. I, uh, I believe that is the queen approaching. Uh, uh, she has a military man with her. Nefertiti? Well, what's she doing up here? Akhenaten! Akhenaten, I bring Horonrab. Uh, I'm very busy now. I cannot talk to him. You will talk to him. Akhenaten, where is our daughter? Over there, in the center of the temple. What do you have her doing? She's on her knees, praying. What else should she be doing in the great temple to Aton? Child of five? In all this heat? Megatarden! Darling child! Oh, no! Horn and rug! Someone come here! Come quickly! Help me! A little child kneeling at prayer in the blazing sun suddenly collapses. A queen cries out in fear. A strong enemy prepares to attack a weak Egypt. Can one or any of the ancient gods intercede? Or, as we have come to know today, does not man himself decide his destiny? I shall return shortly with Act Three. enabled us to recreate this account of this beautiful, adored woman of ancient Egypt, married to a man of royal lineage who rebelled against the pagan worship and human sacrifice of his ancestors. For Akhenaten was the first monarch in Egyptian history to believe in one God. What God? What God? It is Your God has killed our firstborn in the earth. 
The old gods will kill us all. Oh, no. No, never, Titi. It is an honor to be the first to be claimed by Atom. You are mad. We are cursed, all of us. I shall never bear another child. The gods will never forget me. Little queen, there is one small secret temple. Yes, here in Amana. For those who still believe in Amun, Isis, and their sire, every day prayers have gone to them. Oh. Now I understand. No wonder Atom, the god of the sun, has taken our child from us. So, there is a secret temple and secret worshippers under my very nose. Oh, they do not know what vengeance is. Now they will know. Go, the sight of you all seconds me. You're all unclean and unworthy to stand in this great temple in the sight of the sun. Go! before the great God of the sun and pray for your guidance. I thought we could show others by example. We would lead and they would follow. I was wrong. Forgive me, I have dishonored thy presence. I promise thee, in the name of that dear dead child, that every picture Every statue, every tomb from one end of the Nile to the other honoring a false god will disappear. All will be destroyed. Forgive me, Hassan! and forth into Egypt, disfiguring and destroying in a wholesale slaughter of our sacred place. I had come to realize I was married to a madman. What other explanation was? So I moved from the royal palace to the northern palace. We would be separate, but equally. Both our orders were regarded as law. Queen Mesopotamia, I bring you good tidings. Messengers from General Coronel have arrived. What do they say? Victory is ours. The Hittite queen is slain. Oh. And strength and death go hand in hand. There is a visitor who begs our peace. He has been with his dawn. Who is it? The master's child. What do you wish? He has a personal word from the Pharaoh. Oh. The Pharaoh has asked me to tell you he loves you. He wishes you would return to the royal palace. From his heart, he will forgive you for your, your intention. Hmm. You forgive me. His, his word is your, your majesty. Hmm. The sinner in time will forgive me. My only sin is to obey my father and marry a king. I can never return to the Pharaoh's side. And you can tell him so, Clyde. Never. He is very sick, my queen. Explain yourself. The pharaoh keeps to himself and sees few people. I, I have been with him uh, when he would become violent and nothing would please him. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, last night I came to him for dictation as always. Uh, and suddenly he shrieked at the top of his lungs in pain and, and cried and wept like a child, uh, beating, beating his hands about his head. When we were first married, we suffered terrible aches of the head, but I thought they had gone away. Is there anything else, Brian? Uh, the the terror of the poison. After every meal, it's the sick to the stomach. The food it saves my prison. Thank you, Christ. You may leave me. Yes, I am honored, great queen. You, you have been kind to me. Marianne? Yes, my prison. You heard the cry? I was outside listening. What should I do? I cannot leave you. Listen to your heart. Mr. Dessert? I cannot promise him to remain, but I cannot be so uncharitable as to say that. Mr. Titi, uh, I never thought you would come. I was told you were not there. Oh, nothing, nothing at all. Slight in this division. There are dark circles under your eyes. Do you not sleep? I sleep perfectly. You look thin. Thinner than I remember you. Don't you 
<laughs> if you come back to criticize, you really think that all these months we've lived apart, two forces ruling over one kingdom, but I've been pining away for you? Your pride told me you wished me to your son, so I have. Uh, yes. Well, uh, it's because on the 21st of this year there's the annual festival tribute from our vassal nations, and I wanted you to be at my side. I'd ask up, Mr. Stewart, make a drawing of us together. I can imagine. You didn't ask me back only for a festival. You do love me. I, I do. I do. I, I always have. It was the memory of our love. The two dreams we sailed on the night to find the city of sea. That made me come back to you. Husband. Do you love me, Mr. Peter? I love the man you are. The man you have become is a stranger to me. How am I different? How? In so many ways. Why? I don't know. Cannot you love me as I am, not as I was? A woman who is once loved always wishes she could have a time. But it's all different now. I am different. What changed you? I think when little Nakatop and that something died within me also. I cannot blame you. You believed you were doing right to ask that small child to remain unamused to cry. You died a martyr. I said I didn't blame you. You two will see that on the sun. We are two people with two minds. And now, two beliefs. I returned to the royal palace. Not that my love for my husband was so great. But my fears for his well-being were greater. So I did his bidding and became his wife again. Welcome, oh, to let her kiss you. Uh, am I interrupting? <laughs> Got me. No, no. I was just staring out the window at the sky. The favor has asked me to check the two of you at the window of appearances, welcoming you for ambassador's sin. Whatever happened to that guy's who was doing with me some time ago? Oh, I did it. When you went to the Northern Palace, the sailors then paced around here like a wild boar. <laughs> I was afraid the box would be destroyed. Did you ever complete it? No, without you, I couldn't feel it. A few more sittings could do it. You got me. <clears throat> what if one day I turn to your work back and you think the portrait of me and I do have to stare? You would come to my workshop? I would. In secret. At least to offer myself to art. Would be something worth us. As I look back on it now, perhaps I was wrong. But I knew Tatnus was a great, great artist. And so, for many weeks, I would go to his workshop and say, not only wearing the blue hat, but often for a full trip, wearing the first little accent. Oh, I'm tired, but I can be... Uh, do you mind if I start working on the marble today? I'm standing still in one place on a little tired in the sun. Yes. In your desk, let us sit down and have a cup of wine. I cannot remain long, Captain. The emissaries of our supreme commander have asked for an audience. You mean horrified? You, you, you didn't come in first? Is that so surprising? Well, Mother Peter, there's always been talk about you in here. There always will be talk. Some people have nothing better to do. Whether it's the foreign rats whom I've known since we were children, or you, Captain. There'll be talk about you, if there isn't already. Do you think so? Does it matter, dear Mr. Peter? That's what I ask myself. Since I've accepted my husband in 40 years, the building of our mind doesn't interest me anymore. It's impossible. You have lost the daughter. Isn't that the real reason? We call her... Mr. Tuckman, do you know what that means, dear Tuckman? Protected by action. Seriously, yes, forgot. Do you believe that? Do yes. I must? Thank you. I don't let myself think about it. Time to go. You know what I haven't looked at in ages? Me, in the blue hat. Where is it? <laughs> you worked on it when I first came here, then you put it away. Perhaps it will make me feel less sad. Let me put my arms about you to comfort you. You're so very close to you. Have you no personal feelings for me? No. 
Not that person. Ah, oh, here's the head on the corner of his head. You were right. The blue turban is an asset. That was pity. My heart is filled with you. That's me. I may be an unhappy queen, but I'm still queen. And you, our servant. What is that? My left eye isn't there. It's blind. You haven't finished it. No, everything but that eye. Cut me, complete the head, and bring it to the palace. I'd like my husband to see it. My queen, you do not know me. My body may be your servant, but not my spirit. I shall decide who will see the portrait. I made it, it's mine, and always will be. I command you to paint in that left eye and bring the finished work to the palace. I shall not. You would leave it like this. Disfigured. You have disfigured me. If all I am to be left with is a head with one eye, so be it. Never see this. There has been much talk in court about other men. You should dislike it. It is of no matter to me whatsoever. I have no feeling for you. Where is all that love and need you threw at me so that I would return and look at you? Gone. Perhaps it never existed. In fact, I know my love for you did exist once. Well. What do you wish? We must have more children. We have Captain Carmen and several little girls. I want more children. What might you wish me to come to you? You never asked me that when we were first married. I did not know that my firstborn little girl would be taken to me so soon. Not to teach her about life. So close for her. Never to hold it to my breast. Love. Take her up and kiss her. Kiss her. All right. It's been taken to me. I have been wrong. You could never be a husband and wife again. For the first time in my life, I felt it was worthless and fruitless to go. One resolve and only one second going to return the keys and to bury my daughter now lying in some underground crypt in the park. To bury her with the old and sacred funeral rites. Until then, I would be a head of state in name only. As the sculptor had said, I would only see life as a head with one eye. It's pure conjecture why the left eye of the famous bust of Nefertiti is missing. But archaeologists are all agreed it is missing. It was not damaged. It was never there. So we are left with a painted plaster, one-eyed beauty, and assumption. Yes, sir. More when I return to tell you about the final chapter in this extraordinary story. There are those who may believe our account is fiction. For those, I refer you to John D.S. Pendlebury, the great Egyptologist, who writes, There is not another family in all of world history whose images are so heart-rending in their misfortune. The fifth and last episode is for next time, concluding the tale of a woman whose beautiful face is today known to millions, but whose life as a queen, mother, philosopher, and activist is only beginning to come to light. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Russell Horton, Evie Juster, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now a preview of the next exciting drama in our five-part anthology of Egypt's Golden Age, starring Tammy Grimes. You don't understand. Get away from me. Come down from the steps. I don't want you near me. Don't you understand? You don't know me anymore. Please. 
I'm standing here on the top step. Don't you come any closer. It's your bed, dearest no. one. We are husband and wife. Stay where you are. Failure is written all over you. Enemies around you, enemies at home. What is your god, Aton, the sun, done for Egypt? Do you know what I have hidden behind this curtain? There. Oh! Look. There they are. My gods. Oh. Froth, the standing baboon. So bet the crocodile. They protect me. You traitor. And what has he done for us, your one god? Where is he? I am Aton. I am God. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tune in tomorrow night for part five on Radio Mystery Theater of Egypt's Golden Age. G. Marshall, historian of the ultra and the bizarre, and talking about historians and history, is there a more magical year to Americans than 1776, a more enchanted number? And yet, if you were a betting man way back then, you would have had to go with the overwhelming odds and back the British. Why not? The British had the men, they had the ships, they had the money too. All that the Americans had were a few of what we now call the intangibles. But isn't that what life is all about? The intangibles? What's this about a ghost? I won't have... General, I've seen it. I won't have sergeants who spread such ridiculous rumors. But General Washington, sir, the man has no head. A Hessian on horseback without a head. Sir... I fought under you when you was a colonel in the King's Virginia Militia. And I waited 17 years to serve under you again. And we've been under fire no less than five times together. That's why an old soldier like you should know better. I do know better. And I've seen him. This headless hash. That'll be all, Sergeant. This is... Yes, sir. General, a man was obviously conquered to rank. No, Major Hamilton. I would wager my life on Sergeant Meadows. If he says he saw a headless Hessian, then depend on it. There is a headless Hessian. Our mystery drama, The Headless Hessian, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Lloyd Bachner. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Two hundred years ago, if you were a poor German peasant in the province of Hesse-Darmstadt, you could be drafted into the Landgrave's army, and your regiment could be sold to whatever foreign country could afford to buy it. Frederick II sold some soldiers to George III to put down a little disturbance in the American colonies. 22,000 troops for about $15 million in today's money, or some $730 per man, which was just about a good going price for an able-bodied black slave, too. Well... Along about December of 1776, there was a large detachment of Hessians stationed in Trenton, New Jersey. Their commanding officer was a certain Colonel Rawl. He was considered a good soldier, but he did have a certain weakness. And since you'd never guess what it is, I'll tell you. The Colonel was crazy about music played on the flute. 
Yes? I have here a note to the colonel from the captain of the guard. All right. Wait here. Yes? Ah, oh, it's the beautiful Peggy. A, a soldier brought you this note, sir. Hmm. To the commanding officer from the captain of the guard. Sir, the bearer of this note is the most accomplished flute player I have ever heard. I believe you would enjoy hearing it. Oh, 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 I must see him at once. But, Colonel, we must arrange for the disposition of the trenches. Tomorrow, tomorrow. I respectfully submit... Lieutenant Peel. Suppose the Americans attack. Suppose the Americans attack. Are you serious, Lieutenant? Colonel, it is possible. Yes, it's possible. It's possible for the sun to shine at midnight. It's possible for the Delaware River to turn into a foaming current of beer. But the American army is... This rabble that calls itself the American army no longer exists. Sir, General Washington has at least 40,000 men. This upstart militia colonel has been running like a whip dog across four rivers. The Hudson, the Hackensack, the Passaic, and the Delaware. He's now at bay. So he is very dangerous and clever. My boy, you must believe this war is over. Your commander, Lord Cornwallis, plans to sail for England next month to report this fact to the king. The Americans are still organized. They have spirit. Son, I promised your father I would make an officer and a gentleman out of you. The first requisite for success in a military career. Never contradict your superior. Even when I am right? Especially when you're right. Peggy. Bring in my flute player. Colonel, this Washington is wearing us down. Oh, ah, my hit. flute player. Well, sir, Private Heinrich Reinmuth reporting. And where are you from, Heinrich? Aldersburg, if it should please your excellency. Good oh, country. I see you brought your flute. And so, present arms. A little tune from the home country, excellency. I obey, Your Excellency. Give him some money, Peel. <laughs> now, don't fish for pennies like some frugal Frenchman. Give him the handful. He's earned it. I thank Your Excellency. Peggy, take him into the kitchen. The man must be hungry. This way. Good night, Your Excellency. Peggy. You fool, you fool. Ah, but I'm your fool, darling Peggy. Where did you get that uniform? You could be shot. See you once again. It's worth it. Well, it's worth nothing of the kind. You've got to get out of here. After all the trouble I had getting in here, you want me to get out? Uh, when you knocked on the door, I, I said to myself, well, here's a Hessian that looks like Tom Caldwell. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. And then I watched you play. Ah, have I improved? Oh, yes, your tone is so much... Tom, stop it. <laughs> You want to be shot as a spy? Oh, now, wait. What does that walrus mean by my beautiful Peggy? Oh, he's all right. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, everybody says Mom and I are lucky the Hessian commander chose our house for his headquarters. Mm. We, well, we're protected against the riffraff, you know. How did you get here? Well, the governor called out the Jersey militia and attached us to Washington's army. I had to see you. But the army's across the Delaware. How did you get here? You have to ask that. You don't remember our... Secret place? Oh, the fort. Yes. I borrowed a horse. But, Tom, what are you going to do? Well, I'd like to get married. Now? Yeah, well, we're going to have to wait a little while, but it, it'll be over soon. Oh, I don't think so. We won't win for a long time. We're not going to win at all. Tom. Oh, Peggy, you should see Washington's army. Half of them don't have uniforms or even blankets or shoes. Ain't hardly two weapons alike. There's shotguns, muskets, fowling pieces, a few rifles. I have faith in that army. Yeah, well, in a couple of three weeks, there isn't going to be in the army. Most everybody's enlistment's expired. Most everybody's gone home. Even you? Even me. Well... Peggy, we've only got one life. Let's live it. Let's be happy. Peggy! More wine! Oh, I, I've got to go back in there. 
You'd better get out of here, Tom. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, Tom, please, no. It's too dangerous. I love you, Peggy. How... How are you going to get back to our lines in that uniform? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about... Don't worry about anything, Tom. Caldwell has arrived and the situation is well in hand. Wake up, boys. Wake up. Sounds like somebody's coming on horseback. Stand by to challenge. Halt! Hold on, fire! No! Mr. Jones! He ain't got no head! Good Lord! I'm getting out of here! Come on! Oh, Major Hamilton, what is this nonsense? General Washington, I don't know, but it's quite serious. We have enough problems. <sighs> no, I suppose not. There's always room for more. The men are terrified. A headless Hessian. What kind of child saw him? on the road leading to the river actually saw him. Now, there were others who saw him, They too. were all probably drunk. General, I would tend to agree. But where would they get the liquor? You must never underestimate the resourcefulness of the American soldier, Major Hamilton. How can I fault them? We're low on food, practically no blankets, and it's freezing. The sergeant in charge of the picket is outside, sir. I thought you'd like to see him. What I want to do is plan our attack on Trenton, which has to happen before the ice in the river freezes completely. General, he insists on seeing you. All right, Hamilton. Sergeant Meadows. Sergeant Meadows, Connecticut Brigade reporting, sir. Out in Meadow. Yes, I remember you. You helped me rally the men at the Battle of Long Island. If I had a couple of hundred more like you, we'd still be on the east bank of the Hudson River. Yes, sir. General Washington, yes, sir, we, we sure would. Now, what's this ghost story nonsense? It, it ain't nonsense. You're talking like a day-old recruit sergeant. I seen it, sir, with my own eyes. See what? The hesitation. As one old-timer to another, Sergeant, did you see him through the fumes? Sir, sir, help me, General. I ain't had a drop since we crossed the Hackensack River. Give me a detailed report. Well, sir, we was on picket duty, and, and we heard this horseman approach. So I stood up and I challenged him. Halt! But he, but he don't halt. He, he only seems to, to ride faster. Well, sir, I, I brought my weapon to bear. I was about to shoot. And then I seen his face. Uh, what I mean is, he, he, he had no face. No head. No head. No, General. He was dressed in the uniform of a Hessian mercenary soldier. A and it was all complete. See, he didn't have his head. Since he had disobeyed your order to halt, why didn't you fire? Sure, if any other officer asked me that, I'd answer my foot was wet or, or the primer flashed in the pan or that I shot and missed. But you know what my answer is to you, General? You were scared out of your wits. Yes, sir. And I would have been scared, too. All right, Sergeant, that's all. General Washington, I did see him. The, the four men with me, they seen him, too. He was a headless Hessian. Thank you, Sergeant. Report back to your unit. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, this is all we need, Major Hamilton. You can get men to fight when they're hungry, tired, cold, but not when they're scared of a ghost. But there's no such thing as a ghost, General. Hamilton, you're an intelligent man. I think you're the most intelligent man in the whole army. But don't let your intelligence get in the way of the facts. The fact here is there's a ghost, or what the men think is a ghost, and that's the same thing. It's him! The headless Hessian! Go! Go! That's the fifth night in a row, Major Hamilton. Yes, General. They see this thing coming. Why can't they shoot it? Well, they say they just freeze. Hamilton, how do you account for it? I... I don't know. Maybe there is a headless Hessian. Major, I'm surprised at you. I know you should be, this but I... This thing is destroying the morale of our forces. I want to attack Trenton no later than Christmas. We have to win the battle. We have to do something to make the people believe we can win this war. Could... Could it be a trick? Could the enemy be using this as a way to frighten our men? Then I can't think of a better answer. Now, you tell me he comes down the North Road from the river 
Which is something I don't understand. The men expect him. Why can't they shoot? I can't explain, General. Just something happens, that's all. You get that chill running down your backbone and that icy fear like a cold hand clasped around your heart. Sergeant, I understand your term of service expires next week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope you'll set a good example to the rest of your unit by re-enlisting. Oh. Come, Sergeant, you know we simply can't afford to lose trained men like you and your comrades. Oh, General, we ain't afraid of nothing that lives. It's what's dead that scares us. We, we just can't fight the supernatural. Sergeant, suppose we end the career of this headless hessian. How are you going to do that? I said suppose. Well, in that case, General, I... Let us exchange promises, Sergeant. I shall promise you that the headless Hessian will ride no more. And you must promise me to re-enlist. General, it's done. Forward, Major Hamilton. General, you made that man a promise. I know, Hamilton. That means we will have to end the night riding of that notorious headless Hessian. I'm aware of that. Does the general have any idea how it's to be done? Not at this time, Major Hamilton. I... I don't... Yes, Major. Now, no, there's something on your mind. Say it. Sir, I just couldn't believe you would ever make a promise you couldn't keep. Well, I intend to keep it. You just said you didn't even know but how. I have till midnight to think of something. Suppose we start thinking. There is a legend about George Washington that he never told a lie. And although it's become fashionable to strip our heroes down to more human proportions, the fact is, the Washington legend remains surprisingly intact. And he has every intention of keeping this promise. He has to. All I intend to promise you is that I shall return in a few moments with Act Two. As if General George Washington doesn't have enough tangible obstacles to contend with, a scarcity of food, arms, ammunition, and equipment, he has now, in addition a supernatural problem. Terrorizing the camp is a headless Hessian horseman who is seen riding about almost every night. And unless this apparition is speedily dismounted and disposed of, it doesn't look as if there will be a flood of re-enlistments at this most crucial hour. I am thinking, General, but nothing occurs to me. Whoever he is, he's flesh and blood. And he can stop on bullets. And so I know what we have to do. Yes, sir. Well, who's making that very pretty music? Uh, don't let me interrupt you, soldier. Uh, Private Tom Caldwell, New Jersey Brigade, sir. You're an expert flute player. Well, thank you, sir. I'm quite fond of music myself. Yes, General, so they say. Really? What do they say? Well, they say you sing a perfect harmony. We'll have to arrange for a musical evening once we have the British on the run. Yes, sir. And what do you think of this headless Hessian soldier? Well, sir, how can there be a headless anybody? Correct. I hope you can convince your friends. There's a straight-thinking young man for you, Hamilton. We need more like him. Sir... What is your plan for dismounting this headless Hessian? We know he comes from the direction of Trenton, do we not? Yes, sir. We know the time to be about midnight. Yes. The men on picket duty find themselves unable to shoot at him, isn't that so? True. But tonight, we shall have special squads of men who are not afraid to fire. May I volunteer to command one of those squads? Certainly, Hamilton. And ask Lieutenant Monroe to volunteer to command another. Yes, 
Yes, give him some money, Lieutenant Peel. <laughs> Here you are. Uh, now, Colonel, please listen to me. The fortified place. There will be no fortified places. It's not necessary. Don't you... Why are you standing there? Leave! Go in the kitchen, Reinemuth, and have something to eat and drink. Thank you, Your Excellency. At least, Colonel, if British headquarters asks about fortifications, let us be able to say that we... All are... right, all right, all right. Show me where you want the holes to be done. All right, of it, sir. Uh, you must report here tomorrow. It's Christmas Eve. Yes, sir. Tom. Well, don't I get a kiss? You have to stop doing this. Uh, you're right, darling. No, I mean it. Well, so do I. I'm going to desert. Tom. Oh, just about half the army, it seems like, deserts every day. But, but, darling, it's over. But Washington says if he has to, he'll retire to the mountains and fight from there. Peggy, all I ever wanted was to make hay on my farm, make music on my flute, and, and make love to you. I don't need any revolution for that. Tom, I just can't think of you as a coward. Oh, try another word. Try prudent. Prudent? This harebrained thing you're doing now, that's prudent? You're risking your life every minute. Well, it's all right. At least I'm risking my life for me. I'll see you tomorrow. No, Tom. If you come back, I... I'll leave here. But, sweetheart... It's crazy. It can only end with your getting yourself killed one way or the other. By one side or the other. Well, maybe. I want us to get married. Somehow, we both have to live through this war, and crazy people won't survive. Tom, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Peggy. You've got to grow up. You know what I mean. Exactly. I don't need a few nights like this. I need the rest of our lives. Promise me, Tom. Promise me. You won't come here again until it's really safe. But pay promise. I promise. Your men have their orders? Yes, General. I want this man taken... I prefer to have him alive, but if he insists, then we'll have to take him dead. Is that there? Yes, sir. Tomorrow night is Christmas Eve. The enemy will be celebrating. We can have the advantage of surprise. If only we can capture this headless Hessian, our men will have the enthusiasm for a fight. Major Hamilton, Lieutenant Monroe, you must put a stop to him. <laughs> There. Major Hamilton, Lieutenant Monroe, and two squads. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I recognize you, sir. Any sign of it. Not yet, Major Hamilton. Oh, he comes this way all the time. Oh, when he comes. Monroe, we might as well deploy our men along the road. Out of sight, then. Get among the three. Now, I want it quiet. No one is to make a sound. Listen. It's him, sir. It's him. Headless Hessian. Don't get out of here. Don't anyone move. Hold still. Hold still. Challenge him, Sergeant. Stand back. I'll do it myself. Halt. Halt or I'll fire. Halt. Let him have it. Fire. Fire. What's wrong with you, man? Uh, I'm all froze up, Major. Uh, Ooh, hand me a rifle. I don't know what to say. I'm sorry, sir. What are you standing here for? Ask him. <laughs> I fired. Lieutenant Monroe fired. Then I grabbed the sergeant's rifle and fired again, but he was gone. And there was no sign of him? We had 20 men. If everyone had fired... Well, some we... shots were fired, and everyone heard them. And now I'm afraid it'll get worse. Worse, General? How? We may have begun a legend of an invincible and bulletproof headless Hessian. I'm sorry, sir. I'll go out there myself next time. Somebody has to bring him down. Come in. Uh, Sergeant Meadows reporting, sir. Yes, Meadows. Sir, I, I'm sorry about last night. I, I, I... What is it, then? What have you got there? Uh, it's a flute. Uh, yes, General. Where did you get it? Well, when we went chasing after the headless passion, I happened to notice something lying along the side of the road. And I stopped and picked it up. A flute? Well, what would a flute... Sorry. Sergeant, take a squad, go over to the New Jersey hutments, and arrest a man named Tom Caldwell. 
and also search all his belongings. But, General, I, I, I don't understand. Don't you? Uh, no, sir. How do you account for this Hessian uniform? That uniform? Uh, well, General Washington, I, I, I never saw that thing before in all my life. It was found in the bottom of your kit. Well, m maybe someone put it there as a, as a joke. That's right. You, you know how fellas are. We, we have some great jokers in the outfit. And the money? Money? These are silver kroner. You can see they come from Hess Darmstadt. Now, soldier, where would you come into possession of Hessian money? Oh, um, uh, that. Well, it, it was in the skirmish, sir. Uh, the, the skirmish we had three weeks ago, and this one was lying there dead, and I, I looked through his pockets. Well, that ain't a crime, is it? And uh, that's how I, uh, come to get it. And your flute. What was it doing lying by the side of the road? So that's what happened to it. I, I knew I lost it someplace. Don't you want to tell the truth, soldier? For the good of your soul? Uh, for, for the good of my soul? General, when you talk like that, it means you're uh, going to hang me. You performed a treasonous act for the enemy, soldier. No, it, it wasn't treason. It wasn't. You deny you were paid. Here's the money. I told you how I got a it. A common soldier wouldn't have so much money. He was an officer. Soldier, your only hope is the truth. You you wouldn't believe it. And why wouldn't I believe it? Because you'd have to be crazy like me. So many people have called me crazy. Sir, I've, I've got this girl. She lives in Trenton. Her name is Margaret. Peggy Mason. Yes. Well, I just had to see her. I, I had to. You can understand that, General, can't you? Yes. So I, uh, well, well, I couldn't go there in civilian clothes, could I? So I picked up this Hessian uniform. The coat's kind of big, and I just put the top of it up over my head so it would look like I was, um, headless. Yes, sir, headless. And that would get me past our picket. You say the girl's name is Peggy Mason. Major Hamilton, why is the name Mason familiar? The Hessian commander is headquartered in the Mason house. Of course. Do you mean to tell me that you actually risk going to the enemy headquarters? Yes, sir. But as a Hessian soldier, you would have to speak German. Yes, sir, but when I was a very small boy, I was bound out to this German farmer, and I learned how to speak in Deutsch uh, really good. Even so, how could you get into the colonel's headquarters? Well, sir, I knew something about this Colonel Rawl. The colonel, he's a fool for flute music, and so... Now, let me understand this. You went to the headquarters, played the flute for Colonel Rawl. Yes, sir, and he appreciated it so much, he gave me money. Uh, the money you found. And then afterward, you found an opportunity to spend some time with your girl. Oh, yes, sir. I was always able to find time for that. Weren't you afraid you'd be shot coming back? Well, sir, I figured everyone would be too scared to shoot at me. And I was right until last night. I heard them shots, and I was so scared, I just dropped my flute. I, I couldn't stop to look for it. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, sir, that's about it. I don't think it's worth my getting shot. Oh, you wouldn't be shot in any of it. The penalty for treason is death by hanging. Well, General, please, the way I see it, the worst I did was to be absent without leave. Very well, soldier. We listened to your fairy tale. Now, suppose you tell us the truth. Major, that was the truth. Every single word was the truth. Sergeant, take the prisoner outside. Yeah, please, sir. You, you ain't going to hang me. Prisoner, stand at attention. About face. Forward, port. Yeah, yeah, please, General. General Washington, don't order them to hang me. <laughs> Admittedly, it would be better if Tom had a more convincing story. We know Tom is telling the truth, but unfortunately, our testimony will have no way of making itself felt. His fate, at this point, rests with General Washington. His only hope is that Washington, who is a completely truthful person, may be able to discern the truth in others. You only have a few moments to wait for my inevitable return with Act Three. of the headless Hessian has come to an end. He is neither headless 
Laura Hessian. She is Tom Caldwell, a New Jersey infantryman who is only trying to visit his girl inside the British lines at Trenton. And he has been discovered and in grave danger of being dispatched as a traitor. The decision is up to the commander-in-chief. General, you have the right to order him executed. Or would you prefer to assemble a court-martial? A court-martial? Major Hamilton, they would hang him. But the man deserves to be hanged. No one deserves to be hanged. We only use the rope because we're unable to think of a truly fitting punishment. You must admit he tells quite a story. An unbelievable story. I don't know about that. I think I believe him. But the story makes no sense. Hamilton, you are an extremely intelligent and logical man. But you mustn't let it ruin your common sense. But, sir, I... How old are you? Twenty-nine. And how old do you suppose that soldier is? Twenty-two, twenty-three. And I am forty-four. Now, why do I understand that boy better than you do? General, I understand he is a traitor. Oh, come, Hamilton. He's in love. Love? Yes, he's in love. The way only a young man can be in love. He's not only in love with her, but he's in love with love itself. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but I'm afraid I don't follow. Well, maybe you will one day, and you'll be a better man for it. It's more than the girl. It's the adventure, the danger. He risks his life every time he sees her. He can be captured by the Hessians and hanged. He could be captured or shot by his own side as well. <laughs> can a young man ask for more? Well, what do you propose to do with him? He deserves a medal. <laughs> General! Oh, don't be alarmed. I shall do the proper thing and take an extremely dim view of the situation. Bring him back here. Sergeant, the prisoner. Soldier, I believe your story. Oh, thank you, General. I, I knew you would. Everyone says General Washington, he's the fairest man that in the That doesn't whole... mean you're innocent. Uh, no, sir. No, I'm sure I'm guilty of something, but nothing that would call for a rope now, would it? Being absent without leave... Frightening the soldiers of the United States Army. Well, sir, grown men being scared of a ghost, uh, we wouldn't want that to get around. Silence, it's not for you to justify your misdeeds. And, uh, no, no, sir. Therefore, you will continue in your present course of action. My which, sir? You will continue to ride to Trenton in the guise of a Hessian soldier. At least for one more night. Tonight, to be exact. But I, I, I don't want to get shot at coming back. You won't be coming back. I won't. No one is coming back. Tonight, we shall take Trenton. But, but, but I promised my girl I would... Since would've... you've been traveling there on a more or less regular basis, you must be aware of the location of the fortifications. The fortifications? The earthworks, the trenches, the strong points. Oh, oh, damn. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, there ain't none. <laughs> a soldier, that's impossible. No, no, General. You know, there just ain't no fortifications. It is incredible that the Hessian commander would leave the town unfortified. Well, he couldn't violate the most elementary rule of warfare. Now, think carefully, soldier. There must be an outpost. Oh, yeah, an outpost. Yeah, that's just as you cross the river on the main road. And there must be a fortification of some sort for them to fall back on. No, sir, there ain't. Well, I know it's been dark every time you've been there, but try to remember. I remember. There's this Colonel Rawl. He's the commander, see, and he don't want to build no fortifications. He doesn't? Yeah, no, sir. And furthermore, he says, uh, uh, begging your pardon, that the American army ain't going to be able to attack. You heard him say that. Yes, sir. He says uh, to this uh, Lieutenant Peel, who keeps begging him to build up the defenses. And why does he say that? Well, because he says the American army is just a rabble that no longer exists. Is that what he said? Yes, sir. And uh, also that General Washington is only an upstart militia colonel who's already run like a whip dog across four rivers. I'm only saying what he said, sir. That's quite all right. But Lieutenant Peel don't think so. He thinks you're dangerous and clever. Thank you, now, soldier, every man in the army 
has a mission for tonight. Yours will be to go into Trenton dressed as a Hessian. I want you to entertain Colonel Rawl. Entertain him as long as you can. Now, Colonel, I would suggest a fortified position here on this rice, which commands... Yes, yes, an excellent idea. Also, a line of trenches. I, I agree. I want your authority to order this work done. You have it. I mean to have it done immediately. At once, sir. Tonight? Within the hour. But it's Christmas. There is no Christmas during war. Now, my boy, zeal is a commendable quality. Colonel, I must... Work your men as hard as you must. Work them to death if you have to. But never work them needlessly for no real purpose. I understand, but Look you must... about you. It's snowing, freezing. The Delaware separates us from the Americans. Do you mean Washington would attempt to cross the river on such a night? He would attempt anything. Oh, but how could anyone get boats across in this weather? Oh, he has a detachment of fishermen from the city of Gloucester in Massachusetts. These men are skilled with boats. Fishermen and farmers and loudmouth lawyers. This is all these Yankees are. Why do they frighten you? I am not frightened. I what just... will you do if you ever have to fight against real soldiers? I am. I know, I know, but don't get yourself a reputation for being overcautious. Some people might mistake it for cowardice. <sighs> yes, sir. We are to have a party at headquarters this evening. Private Rhino will throw play as usual. Yes, sir. And by the way, he deserves a reward. You give him money every time. He deserves more. Have him entered as a corporal. Because he plays a flute? It's as good a reason as any. <laughs> Better than most. Why did you come back tonight? I wanted to see you. But you promised. Peggy, sweetheart, I couldn't keep away. Oh, I'm really scared. Of what? Something's going to go wrong. I know it. I I just know it. And I thought we understood that... Now, Peggy, everything's going to be all right. I swear to you. Please, Tom, you're crazy to do this just for me. Well, I'm not doing it just for you. You're not? No, ma'am. Now, now you you got to cross your heart and hope to die never to breathe a living word. Yes? But... I'm here on official business. Official business? From whom? General Washington. General Washington. You ain't supposed to breathe a word. Well, I like that. And here all this time, I thought you were doing it just for me. Well, I I am. I'm just combining business and uh, pleasure. Rydemuth? Where's Rydemuth? Rydemuth? They're calling me, sweetheart. I've I've got to go in there now. Please be careful. What could go wrong? Quiet, everyone. Quiet. We shall now listen to our genius of the flute, our own Heinrich Reinemuth from Aldersburg. <laughs> Beautiful Aldersburg. Heinrich, we are in your hands. Thank you, sir. Oh, don't thank me yet. Wait. Wait till you see how I intend to reward you. Bill? Bill? Well, look at that Bill. Bill? Yes, sir. Well, close the door. We'll freeze to death. You missed the music. Heinrich was superb. Now, did you attend to that little matter, Colonel? Heinrich's promotion. Oh, that, sir. It cannot be done. Who says it cannot be done? We cannot promote Reinemuth to corporal for the reason that there is no Heinrich Reinemuth on the roster of this regiment. But that's impossible. Don't let him get away. Ah. What did you just say, Lieutenant? There is no Heinrich Reinemuth. But that's impossible. He's standing here in front of us. Private Reinemuth, your paper, please. Well? Gentlemen, just where, Private Reinemuth, is the town of Aldersburg? Where I have spoken to the men from every corner of Hestamstead. No one has ever heard of it. Well, it's, um... It is in your head! Reinemuth, who are you? He is a spy! Is this true, Reinemuth? No, sir, it, it's not true, e- exactly. Are you a soldier in the American Army? 
Matter, even if he is a civilian, he is wearing a uniform. We must presume he is a spy. Did you come here to spy on us, Reinemo? No, sir. Then why did you come? Colonel, I heard you were very fond of music, and anybody who loves the flute is a friend of mine. Why but... did you come here? Because I knew my music would make you happy. Let us hang him at once. Colonel, don't you believe me? Yes. Yes, I believe you. Oh. Sir, how could you believe such a story? It doesn't make sense. It makes sense to me. Does that mean this man goes free? Oh, no, no. He cannot go free. But, 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 but I wasn't here to spy. You are in uniform. Well, you wouldn't hang me to that. Oh, but we will shoot you. Tom! Tom! Oh, please, Colonel. My dear young lady, what are you doing here? He didn't mean any harm. Perhaps, but the law is the law. No. Let's take him outside. Goodbye, Peggy. No, no, I won't let him. Hoffman, Schneider, please. Restrain our good hostess. Oh. Gently. Oh, please, Colonel. Prisoner, stand at attention. Forward, march. Squad, halt. Here is as fine a spot as any, and you can be buried under this beautiful old oak tree. Does that suit you? Well, I don't have a choice, do I? I, I mean, I, I, do I have to get shot? Yes. Well, I, I like this place. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't like it. Uh, do you have any last words? Yeah, I was hoping you might have some last words, like maybe reprieve. Form the firing party. You have no last words. No, sir. Um, get it over with. Do you suppose you could play us a song? I would appreciate it. Yes, sir. Halt. Ask the word. Halt. 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 What do you make of that music, Hamilton? It must be our man. What's he doing out in the cold? Ask the word to move up slowly. Move up. Lieutenant Peel, command the firing party. Firing party! Ready! Aim! Fire! The Americans! The Americans! Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! I'm an American! I'm an Fortunately, Tom escaped the hail of bullets, and he survived the Battle of Trenton, which every student of history knows was a great and glorious victory. And it came at an extremely crucial time. When the war was over, Tom married Peggy Mason and made music even sweeter than before. I'll tell you what happened to all of the other people as soon as I return, which will be immediately after these messages. the story true? My goodness, when you think of all the fables, past and present, that people swallow without question, why should I be compelled to provide documentary evidence? There was a General George Washington. There was an Alexander Hamilton. There was a Battle of Trenton. And we won it. The Hessian commander was a Colonel Wall. He was killed in the first fusillade. And he was a fanatic lover of the flute. And we know this because it appears in the diary of a Lieutenant Peel, who was his adjutant. Tom and Peggy, well, uh, we have to have some license, don't we? And we use it here seven times each week. Our cast included Lloyd Bachner, Jack Grimes, Marriott Hartley, Casey Kasem, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler? I'm the whistler. If you could look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize he's inanimate, dead, with no power to harm. That was old Peter Medford, the jungle explorer, now confined to a wheelchair with paralysis. I would suggest that you leave this place at once, Miss Medford. At once. That was Clay Alden, Peter Medford's secretary. And this is Marie, Peter Medford's young niece. No, no, no. It's no dream. It's here. Here in my room. Saturday night, and CBS presents another in the new mystery series, The Whistler. And I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets, hidden in the hearts of men and women who've stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you tonight the strange mystery of the shrunken head. In the quickening darkness of a stormy fall evening, a young girl paces the deserted platform of a small suburban railroad station. From her anxious attitude, we know that she's waiting for someone. But just be patient, Miss Medford. There is someone coming to meet you. <laughs> he has just now driven up. He is coming through the station door, walking up behind you. Miss Medford? Oh, oh yes, I... Sorry to have kept you waiting. I'm Clay Alden. Oh, yes. Uncle Peter has mentioned you in his letters. Uh, his secretary, aren't you? That's right. Where is my uncle? He was disappointed he couldn't meet you. Pretty much of a task for the old gentleman to get around these days. You see, he's confined to a wheelchair. Oh, I didn't know. Serious? Legs are paralyzed. Result of jungle fever. Just came on him lately. How awful. Yes, it's a shame, all right. Well, shall we get going? Car's out front. Better run for it or you'll get wet. Yes. I'll take care of your luggage. Thank you very much. Rather a disappointing reception, Marie Medford, wouldn't you think? You have come over 2,000 miles all by yourself just to see the only living relative you have in the world. And then you are met by a stranger. The car turns up the tree-lined driveway. This Marie is what is known in this countryside as Medford Manor. Yes, Medford Manor. It's all that the name implies, a gloomy pile of a structure, even made gloomier by the blackness of the night and the driving rain. Oh, someone has heard the car approach. The door is open. It's the butler, Victor. Well, Marie, are you going in? <laughs> what a pity you don't know what I do. You'd never cross that threshold if you did. Hmm, too late now. Your luggage is being brought in. The young man and the butler stand beside you. The door closes. Victor? Yes? Take Miss Medford's luggage upstairs to the south corner bedroom. The, the, the south corner bedroom, sir? Certainly. Why not? Very good, sir. Um, any further instructions? No. Oh, uh, has Mr. Medford retired yet? Uh, not yet, sir. He's in his study. I I just gave him his his warm milk. He may have dozed off, sir. All right. Thank you, Victor. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Would you care to follow Victor to your room, Miss Medford? I'd like to see my uncle now, if I could, please. Very well. Come this way. Here we are. I'll speak to him. Wait here, please. Well, Marie, how do you like it? You get a feeling of something not as it should be? <laughs> Strange fellow, this Clay. And the butler, too. Uh, look about you. What a depressing house. 
huge and cold and unfriendly. Oh, not at all as you'd imagined it. <laughs> Is it, Marie? Your uncle will see you now. Thank you. Marie, my dear child, come in, come in, come in. Uncle. Well, well, my oh. poor child, take off those wet things at once. Holden, <laughs> what's the matter with you? My niece will catch her death. Help her off with those things. Sorry, Mr. Medford. Thank you. Bless my soul, pretty as the picture. You got a kiss for us? Of course. <laughs> That's it. Now you sit down here beside oh, me. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't meet you, my dear, but I, I'm afraid the ravages of old age and malaria have finally caught up with me. My one comfort is this wheelchair. <laughs> Getting onto it, though, you should see me wheeling all over the house. <laughs> the only thing that baffles me is the stairs. My life is now confined to the first floor only. Oh, pretty bad trip, wasn't it? it seemed endless. Well, you're here now, thank goodness. This is your home. You're free to come and go and do whatever you please. Thank you, Uncle Peter. Don't suppose any of this is what you imagined? I know that I'm different from what I'd hoped you'd find. <laughs> Tell me, Uncle Peter, do you think you'd have recognized me if you hadn't known I was coming? Recognize you? Why, of course. You have the family of Medford written all over you. Oh. No mistaking you, my dear. Well, Alden, what are you standing there for? What are you staring at? Oh. Waiting to see if you need anything for this. Sir. No, 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 no. That's all. I'll ring for you if I need you. Yes, sir. Oh, I forgot to thank him. For what? He gets paid for whatever he does? Forgive me for saying this, but somehow I don't like that young man. Was he rude to you? Oh, no, not actually. But he seems to resent my being here. And the butler, he seems resentful, too. I feel as though I don't belong. Oh, they're harmless enough. But getting back to you... I I was so sorry I was in South America at the time the time it happened. Must have been pretty ghastly for you, my child. Like a nightmare, Uncle Peter. I'm not myself yet. I should think not. An only child losing both parents so suddenly and and so horribly. Maybe it was a good thing it was sudden. It had to happen at all. One spectator at the crash said that they never never knew what happened. No, 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 you mustn't talk about it. All that's behind you, a new life from now on. Hmm? Of course. And that's the way I want to look at it, Uncle Peter. And I'd like to get something to do. What? Oh, no. Oh, yes, you... really, I would. I want to be active if I can. I'm quite capable. I'd really like to get a, a job, Uncle Peter. Well, bless my soul. Secretarial work or anything. Well, that, that might not be a bad idea. It'll keep you from brooding. We'll see what we can do. And now, now I have a little surprise for you. You haven't seen my collection. No, I haven't. Mother and father often talked about it. Well, if you'll just open that door over there, I'll show some of it to you. Oh, this one? That's right. Uh, you'll find the light switch just inside. Why? Why, it's a regular museum. All these glass cases. Over here, my dear. Now, look at these. Well, what do you think of them? Why, well, they're horrible, Uncle Peter. They look like, like tiny human heads. Well, that's exactly what they are. Life-size at one time, but isn't it remarkable the way they shrink them down? Look at this one. See his little features, perfect in every detail. He's my favorite. Interesting history about him. He was once a white man. Oh. Forced down in the South American jungle when his plane cracked up. The headhunters got hold of him, and there he is. His name is Charlie. I'd like to see him closer. I can unlock the case. No, no, please. Do you mind if I don't look anymore? Oh, dear. I, I keep forgetting people are sometimes shocked by these things. I see them only through a collector's eyes. Oh, well, you'll have lots of time to look over my jungle paraphernalia. Meanwhile, perhaps you'd better get some rest. Would you like Victor to get you something to eat? No, thank you, Uncle Peter. But I am rather tired. I, I think I'll say good night to you. Know your way about, do you? Yes, I'll, I'll find my room. Good night, Uncle Peter. Good night, my sweet child. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Poor Marie. Know something? You're going to have dreams tonight. Unpleasant ones, too. <laughs> Well, let's move the clock ahead and go to Marie's bedroom. 
It's a little after three in the morning. She's asleep now. The rain's still coming down. The wind moans outside. Hear it? Yes, Marie's asleep. Looks peaceful enough lying there in that big four-poster bed. But suddenly she begins to toss. Mm. My name's Charlie. Mm. My name's Charlie. Mm. My name's Charlie. so real. I'm sure I heard it whisper. My name's Charlie. Only the wind. Oh, I wish I hadn't seen that dreadful thing. Miss Medford, are you all right? Who's there? Clay Alden. Oh. Oh, yes, Mr. Alden. I, uh, I just had a bad dream, that's all. I'm quite all right, thank you. Well, if you need anything, just ring. Yes, I will. Sorry I disturbed you. Not at all. Oh, I, I must get some sleep. Stop dreaming. But little sleep for you, Marie. <laughs> the moments tick by with dreadful slowness. Fearing to close her eyes, she lies staring at the roof of her bed, lying in agony for the moment when that hideous little head will again come floating in through space. <laughs> It is morning now. A dreary fog still hovers depressingly over the old house. A cold clamminess which only adds to Marie's sensation of uneasiness. In the dismal morning room, Victor is serving breakfast to Clay Alden and Marie. Shame you didn't rest well last night, Miss Medford. Oh, it's just the newness of everything. I'll get used to it, Victor. I hope you will, Miss. Of course you will. Oh, and Mr. Alden, um, don't mention anything to my uncle about that silly dream I had last night. Oh, of course not. Did you have a bad night, miss? Yes. The daytime makes such a difference in things. Even you seem different, Mr. Alden. For the better, I trust. Oh, sorry. That wasn't very complimentary. Oh, here comes Uncle. Well, good morning, you two. Good morning, Mr. Medford. Morning, Uncle Peter. You look quite fit this morning, sir. Feeling splendidly. Had the best night's sleep and I don't know how long. And how are you feeling, my child? Quite well, thank you, Uncle. Oh, uh, you remember our conversation of last evening? I mean, about you wanting to do something? Yes. I think I've got it for you. A friend of mine named Phineas Drake collects books, just purchased a library complete, wants someone to catalog it for him. Small pay, but not too difficult. Well, how does it sound? To you? Oh, it sounds wonderful. It's just what I want. <laughs> Splendid. I'll call him again after breakfast. Can you imagine such an ambitious young girl, Alden? Wants to work, and she's only worth a cool million. Oh, not yet. I'm not, Uncle Peter. Well, whenever you become of age, or whatever it's said in your father's will. I thought you knew what it said. I won't inherit my cool million until I'm married. What was that, Miss Medford? You see? Right away you put notions into his head. She said she won't come into her inheritance until she marries. Why her father made that strange provision, I shall never know. But, Marie, you stay your distance from this young man. Oh, Uncle Peter, you're making him embarrassed. <laughs> Can't an old man have his little joke? Anyway, with all the eligible young men you'll meet, poor Alden won't stand a chance. Hmm? <laughs> oh, Peter, please. <laughs> oh, all right, all right, all right. Victor, uh, where are my eggs? Right here, sir. Oh, yes, soft-boiled eggs. That's your diet. <sighs> Tell me, my dear. Did you find your room comfortable? Oh, yes, it's a lovely room. It's almost like a castle. Oh, I miss my old room. The one next to yours. I haven't been up there in over a month. One day soon, I'll have Victor and Alden carry me up those stairs just to see if the place looks the same. Victor, serve my niece some more coffee. Yes. Yes, of course, sir. You're going to have something to do, eh? Well, you're an intelligent girl. Should do well at your new assignment. It's harder work than you thought, though. Hours of scanning small print and copying down the individual histories of countless books. All go 
goes well for several weeks. And then early one afternoon, you return home, Marie, to find your uncle as usual in his study. Why are you so upset, Marie? <laughs> Marie! Well, you're home early. You're not finished already. Finished as far as Mr. Phineas Drake is concerned. I, I can't understand it. I've done my work well. This afternoon, Mr. Drake came to me and said he had no further use for my services. What? Didn't explain why, just, just looked at me queerly and said he preferred someone else to finish the job. Well, that's strange. Oh, well, he's an old crank. Don't let this upset you. We'll find something else for you to do. No, 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 no. Don't you worry. <laughs> with my work, Mr. Palanto. Surely it's been satisfactory. Well, you see, because of the uh, peculiar nature of my profession, I, I must have someone more experienced. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Medford. But I didn't, Professor Hanley. I did exactly as you instructed. What on earth is wrong? <clears throat> uh, you'll excuse me, Miss Medford, but... Uh... Well, your ability as an assistant has not come up to standard. Please listen, Dr. Humphrey. I've studied botany, and I, I've checked this manuscript most carefully. There's not a single mistake. Very sorry, Miss Medford, but they're not all acceptable. Have to get someone else. understand it, Uncle Peter. Is there something wrong with me? Well, I, I shall certainly call Dr. Humphrey right away. Oh, no. No, I'd rather you didn't. But it was only the other day he telephoned me and said what an efficient secretary he thought you were. There's something wrong somewhere. Oh, uh, you, you know, Marie, I, I think I'd give up this idea of wanting to work. I haven't mentioned it to you, but you're really not looking your best lately. Well, to tell the truth, Uncle, I, I haven't been sleeping well. I have the most frightening nightmares. In fact, it's the same dream every night. Well, that's odd. What's the dream about? Well, I, uh... I keep seeing that little head. The one you said was called Charlie. Oh, dear. I, I suppose I made a mistake showing that to you on your first night. If you could only look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize it is an animate dead with no power at all to do you harm. You build up a phobia about that head. Now, the thing to do is to destroy that fear by facing it. You come along with me, my dear. You mean in there again? It's the only way. Now, come along. Oh, no, Uncle Peter. I know what I'm doing. Open that door, Marie. I'm going to make you realize how foolish you've been. Over here, my dear. Oh, I know you think I'm being cruel, but I know my psychology. I... Why, that's strange. What is it, Uncle Peter? Why, somebody's broken into this case. Ring for Victor and get Alden here at once. Is something missing? Somebody has deliberately taken that head. <laughs> so Charlie is missing, eh? Wonder who could have broken the lock and lifted the little head from its black velvet pad. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> but now, several nights have passed. And still the head called Charlie has not reappeared. Marie has just taken a sedative her Uncle Peter gave her and is now lying on her bed, tossing, fretfully, praying for sleep. <laughs> sleep, oh. Marie. Tonight? Oh, dear heaven. No dreams tonight. Let me get some sleep. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. Yes, Marie. Open your eyes. No, You're no. holding me in your hands, Marie. Ah! Ah! Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! What's wrong, Miss Medford? Where's my uncle? She's downstairs asleep. Well, you're frightened out of your wits. Another of those dreams? It was no dream this time. The head. It's there in my room. What? It told me to open my eyes and look at it. And, and there it was in my hands. I was so frightened, I, I threw it to the floor. Oh, I know dreams can seem terribly real, oh, this but... this was no dream, I tell you. It's 
there now in my room. When I threw it on the floor, it, it rolled to the foot of my bed. Oh, don't look at me as though I'm a saint. Come look for yourself if you don't believe me. Just as you say. It's right here. I'll turn on this lamp here. Now, it... it's gone. It was here. It was. I saw it as plainly as I can see you. Oh, I know you think I'm crazy. Medford, please. What's wrong with Medford? I thought I heard you scream. Please. It's your uncle. Are you all right? I'm coming down, Uncle Peter. I must talk to you. Now, now, now. You must get hold of yourself, my dear. Oh, you won't think I'm crazy. But I really did see it. I touched it. And it was, it was nestled like an, like an orange in my hand. I woke up and, and threw it on the floor. And when Mr. Alden and I came back to the room, it was gone. Oh, you don't believe I actually saw it. Do you? Now, now, now compose yourself, child. I want to ask you some questions. First of all, in this dream, do you hear a voice of any kind? Yes. Yes. A voice that whispers, my name's Charlie, over and over. But tonight it, it said something different. Now, you needn't go on, my dear. I had hoped and prayed with all my heart that this wouldn't happen to you. But I'm afraid it has. What are you trying to tell me, Uncle Pete? You've heard me go on about the fine old Medford stock. Well, it so happens our branch isn't so fine. There's been something wrong with us. You mean... Insanity? Oh! But if there is insanity in the family, why haven't I heard of it before? Because, my dear, it's... It's the Medford secret. Oh. Oh, Peter. I'm frightened. Whatever you do, Marie, you must not let go of yourself. But it's not easy being told you're mad. Uncle Peter, if I am afflicted, then, then all those people must have known. That's why they discharged me. But how did they know? What did I do that would give evidence? Perhaps, perhaps you do things you're not aware of. Maybe I do. Seems the only logical answer. Oh, Uncle Pete. What's to become of me? Now, 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 we'll work this out together, my dear child. No one will ever know. You can depend upon me. I won't leave you. From tonight on, I shall be taken upstairs and I'll stay near you. Knowing that which afflicts us gives us a weapon with which to fight it. Just you rely upon me, my dear. Uncle Pete. Uncle Pete. I must see you for a moment. Very well. Better not close it. I'll have to talk quietly. Something wrong? Terribly wrong. The old gentleman's asleep in the next room. I had to wait till he dozed off before I could see you. Well? It's about the head. The head? The one he calls Charlie. It's back in its case. When did this happen? Sometime last night, I guess. After your nightmare. Yes, I'm convinced now that that's all it was. I am not so sure. What? When you threw Charlie to the floor, a piece of his ear broke off. I found it after you went downstairs. Here, here it is. It's Charlie's ear, all right? I checked it very carefully. Oh, no, this doesn't make sense. Did you ring for me, miss? No, no, Victor, no, I... I didn't ring. Oh. Sorry, miss. Excuse me. Miss Redford, you're in grave danger. You've got to leave this house as quickly as you can and never come back. What's going on in here? Uncle... What was that I heard you telling my niece, Clay? I said she should leave this house and never come back. All the impudence. Alden, explain yourself. I'll be glad to, sir. I think Miss Medford is in danger of losing her sanity as well as her life. What is all this poppycock? Are you trying to frighten my niece? Lord knows she's been through she's enough She's been without... through too much. If she weren't made of pretty stout stuff, she'd have been a gibbering idiot by this time. Alden, you're packing your things and leaving at once. Leaving? I'm afraid you're wrong, sir. I'm not leaving. Not yet. Maybe you're leaving. Now, Mr. Alden, what's the meaning of this? I'm sorry to break it to you this way, but I'm definitely convinced your uncle is a diabolical fiend. I can take so much and no more. Look here, Alden. If you know what's good for you, you leave here at once. At once, do you hear? You're pretty anxious to get rid of me, but it's too late. Miss Medford, you remember your father's will. You'd come into your money only if you married. Well, if you didn't marry, Uncle Peter would get the money. 
And if he could prove you were insane, you'd never be able to marry. You see how it all works out? Well, how dare you, Mr. Oldham? Listen Alden. to that maniac. Listen to me, Miss Medford. Your uncle, your loving uncle, was the one who telephoned your employers and told them you were crazy. Phineas Drake and all the others told me so today. I don't believe lies, it. Lies, lies, lies. Why, your uncle even told me you were crazy. I know what's happened. He himself smashed the lock and took the head from its case and planted it last night in your room. If you'll stand on a chair and look above your bed as I did this afternoon, you'll see a small radio loudspeaker. It's hooked up to a microphone in the back stairs hallway. The voice you heard was your Uncle Peter. I don't believe you. Last night, after you came out in the hallway, your Uncle Peter grabbed up the head, stepped out onto that balcony, and climbed down the vines to his study. Why, he's as mad as a March hare. How could I possibly be a party to such a monstrous plot? Why, I can't even walk. Look, look at this ear, a piece of Charlie's ear. I found it in Marie's room. That proves she wasn't dreaming, and it fits perfectly. I've tried it. Why, you... Give me that ear. Give it to me! Uncle Peter, you're walking. Give it to me! Look, look at him, Marie, standing unaided. Does that prove anything to you? Uncle Peter. Oh, and it's true. All right. All right, it's true. I can walk. But you are insane, Marie. Insane. You'll never marry anyone, Marie. I'll see to that. Victor, grab him. Don't move, Mr. Medford. Easy now. Don't believe what Alden says. You're crazy, Marie. There's no escaping it. You'll have those dreams, and Charlie will visit you every night. You'll hear him saying, My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. <laughs> Hold him, Victor. <laughs> Got him, sir. Oh, I think you're the one who's crazy, Medford. Maybe that could be proved. Take your hands off me. Take it easy now, Mr. Medford. Take it easy. There's nothing wrong with me. You know it. Is the car ready, Victor? Yes, it's ready. Come in, gentlemen. These are the officers. Yeah, then you'd better take him away. Yes, sir. Please come quietly, Mr. Medford. I'm not crazy. I'm not. Hello. You're lying on me. You're lying. Lying, you hear? You're lying. I... I'm terribly sorry about this, Marie. Terribly sorry. But it's all for the best. But how can it be for the best? What well, think what this means? He's my father's brother, and if he's insane, then, then it means that I might be too. Rums in the pen. No, no, don't worry, Marie. Don't worry. You're safe. You're perfectly normal. I know. You no. Know? Yes. You see, he wasn't your real uncle. He was your father's foster brother. I found proof. So you see, you've nothing, nothing in the world to fear. How do you know that? Someday, Marie, I'll tell you all about it. Tomorrow, maybe. Why don't you tell her now, Clay? Tell her why you were working as Peter Medford's secretary. Because your father was Peter's partner. His partner. That your father was ruined in business by Peter and killed himself. Killed himself in disgrace. That you suspected him of having cheated your father. That you came to find the evidence and discovered in time Peter's diabolical plan to prevent Marie from ever marrying. Better tell her, Clay. <laughs> I would. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Joseph Kearns, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler will return to tell you the strange story of the curse. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome to the wonders of your own imagination. 
For although I am about to tell you a horror story, it is really your imagination that will bring it to life for you. I shouldn't even say I will tell it, for it's really the story of Edward Somerset, as recounted in his private journal dated London, 1874, a truly harrowing account of what took place at Moorland Manor. Our mystery drama, The Headstrong Corpse, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Suzanne Grossman and Gordon Gould. As you may know, it's a custom of mine, a hobby, if you will, to read old diaries and journals the accounts of lives written down by people long since dead and in their graves. Recently, I had the good fortune to come across the journal of a certain Edward Somerset, a young London lawyer, barrister, the English would say, who tells a grisly tale of what took place at Moorland Manor in the year 1874. According to Edward Somerset... Uh, but no... Let him tell the story in his own words, just as he recorded it in his journal. And so, this being the appointed day, I took the coach to the village of Burley, 20 miles south of London in Kent, and in spite of the storminess of the weather, made the trip in less than four hours. I found Margaret Tresillian, the girl I loved devotedly, but who, alas, shall never be mine, in a terrible state of nerves. Edward, Edward, how glad I am to see you. And I you, my darling. Though I feared you would not welcome the sight of me. Oh, darling, if only I'd never consented to marry Richard Westmore. Never given my promise. You have no choice. Is there no escape, no way out? Only if Dr. Westmore releases you from your promise. The sins, the marriage contract you and your father signed. He'll never release me. In fact, he's coming for the weekend. He'll be here this evening to set the date for our marriage. I will Perhaps if I were to have a talk with him. Now, what's all that? Hobbs and Mrs. Murchison having another little Mr. Hobbs is that. Oh, no, it isn't, Mrs. Murchison, by no means. Oh, we'll see, Mr. Hobbs, we'll see. Miss, what is it now, Mrs. Murchison? Since we buried my father a week ago, you and Hobbs have quarreled without let-up. What is it this time? It's him and his lofty airs. That's what it is. Sir Simon was hardly cold in his coffin before Hobbs began lording it over me and the other servants. Now your father is dead, he seems to feel he's in charge. I am. That's the way Sir Simon would have wanted it. Oh, begging your pardon, miss, but as you know, I was butler and personal servant to your father before you were born. I've been with this family many years, most of my life, in fact. Whatever this disagreement between you and Mrs. Murchison may be, we'll discuss it another time. At the moment, we must go to the crypt. Fetch a lantern so you can light the way. Well, why do you stand there? Well, there'll be no need for me to enter the crypt, I trust. I don't believe so. Edward? No. The will merely states that the coffin was to be left open for a week and food and water left nearby. The master was always afraid of being buried alive. Deathly afraid. As many are. It's an all too common occurrence. But no, you needn't enter the crypt, Hobbs. Miss Tresillian must do that. And I, as a representative of the law firm of Costain and Loring, must accompany her. Ah, yes, sir, but when it comes to putting the lid on the coffin and screwing it down... I'll do that, since it seems to trouble you. Oh, thank you, sir, and I'll fetch the lantern. You may go, Mrs. Murchison. We'll discuss this matter later. Very well, miss. But Hobbs is becoming... He has become impossible. Oh, now, who could that be on such a day as this? Whoever it may be, let him in out of the storm, Mrs. Murchison. Yes, Miss Edward. Oh, oh, thank you, Murchison. Thank you. Frightful. Soaked to the skin. Oh, girlie. What brings you out on such a day? Well, all days are good days for business, my dear. Business? 
Oh, I apologize. I haven't introduced you. This is Mr. Edward Somerset of Coston and Loring, my father's solicitors. Uh, Edward Lord Burley. How do you do, sir? You're here on business, you say? Uh, to be exact, to make another offer for Moorland Manor, my dear. You've chosen a bad time, my lord. Though, really, any time would be bad. As my father told you more than once, I think, Moorland is not for sale. <laughs> Wrong tense, my dear. It wasn't for sale, but it is now. Or I happen to know soon will be. What gives you that idea, Lord Burley? Excuse me, Mr. Miss... Hobbs has brought the lantern, Edward. Lord Burley will have to excuse us. Ah, I had forgot. This is the day, and no doubt the time, for paying a visit to the family crypt, eh? <laughs> Your father had a fear of being buried alive. Well, I'm sure you'll find him dead enough. May I ask how you happen to be so well acquainted with the private affairs of Moorland Manor? How do you know this is the day we were to visit the crypt? There's little goes on in Burley, in the county and at the village, sir, that I don't know. Good day to you, sir. And you'll be hearing from me again, Mr. Sillian. Terrible man. Oh, certainly is. Well, Margaret, it's time. Yes. Hobbs, lead the way. Lantern Hobbs, and wait here. Oh, yes, sir. Come, Margaret. Edward, I I can't enter that awful place again. I'm afraid you must. It was your father's wish. So cold. Damp, so. Oh. There. There's the open coffin. Let me just shine the lantern inside it to be sure your father's body is still there. Yes, it is. Look, Margaret. Yes. Bob is there. Go outside now. I'll put the lid on the coffin and screw it down. All right. I'll wait for you with Hobbs until you... Edward. What is it? There's something strange here. Something... Curious. Clothes on the body. The clothes? That isn't the suit we buried my father in. In fact, Edward... Oh, good Lord. It isn't my father's body. Now, now, now. Edward, I tell you, it isn't. You knew my father. He was much taller. With thin. By heaven, you're right. But this makes no sense at all. It's his head. Yes. It is. I'm going to faint. Outside, quickly. I'll join you. Miss, what, what is it, Miss? Something horrible. Horrible? What, Miss? What? I don't dare say it, Hobbs. I don't dare think it. Mr. Somerset, sir, what is it? What is it in there? The, the thing in the coffin. It's Sir Simon's head, but not his body. Not his body? Someone cut his head off, stole his body, and put another in its place. <laughs> Utterly incredible, Somerset. Dr. Westmore, what I've just told you, I saw with my own eyes. So did Margaret. In fact, she was the one who first noticed it was the wrong body. Where is she? Resting. Or perhaps I should say recuperating. It was an awful shock for her. Oh, no doubt. Have you notified the police? No. Well, why not, man? There's only a constable in the village, and I... I've heard he's anything but competent. I intend to send a message to the London police by coach tomorrow morning. Well, better still, I'll take it for you. I'd rather not wait till you leave on Monday. Oh, I'll not be staying the weekend now. Margaret will be in no mood or condition to discuss our wedding plans. And as a surgeon at London Hospital, I have much to do. No point wasting my time here. You don't exactly sound like a man in love, Dr. Westmore. In love? 
With Margaret, of course. <laughs> but I'm not. Nor is she with me. It's all purely a financial arrangement, you understand. Well, no. I didn't quite. Oh, but of course. An arrangement I made with Sir Simon. He was a very ill man for nearly a decade. He sought my rather special services, if I may say so. But as you know, Moreland is mortgaged to the hilt, and he was unable to pay. In return, he offered you his daughter's hand in marriage? And Moreland Manor. Even though the estate is heavily mortgaged, it'll give me a tidy sum. A fortune, in fact, once I sell it. Now, look here, let's go down to the crypt. I want to see for myself. I'll ring for Hobbs first. You say you're not in love with Margaret? Not in the least. I am. Oh, well, are you indeed? And she's in love with me. Yes. Yes. I don't know quite how to ask this, except to ask it. Will you release Margaret? Why, of course not. Even if... Oh, Hobbs. You rang, sir? Yes. Dr. Westmore and I want to go down into the crypt. Bring a lantern, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, and tell Mrs. Murchison she can serve tea in half an hour. Uh, yes, sir. As I was saying, Doctor, even if Margaret signed over all right to Moreland to you... So why should I bargain for what will be mine once we marry? And if she refuses to marry you? Well, she won't. Margaret is a woman of honor. What do you know of honor, Dr. Westmore? Now, if you mean to insult me, Somerset... I mean to give you the truth. I've had you investigated, Doctor, quietly but thoroughly. I happen to know that you have twice been brought before the Royal College of Surgeons on charges of conduct unbecoming a physician, charges which could not be proved for lack of evidence. I was not guilty. That you are presently under investigation by the same College of Surgeons who this time do have the evidence to revoke your license and will, Dr. Westmore, because you are considered unworthy of the name Doctor and will be barred from medical practice. <laughs> you have been thorough, Somerset. Perhaps under the circumstances, you'd prefer I went down the crypt without your company. I'd better go with you, since one of the charges against you is that of body snatching. <laughs> Take the lantern, Hobbs. You wait here. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, and you told Mrs. Murchison about tea. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but I couldn't find her about. What do you mean? She must be somewhere in the house. No, sir. At least I was unable to find her, and you did want the lantern right away, sir. So no matter. I... This way, Westmore. Hmm. Those coffins stacked one on top of another. Their occupants have certainly been dead for years. Some of them for nearly a century. Curious. Is that Sir Simon's coffin there, the one with the lid off? Yes. And as you can see, the body isn't that of Sir Simon, but... Good Lord! What in the name of... Here, raise the lantern. Let's have some more light. You did say the head was Sir Simon's? It was. But this is... It's the head of a woman. Katie. Katie? Katie Johnson. The maid. What's this? Well, it's incredible. First, if I'm to believe you, Sir Simon's body was exchanged for another. And now his head? Is this some sort of a joke? I don't think so, Westmore. But if it is, it's the joke of someone gone mad. Stark mad. A baffling mystery, wouldn't you say? You might even call it the heady. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't resist that. Edward Somerset's Daily Journal, recording what took place later on, is even more baffling. And I'm afraid, more ghastly. Most of this strange story, the body of it, there I go again. All I meant to say was, there's more to come. The world is filled with all sorts of shadows.
shocking things. But I must confess that even I, somewhat of a connoisseur of the shocking, was totally stunned by Edward Somerset's account of what happened following the gruesome discovery that Sir Simon's head had now been replaced by Katie Johnson's. If I was appalled merely in reading about what had taken place, the feelings of those who actually lived through these ghastly events can be imagined. But where is my father's body, head and body? Whose body is it in the coffin? Who killed Katie Johnson, severed her head from her body, and put it in my father's coffin? What? Margaret, I beg you, enough. I can't answer even one of your questions, let alone a dozen. I didn't ask a dozen, Edward. You needn't snap my head off. No, 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 no. We're all somewhat nerved up. Talk, talk, talk. We sit here talking when we should be doing something. Perhaps you have a suggestion, my dear Margaret. At least one murder has been committed in this house. Possibly two. Katie Johnson and whoever's body that is in my father's coffin. Shouldn't we notify the police? The village constable is worse than useless. Dr. Westmore has offered to take a message to the London police when he leaves in the morning. You'll not be staying the weekend. I may soon cease to be a doctor, Margaret. Certainly if the College of Surgeons rescinds my license. But I still retain some remnants of the gentleman. You are certainly in no mood to discuss our wedding plans. Neither now nor at any other time. Ah, well, you have no choice there. Perhaps she does, or could have, if, as you say, you do retain some gentlemanly qualities. You refer to the suggestion you made earlier, just before we went down into the crypt. Yes. What suggestion? That Westmore release you from your pledge to marry him in return for Moorland Manor. Which, after all, is really what he wants. Not quite, my dear fellow, not altogether quite. What do you mean? If you don't love Margaret... Love has nothing to do with it. It's a matter of convenience, and what is best for me... I don't understand. Well, you would if you'd allow me to finish. Once my license to practice medicine is revoked, and it will be this time, I'm sure, I shall go into business. Contacts, important contacts, are vital to business success. And the making of contacts requires a good deal of entertaining. So you see, I shall need a wife to fill the role of hostess. Does that answer you? Yes. I guess it does. I beg your pardon, Miss Margaret. Oh, Hobbs, yes. You asked me to find out where Mrs. Murchison had got to, and I I have, Miss. Where did you find her? In the kitchen, sir, where she claimed she'd been all the time. Only she hasn't. Did you tell her I want to see her? Yes, Miss, he did. And I came straight along. Where have you been the past hour? In the kitchen, Miss. Preparing tonight's dinner. Mrs. Murchison, more than an hour ago, I asked Hobbs to let you know he wanted tea, and he couldn't find you. Well, I don't know why not, Mr. Somerset. I've been in the kitchen all that time. And as for tea, there was no need to give me an order. Tea is always served in this house at five. Then why didn't you serve it? Too busy getting dinner, Miss. I gave Katie instructions to serve it today. She never got to do it. God rest her soul. Hobbs said he couldn't find you. Not anywhere. Well, that is a lie. I have been in that kitchen the last two hours. Never left it once. He's lying, he is. Trying to get me into trouble. Oh, come now, Murchison. Why would Hobbs want to get you into trouble? Because I know too much about him. That's why. And he's afraid I might tell what I know. He wants to see me dismissed. The woman is mad. Stark mad. Am I? Am I? We have been paid no salary in this house for six months. Now, not that I'm complaining, Miss. I'm not. But ask him how he can afford to buy the finest of vintage wines to swill down his gullet. Ask him who pays for the costly cigars he smokes. And ask him where he gets the money for the expensive suits, shoes, whatever he wears when he goes to London on his days off. Ask him. Is it true, Hobbs? Well, yes, miss. I'll not deny that I enjoy good wine and a fine cigar. How do I pay for them? Why, miss, your father paid me well in the many years I served him. I was able to save considerable. And that, miss, is all there is to it. 
Though Mrs. Murchison would like you to think otherwise. Think what? Well, Mrs. Murchison? Nothing, miss. I've said too much already. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll have a roast cooking. One minute. Sir? The inside of your right arm. I just noticed when you turned. It's smeared with, with what looks like blood. Blood? Well, look at it. Oh. Oh, yes. Is it blood, Mrs. Murchison? Why, well, I... I... I guess it is. Yes, I, I, uh... Preparing the roast, cutting it, I, I must have got a smear of blood on me. Is that how you got it, Mrs. Murchison? What do you mean, Dr. Westmore? Nothing. Nothing, Mrs. Murchison. May I go, miss? Yes. And you too, Hobbs. Oh, yes, miss. Well, she could have got that blood on her from cutting the roast of beef. Or from cutting something else. My suspicions of Mrs. Murchison were sharply aroused. I had myself stated to Westmore that whoever was responsible for these ghoulish happenings must be mad. Stark mad. I was speculating on all this in the drawing room after dinner, paying little attention to something Margaret and Westmore were discussing, when, to the surprise of us all, Lord Burley was announced for the second time that day. His Lordship, Miss. Ah, good evening, Miss Pavilion. Mr. Somerset. Oh, and uh, you, Dr. Westmore. Good evening. Lord Burley, I thought our business had ended this afternoon. Ah, no, my dear. Business, sound business, that is, never takes no for an answer. Since I could not reason with you, I decided to ride over and, if possible, reason with your (laughs) husband-to-be. To to answer your look, Doctor, yes, I heard you were here. Is there anything you don't know, Lord Burley? (laughs) Very little, very little. As your betrothed may have mentioned to you, I'm interested in buying Moreland Manor. She didn't mention it, no. Ah, yes. Well, I am prepared to make you, all things considered, a quite decent offer, Doctor, once you come into possession through marriage, of course. Uh, Would you be interested? I would, indeed. Uh, Why do you want Moreland, my lord? Well, it adjoins my own estate. The 780 acres of Moreland would be a welcome addition. I should think so, yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What are you prepared to offer? One pound per acre, 780 pounds. That isn't an offer, Lord Burley. It's an insult. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. If you look at it in the right light, Doctor, all things considered, as I said, it's uh, really something of a compliment. As attorney for the estate, I can assure you it's worth a very great deal more than 780 pounds. Oh, can you, Mr. Somerset? Can you indeed? In your position, you must also be aware that the estate is impoverished. Yes, but... That taxes are now a year in arrear. Yes, still... I know, I know, you entertain the hope, the forlorn hope, Mr. Somerset, that through proper management, through improved land production, you might salvage the estate. I would hope that Dr. Westmore would, when he becomes owner. Well, hasn't he told you he means to sell more land within a month, perhaps less, You'd be willing to settle for shillings. What do you mean by that? I mean, quite simply, my dear, that there would be no one here to run the place for you. No servants, no farmers, no stable help, no one. Why not? Because of the strange things taking place here. I refer to the occurrences in the family vault. are already known in the village, and the people are frightened. Within a few days, they will shun Moorland Manor as if it contained bubonic plague. This is... Impossible. Well informed as you may be on what goes on in Burley, you couldn't be this informed. Unless... Yes? Nothing. No, no, I, I insist. Unless what, my dear? I said nothing. But your silence signifies everything. If you're implying that I have a more than ordinary knowledge of what is going on here, that I am in some way involved, then out with it. That is indeed what I do, Sir Lyon. Well, then let me assure you that you are wrong. I have my sources of information, yes. I, I have my informants, indeed a network of them. But I am not, I repeat, not a body snatcher. 
The body snatcher. Oh, good Lord, man. What do you think is behind all this? Body snatching. Oh, heaven help us. What naivete. Do you think someone is simply playing games, having some sort of ghoulish fun? You, Miss Tresillian, and you, Mr. Somerset, yes, I can understand it with you too. But Westmore, you? Do you mean to say you haven't suggested this possibility, this, this probability, to these two young people? Should I have? Ah, but you know better than anyone the need of bodies for dissection purposes, the, for the training of medical students. Medical schools will pay ten pounds for a fresh body, and fifteen, as you damn well know, sir, for a fresh head. Really? You're far more knowledgeable than I am, sir. Oh, you know nothing of it, eh? You, whose case is on trial this very moment before the College of Surgeons for just such practices, you know nothing? What is he on trial for? I thought it was body snatching alone. No, oh, that, of course, of course. But in the eyes of the authorities, something far more vile. Dr. Westmore is a grave robber. What? Yes, my dear. He not only snatches corpses, but robs them as well. Is this true? I own to nothing. You needn't. Your face says all. Blast you, Lord Burley. For what you've done to me these past minutes. I to you? Have you not done it to yourself, sir? Yes. Heaven above, help me, yes. But I had hopes. Stupidly had hopes that I might repair the damage I've done others and myself. I dared to hope that with the monies I would receive from the sale of Moreland, I might regain some reputation, some respect, some personal dignity. I ask your pardon. I, I had not known you. You had in you even a spark of decency. Only a spark. Nevertheless, a spark, which I might have fanned into flame. And you may still. What I have said has been said within the confines of this house. No, Lord Burley, it has been said within the confines of this woman's heart. And will echo there till the day she dies. Ah, oh, well, well, I... I am sorry. But now, as to my offer to buy more than Manor... Another time. We'll discuss it another time, if at all. Now, then I had best take my leave. That would be best. And Lord Burley... My dear? Don't come back. <laughs> of another side to Dr. Westmore's character, a good side, came as a surprise to both myself and Margaret. Unhappily, this better side of Dr. Westmore, as Margaret and I discovered in a long discussion with him following Burley's departure, by no means influenced him in releasing Margaret from her obligation to marry him. Then finally he had retired for the night. Margaret and I sat hopelessly talking of the future. Edward, Edward, I love you so. And the thought of marrying Dr. Westmore, I shudder at it. I do, my darling. There must be something. Something. What? What solution have you thought of? One that only God could arrange, I'm afraid. Westmore's death. Oh, Edward. Frankly, there have been times when I've been nearly driven to arrange it myself. You mustn't say such things, Edward. Not even think them. wonder we're having such wild thoughts. We're tired. I'll say goodnight to you, my dear. Ah! Edward! What in ah! heaven's name? Mrs. Murchison! Ah! But where is she? Where are those screams? Ah! Oh, the crypt! Ah! The crypt! Sound that way! Ah! Stay here! No, I'm coming with you. Ah! Here's the crypt. <laughs> Don't come in, Margaret. Ah! Nonsense, Edward. What is it, Mrs. Murchison? What are you doing here in the crypt? What's happened to make you lose the truth? There. He, he, he signed the cross. Go and look. See for yourself. Good Lord. It would work. No, don't look, Margaret. I must. I... <gasps> oh, my God. When 
I came to that part of Edward Somerset's journal, I could hardly wait to turn the page to find out what new horror had taken place in the crypt. And a horror it was. A shocking horror. As you'll discover... page of Edward Somerset's journal? Personally, I could scarcely wait to do so. But I am used to horrors. I can sort of take them in my stride. While you, on the other hand, you insist? Very well, then. We turn the page. Margaret, for all her delicate beauty, is a strong woman, a woman of courage. But as she looked into her father's coffin, and the words... Oh, my God! ...escaped her lips. I feared she was about to faint. But she somehow managed to retain control. When I was sure she wasn't about to collapse, I turned my attention to Mrs. Murchison and said, Pull yourself together, Mrs. Murchison! And answer me. What are you doing here in the crypt? And at this hour of the morning? Well, answer me. I wanted to clear myself. Clear yourself? To prove my innocence. Now, last night, when you saw the blood smear on my arm, the way you looked at me, all of you, the way you talked, I could see you suspected me of doing these, these foul things. What brought you here? What could you expect to prove here? I don't know. I only know I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned. All sorts of thoughts going through my head. All sorts of needs to prove to you that your suspicions of me were unfounded. I came down here in desperation, I suppose. Thinking I might find something, some clue, some bit of evidence that could give the lie to Hobbes. Instead, I found that. What do you mean, give the lie to Hobbes? I was in the kitchen all the time he claims he was looking for me. The time when poor Katie was murdered. Oh, and so that blood on my arm was from cutting the roast beef from nothing else. So you say. You don't believe me still. Why should I? We find you here in the crypt under very curious circumstances... And you expect us to believe your not very convincing story? It's the truth. I swear to you, sir, and you, miss, it's true. That's to be seen. The question now is, what's to be done? Edward, the police must be notified as soon as possible. Yes. Dr. Westmore was going to take a message to London tomorrow morning. Well, someone else will have to do it now. Edward. Yes? Are we... Dealing with a madman. I'd say what's in that coffin answers your question, Margaret. If we had found Dr. Westmore's head, just the head, I might still have some doubts, but not anymore. Not after finding Westmore's head with the lips cut off. What happened to Dr. Westmoreland? Yes. Will you, uh... Will you be long in London, sir? Only overnight. I'll return in the morning. With, I hope, some member of the police force who can get to the bottom of what's going on at Moreland. Strange, strange. First Sir Simon's body taken, but his head left in the coffin. Then his head gone and Katie's... Oh, the poor girl. Her head put in its place. And now Dr. Westmore's head in place of Katie's and the lips cut off. It's horrible. Horrible. Very. Have you any idea, sir, as to what's behind this? I have my suspicions, Hobbs. But that's all they are. Suspicions. Uh, well, now, you'll be sure to return on the morning coach, and so I'll be there to meet you. Um, yes. Depend on me. And there now, you see... 
The village just below us in the valley. <laughs> I told you we'd be in plenty of time. <laughs> Hardly touched your dinner, Miss. I'm not hungry, Mrs. Murchison. Oh, no wonder. All that's happened here. And some of the village farmhands telling you today that they'd not be coming back to Moreland to work the fields. I'll see who it is, Miss. Lord Gurley. Is your mistress at home, Mrs. Murchison? I'll see, my lord. No need. I'm sure she is. I thought I had informed you, Lord Burley, that your presence here is no longer desired. You may change your mind about that. If you've come to see me about... I've come to see the crypt, if I may have your permission. Whatever for? I learned today that a good number of your farmhands have left you because of the doings here. Well, for my benefit, once I own Moorland, I think it best to clear up the mystery of the crypt as quickly as may be. You think you can? <laughs> I know I can. Because, you see, I know, on good authority, the reason behind what's been going on. Is it body snatching? Yes. So, in any case, I am informed. But I wish to see for myself before taking action. I have your permission. Very well. well come along, then. <laughs> First, I want to look in the coffin. Ah, poor Westmore. Lips mutilated as I was informed. Whatever it is you wish to see or do, will you do it quickly? To be absolutely sure, I'll open the top coffin on this stack. No. You can't do that. It's sacrilege. That's the coffin of my mother. I'm afraid it was the coffin of your mother, my dear. In truth, I'm afraid many of these coffins no longer contain their original occupants. They are now used as storage boxes for much fresher corpses. Now, with your permission, then. Yeah, so, see for yourself, Margaret. Please, I'd rather not. Oh, come, come, you must. This once. I, I want you to know I speak the truth. Look. But why? If bodies are in such demand, why store them away? Why not sell them at once? Oh, my dear, you are as devoid of business sense as your father. In business, there is an inexorable law known as the law of supply and demand. When supply exceeds demand, prices fall and vice versa. There is more demand for corpses at some times than at others. More demand for heads at certain times. At the moment, medical schools are in need of heads. Why, I haven't the vaguest idea. My informant didn't know. I do! What? Hobbs! Hobbs, what are you doing here? No need to answer that, Hobbs. That butcher knife in your hand is answer enough. Answer enough for you! Oh. Damn your oh. rotten shoulder! Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Made oh. rot in hell! Eyes and ears! Eyes and ears everywhere. Nothing hidden from him. Oh, no, knew everything. Knew all about what was going on down here. I even knew I'll be bound that, that I am the body snatcher. You? 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 You didn't know. You didn't even suspect. <laughs> Mr. Somerset did. Lord Burley did. Dr. Westmore, oh, yes, he, he more than suspected. He knew, because he was the one who bought what I had to sell. Westmore! He started me, but I, I ended him. I had to. Why? Why did you have to? He was soon to go on trial before the College of Surgeons. They have enough evidence to convict him, to break him down. And he will have told everything, including where. He got the bodies, the heads, from me, yeah, yeah, me. That's why I had to cut off his lips, so he'd never tell, never. You're mad. Yes, that may be. The bodies, the heads, how did you, how did you 
transport them. The nearest medical schools are in London. I have a carriage. Well, more a wagon in the village. And the night before, I would go to London. On my days off, I would take what I had to sell into the village and stack them away in the wagon. You thought I went to London by coach? Yeah. I never did. I always went in my wagon, yeah? <laughs> taking my produce to market to Dr. Westmore. And I never suspected. I never knew. Well, you do now. No. No, don't. Don't kill me, Hobbs. Please, I don't must, kill me. I must. And cut off your lips so you can never... No, please! I'll be quick. It won't no, hurt. No, oh, no. yes. I've become very... No. Oh, Mr. Summers. You... You came back. I never went. But Hobbs will never know that now. Oh, Edward. Oh, darling, darling. He was the body snatcher. And he... I know, dearest. I heard everything he said. But I knew the whole story before I came back from the village. You didn't go to London. I never intended to. The more I thought about it, the more it seemed that if Lord Burley could buy information, and he couldn't have got it any other way, then maybe if I spread the word in the village that I was willing to pay and pay handsomely, well... In any case, I did. And it worked. You learned about Hobbs. Everything. Thank God you arrived in time. I thank him not only for that, but for the future that lies ahead for us. There are two important tasks I shall devote the rest of my life to. One is restoring Moreland Manor to what it once was. And the other? Making you the happiest woman on earth. So ended happily the strange and horrifying events at Moorland Manor. Edward Somerset continued his journal for many years, and I'm glad to be able to tell you that he did restore Moorland Manor to its former splendor. And he must have made Margaret at least one of the happiest women on earth, if nine children mean anything. <laughs> story took place in 1874. There are many who say the world was a better place to live in then. Maybe it was. I don't know. All of us do face many problems, many frustrations, many fears these days. But one fear we don't have now that just about everyone had then is the fear of being buried alive. At least, I don't think we have. Our cast included Suzanne Grossman, Gordon Gould, Anne Petoniak, Ian Martin, Kurt Benson, and George Lothar. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Seating Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. At the WOR time signal, exactly 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time, here's John Wingate with the news. Welcome to the fear you can hear. 
Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. Our suspense-filled tale is about two ladies. One heedless, one, alas, headless. To meet them both, we shall have to span an ocean and several centuries. The story of both ladies comes from Rudley Castle in the Cotswold Hills of England. But the tale of the first lady belongs in this century, while the legend of the second comes riding to us out of the medieval past. Charles. Charles! What? What? Charles, wake up. Can't you hear them? There they are again. What is it, Beth? The hoofbeats. This time they're coming straight for the house. Where are you going, Beth? I've got to see. It's the dead of night. You can't see anything. It's bright moonlight. Oh, God. She's right in the courtyard below. <laughs> She's stopping. Oh, you of your mind. She's throwing back the hood of her cage. Well, you come back to bed. Oh, oh, she has no hair. There's nothing out there. Oh, no. Her head in her hand. She, she's holding it up by the hair. Charles, come quick, quick. All right, I'm coming. The, the face, it, it looks a thousand years old. Oh, it's my face, Charles. Help me. It's me. <laughs> mystery drama, A Lady Never Loses Her Head, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Kim Hunter. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Oh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free diet 7-Up, and it's all good. Oh, actually, I saved a little. Oh! Hiya, Goldie. What's brewing? That's Miss Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me? The cottage, the three chairs, the <gasps> porridge? Baby bear. In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But baby bear. Just call me BB. You drank all the sugar-free diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Well, yeah, I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester, huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I tried those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why not ask me? Well, okay, BB. Tell me. Why did you drink all the sugar-free Diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free Diet 7-Up is definitely unbearably delicious. Mm -hmm. The title of our tale is A Lady Never Loses Her Head. This has been an accepted dictum since the beginning of recorded history. But in the literal sense, in feudal times, a lady unfortunately could and frequently did lose her head. Thank heavens, of course, that is no longer possible. Or is it? Let's travel to London and start our narrative in the gloomy, gray atmosphere of Scotland Yard. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Carlos, what is it? Young lady outside to see you. Most attractive. Blue-eyed, blonde hair, about 24. American, about yes, five... Yes, but I, I can do without the vital statistics. Does she have a name? Yes, sir. Beth Stanton. Miss Beth Stanton. Stanton? My old friend, Biff's daughter. Well, don't just stand there, man. Bring her in. Right this way, Miss Stanton. Oh, uh, thank you, Sergeant. My dear girl, you are Biff Stanton's daughter, of course. Uh, of course. Oh, how nice to meet you. Come in, come in. Dear me, this is a pleasure. Oh, do sit down. Oh, thank you, Inspector Finchley. Tell me, what are you doing in England? Well, first, before anything, following Dad's orders and coming to see you. Also, uh, I brought you something from him. Really? I, I should have brought it earlier or, or sent it, but... Well, after he died, I was a mess. For so long, it had just been the two of us. It took me a year to pace myself back together again. I wish I could have helped. At the very least, I should have come over for the funeral. Oh, there, there was none. Dad wouldn't have wanted that. Mm, I can imagine. Anyway, he wanted you to have this. Oh, no, no, I can't. No, you have to. Biff Stanton's wings. 
Any idea of what they mean to an old fogey who went through the Battle of Britain shoulder to shoulder with him? I can tell you something, my dear. These mean more to me than the crown jewels. <laughs> you know, you're everything Dad said you'd be. <laughs> Hello for real, Uncle Alfie. <laughs> After that, what can I do to make England yours? <laughs> Not a thing. It's already mine. Oh, how so? Well, it, it, it's mad, wild, out of sight. Here I was on the boat coming over, still fighting all the trauma of Dad's death, and suddenly I met this marvelous Englishman. Well... Only a little less marvelous than you turned out to be, of course. <laughs> and just like that, I did a crazy thing. What was that? I married him. I'm not really Beth Stanton anymore. I'm Mrs. Charles Rudley. Well, dear me, dear me. Congratulations. <laughs> I deserve them. I'm so lucky. Well, I'd like to meet your husband. What's he like? Too much. He's tall, black-haired, blue eyes, and and just so... so Englishy English. <laughs> well, now, will you live here or in America? Oh, it has to be here because of Charles. Ah, what's his line of work? <laughs> he doesn't have to work, actually, although he is a very fine artist. Well, I envy this chap in more ways than one. Why doesn't he have to work? Oh, well, because most of his time is spent in, in managing his estate. Ah. <gasps> Which reminds me, I've got to run. I I'm off to the ancestral home in the Cotswolds to take up my position as Lady of the Manor. Ah, Dorset, eh? Lovely country. Whereabouts? Uh, uh, Chauncey Castle. I expect you know it. Well, I'm afraid I'm a bit shaky on Burke's peerage. <laughs> oh, uh, Charles isn't an earl or a duke, really. He he's, it's just his family line. I don't even know what his title is exactly. Hmm. Well, would you like me to find out? No, in this day and age, what does it matter? Now, Uncle Alfie, I must go. Charles went on ahead of me with his sister. Nora insisted she had to have a day to get things ready. And uh. I told Charles I needed a full day to shop for a sort of late trousseau. So he, he drove her up with most of my bags. All right, my dear. I shan't keep you. Uh, give me a few weeks to get settled. And I promise you'll be our first house guest. You only have to ask me. Bye-bye. Yes, sir. A very tasty young lady. Hmm. And a hasty one. How's that, sir? Marion Haste repented. Hmm. Uh, beg pardon, Inspector? Oh, nothing, nothing. Too many years of policeman, I suppose. One tends to fall into the habit of looking for trouble. Still, she is the daughter of the best friend I ever had, and she must be a very rich young woman. I say, Crothers, rustle me a copy of Burke's Peerage, will you? Something I'd like to have a look at. So, my lady, how do you like your castle? Oh, Charles, it's, it's something else. It's what? I mean it. I, I mean it's too much. It's it's magnificent. It's breathtaking, thrilling. There, there, there just aren't enough words. But it's sort of creepy too. Creepy? Well, you know, everything's so old and so big. <laughs> yes, and so very drafty. Well, I'm glad we won't be living here. But well, we can if you want, my darling. Oh no, please no. I feel like an exhibit. It's so comfortable at the gatehouse. Yes. Except for poor Nora. She is sort of underfoot. Oh, come on. It's not that small. And I'm not going to put Nora out of her own home. You're sure you don't mind, dear? Are all these paintings legitimate ancestors? Yes. Charles? What is it, Beth? Who... Who was that? Ah, yes. I thought that one might pique your curiosity. That was the Lady Elizabeth Chauncey. Beyond question, the most attractive of all the family... Until now. But she looks just like me. A very pallid copy, my darling. Besides, she was very dark. Not like my fair and golden-haired American beauty. <laughs> well, still, can you imagine all those years ago, someone in your family who... Oh, when did she die? Oh, somewhere in the middle 1500s. She died very young, as the story goes. How? Oh... Accidentally. Darling, I think we ought to get back to the gatehouse. It's almost time for tea. Do you have milk in your tea, Beth? Uh, no, thanks. Oh. Well, 
How did you like the castle? Oh, it's great. I, I mean, it's terribly impressive and fascinating and... and inexpressibly gloomy, damp, and musty. Well, I didn't say that. Oh, but it was what you were thinking. Oh, no, you're marvelous. Yes, I thought all of those things. I just hope Charles doesn't want to live there. Oh, heavens dear, not a chance. You see all the rebuilding, refurbishing that's going on there? Yes, I did. That's why I thought maybe... Oh, not intended for private life, Beth. Strictly for the public. Beg pardon? Well, the only way of supporting these charming and historic white elephants is to open them to the public for a small fee, which uh, mounts up. Oh, what a shame. Your own home. Poor Charles. Oh, he doesn't mind any more than I do. The place is much too big and full of cobwebs and ghosts. It gives me the shivers. Ghosts? You mean real ones that actually haunt? Well, if you want to believe in such things, oh, the usual clanking of armor and dragging of chains. Except, of course, for the Lady Elizabeth. The, the one whose portrait I saw today? Oh, well, I'm not sure if I know you did. Oh, we've had a great many Elizabeths. Well, the, the very young one. The one who looked like me. Oh, that would be she. Yes, you, you do favor her. You know, Charles was so, so funny about her. I mean, he didn't seem to want to talk about how she died. Oh, Johnny Wright, I should think. Gruesome, silly story. Well, she was married to one of the first Earls of Chauncey. A man quite literally, believe it or not, old enough to be her grandparent. And so, quite naturally, she fell in love with one of the young bloods who traipsed around in the retinue. Oh, what was his name? Oh, heavens dear, I haven't the foggiest. No one remembers him. At all events, sex being just as urgent in those days, if not quite so publicized, the two of them were caught cavorting in uh, flagranti delicto, I think is the polite Latin phrase. And the elderly Earl was quite put out about it. So much so that he... He had the poor little thing beheaded. Oh. oh. Violent times, you know, violent measures. Even that wasn't quite enough for him. What do you mean? What else could he do to her? Well, it gets a bit bloody, dear. Maybe we'd better just... No, I want, I want to know. Uh, well, I'm afraid he had the head impaled on a pike and left to wither on the battlements. The body, of course, was interred. Oh, my God. Oh, nasty types they were in those days. How old was she? Oh, see, I think I remember. Oh, yes, 24. Just my age. <laughs> so young to die and be buried forever. Oh. Well, the legend is, of course, that she hasn't been. Our parlor legend. You mean she... She haunts? Oh, rather. She was quite a horsewoman, history tells us. And any night, but particularly when the moon is full, she rides the grounds, searching for her lost head. She's quite famous locally. <sighs> I must admit, when the winds from the west, I, I sometimes swear myself I can hear the hoofbeats. What is it, Dolly? Do you hear them? Why? Somebody riding a horse. It's 2 30 in the morning. But, but can't you hear them? Do you, you don't suppose Elizabeth. Oh, that stupid legend. I'm very quite furious at Nora. Oh, no, 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 don't be, please. I expect I'm the stupid one. It, it's all so new to me. I'll settle down. Let me assist in that process. Oh, darling. Darling. I don't hear the hoofbeats anymore. You never did. Just the excited beating of your husband's heart. Oh, I love you. And I love you. You're so lovely. I can't wait to paint you. I'll sit for you. Do you know what I'd like to do tomorrow? What? Make a life mask of you. Oh, how do you do that? You'll see. Tomorrow. You'll see. <laughs> Charles really has something more sinister than history lurking in the dark corners of Chauncey Castle. 
And what, if one examines it, is a life mask. A mold of the features, once done in plaster of Paris, today in modern plastic, a technique often employed to perpetuate someone departed from this life and originally named the death mask. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick, just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. Actually, Bud drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years, but they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser, and that says it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors, and your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade-A frying chickens just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens up to 4 pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice beef rib steaks $1.19 a pound. ShopRite franks 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket. does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, my, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Have you ever had a mask made of your face? It's a quite terrifying experience. The material is laid on like shaving soap or a mud bath, and you lie there while it hardens and sets. In the last moments, there is an excess of heat and a feeling as if you will be buried forever in concrete or stone. You can breathe, but the shut-in feeling, the claustrophobia, suggests you can't, that maybe whoever it is making the mask wants to kill you, smother you, like Beth, wordless, speechless. Helpless at this moment. Hand me the straws, Nora. Here you are. What a really dreadful thing to do to the child. Now, don't try to talk, dearest. The plastic is just beginning to set. It won't be much longer. I'm going to have to cover your mouth now, so I'll put these straws in your nose, and you'll be able to breathe. (laughs) Now, the thing is not to get panicky. The whole thing is perfectly barbarous. Shut up, Nora. There's not a thing in the world to worry about, Beth. It just sort of draws, and there's a feeling that it's clamping down. But it's soon over. Trust me, darling. Please don't worry about a thing. I... Oh. I thought I was going to die. I got the most beautiful mold of your face... You'll see it was worth it. Oh, honestly, darling, I was scared. <laughs> I'm like Elizabeth. I'm much too young to die. Will you forget her? Yeah, I'd like to, but she haunts me. I never, ever thought about death before, and now suddenly... Darling, have you made a will? <laughs> Good Lord, Beth. You are morbid. No, since you ask. Well, you should. We... Well, everyone should. Well, I expect you're quite right. I'm... I'm rather careless about money matters. I'll take care of it first thing in the morning. May I come with you? Why, if, if you want. But... I, I... I want to make one too, Charles. It's uh, really quite important. Well, my dear, if you insist. You see, I never told you, Charles, that I'm really worth an awful lot of money. Of 
Crothers. Yes, Inspector. Remember that chap in Margate we had to look into because he kept getting rid of well-to-do wives at quite a clip? Uh, that'd be Humbert, sir. Yes. Tall, dark chap with a thick beard. Made a joke about Bluebeard. Oh, did I? Have we a photo of him handy? Oh, I think I could dig one up. Hmm. Why don't you? And uh, by the by, next weekend's Halloween. I think I might leave crime to the small fry and take a busman's holiday. Oh, you deserve it, sir. Where away. Yeah. Well, I might take a run up to the Cotswolds. Sort of a sentimental journey, you might say. Morning, Beth. Special today, kippers. Oh, no, thank you. Not for me. Oh, out of sorts, dear. Uh, I haven't... I didn't sleep so well. Just, uh, just a little orange juice and coffee. Oh, absolutely. Well, anything wrong? Oh, no, not really. You know, I guess maybe I ought to look out for those toddies of yours. Oh, why, Beth, nothing but a little scotch, sugar, and lemon. Mm. I didn't mean I was suspected the ingredients. I, it's just that maybe I can't handle quite so much whiskey. Oh, there was only a nip in there. Child, you, you do look a little wan. Should we have Dr. Yule in to have a glance at you, do you think? Oh, I can't need a doctor. I'm always so healthy. Oh, change of clime and all that, dear, and damp old England. Flu is always floating around. Why don't we just play safe? What do you think, Doctor? Oh, well, nothing serious, of course, but a, a high-strung young lady, you know. Well, sensitive, naturally, but high-strung. Well, you know Americans, very suggestible... What is this notion she has about somebody on horseback without a head? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Uh, some legend about a girl who looked like her centuries ago. I haven't the foggiest idea. Mm, yeah. Well, for the moment, there's no real concern. I've left a sedative to be filled at the pharmacist with your sister. Convenient thing, she happens to be an RN. <laughs> You're sure you're up to this, Beth? Oh, Charles, I simply had to get out of doors and away from the cottage. Let's just enjoy a walk, walk into the castle and pretend it's all the beginning. Well, now, just stay well in the center of the drawbridge. Needs a lot of repairs. You know, it's just incredible to think that knights in armor rode across this bridge. How far do you suppose it's down to the bottom of the old moat? Oh, 50, 60 feet, perhaps. A mess, isn't it? All those weeds and jagged rocks. Can we go in and poke about? Your wish is my command. Beth? Right here. Where on earth have you got to? Like a magnet. Right back to her. The Lady Elizabeth. She fascinates me so. Well, there really isn't all that much resemblance. Oh, I don't agree. She could be my twin. It's funny. What's funny? Well, it's so hard to put into words, Charles. It's it's just a feeling. I mean, her portrait is just as old, and the paint is just as cracked as all the others, but somehow she feels so immediate. So today. Almost, almost as if she just sat for the portrait. And the artist had just finished it. <laughs> that is rather strange. You can see that the pigments are medieval. The patina is centuries old, just like the model. I know. I should stop identifying myself with her just because of a chance resemblance. Oh, Charles, I'm cold. Let's get back to the gatehouse and that nice living room fire. Oh, you do look a bit knocked about, Beth. Perhaps you ought to turn in a little early. I guess so. On top of everything else, I do think our damp weather does take a bit of getting used to. I have the kettle on the boil to whip you up a nice stout toddy. Oh, I don't want anything to drink. Oh, just a bit, love. To disguise the taste of old Dr. Yule's sedative. Why he has to stick to powders instead of up-to-date pills is beyond me. Well, while you're brewing that toddy, I have some letters to finish. Letters? Oh, I've been very remiss. I have all sorts of friends and half-relations in America who, who don't even know I'm married. I've got to write them. Oh, of course. Oh, you go and get them finished. 
and I'll brew you up something nice to put you to sleep. Hey, you are, darling. Nora's best. Plus Dr. Yule's guaranteed potion for the restful night. Mm, thanks, Charles. Oh, I'm sorry to be such a bother. Hush. Get all your letters finished? Yes. I must mail them first thing tomorrow. Let me have them, darling. I have to run into the village to pick up the post. I'll send them off then. Okay. And by the by, I hate to bother you with this, but as long as you have pen in hand, want to look this over and sign it? What is it? That last will and testament that you insisted on making. Technically, I suppose I should have John and Nellie witness your signing, but I'm sure they'll take the will for the deed, if you'll excuse a complicated pun. Sign it later. Oh, yes, let's get it out of the way. I have enough morbid thoughts as it is. What morbid thoughts? There. I hope to God it never has to be executed. Amen. Now drink your toddy and it will relax you. All you need is a good night's sleep. Mm, I'd give anything for that. If I could just stop dreaming about her or hearing those hoofbeats. Charles. What, dear? You don't think I'm going crazy, losing my mind? Oh, now, come on. Drink up. And I'll hold you tight till you go to sleep. Mm, that's strong. But it does feel good. Charles, you're so good to me. How can I ever repay you? You will, darling. You will. Charles. Charles. What? what? Charles, wake up. Can't you hear them? There they are again. What is it, Beth? Hope beats. This time they're coming straight for the house. Where are you going, Beth? I've got to see. It's the dead of night. You can't see anything. It's bright moonlight out. Oh, God. She's right in the courtyard below. Stop it, Beth. She's throwing <laughs> back the hood of the cage. Can you come back to bed? She has no head. There's nothing out there. Oh, no. Her head. Get her hand. She's holding it up by the hair. Charles, come quick. Quick! All right, all right. He, he looks a thousand years old. Oh, but it's my face, Charles. Help me! It's me! Ah! More and more, the question narrows itself down to a very simple one. Which lady has lost her head completely? Elizabeth from the past, who will not stay at rest? Or Beth from the present, who seems bound to raise her from the grave? I'll be back with at least some of the answers when I return shortly with Act Three. And now another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents Veronica and Jack. Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? Out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Uh, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a car. You have a ball and chain, like the ones they use in those special K commercials. Yes, Veronica, it symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight. But I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. You mean a one? One-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice, and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories, and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help, too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain, too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. This year, Italy gives you the one thing every vacationer wants for his money. More. In fact, your dollar buys more in Italy than in 85% of the tourist countries of Europe. Take restaurants. There's one in Rome called Ambasciata d'Abruzzo. Without asking you, the waiter brings a whole ham, two dozen kinds of sausage, a huge antipasto, and three courses of pasta. When you've consumed all this, the waiter finally asks, what would you like to eat? 
You order the meat platter and get six kinds of roasts. After a salad, cheese, fruit, and cake, the waiter now asks, how much would you like to pay? You agree to $5 a person. And how do you get to this feast? On Alitalia. No other airline flies only 747s nonstop from New York to Italy. Call an expert, your travel agent, or Alitalia, and come to Alitalia's Italy, where you get more than you dreamed of for less than you thought. Based on exchange rates as of April 1st, 1974. North Jersey is certainly getting a higher yield this spring, especially with Suburban Savings' special high-yield savings certificate that you can raise for fun and profit. All you have to do is plant a modest $2,500 minimum in Suburban's limited-issue 7.50% savings certificate. Then put your certificate in a nice, safe place. Suburban takes care of the rest by compounding interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. You'll get a nice, healthy 7.90% effective annual yield on your 7.50 savings certificate when you let it grow from 4 to 10 years. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is, of course, subject to a substantial penalty. So for a nice, healthy 7.90% annual effective yield, grow Suburban 7.50% savings certificate for fun and profit at any Suburban saving office in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Back once again to the problem of our twin damsels in distress. The medieval one has vanished into thin air by now, if indeed she ever materialized from there, while our modern Beth has confounded us and her husband by doing something quite medieval, or at least old-fashioned. Beth? Mm -hmm. Beth? Uh, uh... Beth, it's Charles. Wake up. What? Charles? Oh... What happened to me? What? What happened to her? Charles! Now, darling, she... darling, listen to me. There was nobody there. Oh, but I saw her. I saw her sitting, sitting side saddle on the horse. And, and when she dropped the hood... Beth, it was a dream. She had no head. No head at all. Except in her hand. You've got to stop it, Beth. She was holding it by the hair. And the face was all wrinkled like a like a mummy. Beth, I... And it was my face. Just like me. And, and do you know what she was doing? Do you know what she was doing? Beth, you've got to stop this. I can't... She was beckoning to me, Charles, calling me down. She wanted me. She wanted my hair. Stop it, Beth. Stop it, Beth. Beth. Do you know the awful thing? I could feel myself being tucked, pulled toward her. If I hadn't fainted, I... Oh, God. God, Charles, what's the matter with me? What's wrong? What's that? Beth, get hold of yourself. It must be Nora. Yes? Charles, has something happened? Come in, Nora. The door's open. Bless us. What's the matter with the child? She just had a bad dream. It wasn't a dream. The headless Elizabeth again? Yes, she thought she heard her ride into the court below the window. I did. I did. I did see her. Oh, let me take the child, Charles. No, 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 no. Get a sedative powder. We've got to calm her down. I don't want any medicine. Just let us take care of you, Beth. We know what we're doing. I think we've got her under control now. I'm so sorry to rout you out so early in the morning, particularly on All Hallows' Day. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Rudley, quite all right. You'd never have gotten her calm down without a shot from me. Oh, silly children and their Halloween pranks. I can't imagine how they got this far out of the village. Did, uh, did you see this apparition that scared Mrs. Rudley so? <laughs> oh, good Lord, no. By the time I got to the window, the yard was bare. How the young'uns could have disappeared so far? Oh, I don't think this was any childish prank. What? No, oh, something much more serious, I'm afraid. You don't mean sleepwalking? Oh, dear me, that too. I see. Now, you say she lost her father recently. Yes, a year ago. And they were very close. Yes, extraordinarily so, I would say. 
What is it, Doctor? You don't think... I'll tell you what I do think, Mr. Rudley, and I'm going to be very honest. This case, your wife's problem, is far beyond the country doctor like myself. I think she needs psychiatric help. Oh, no. For her own sake. If it weren't for the fact that your sister is a registered nurse, my recommendation would be to have her immediately hospitalized. Psychiatric diagnosis is still my recommendation. I believe it's vital to keep her from harming herself. Harming herself? How? Oh, I don't know that. But I do know that for whatever reason, she is, well, in layman's terms, a nervous wreck. Hypertense, in spite of all the sedation I've been giving her. Subject to delusions and the victim of a... of a death wish. You must get help very quickly. Help from a specialist. And she should not be left alone for a moment. Well, that's quite a blow. I'm sorry, but... Even suicide is not out of the question. Good Lord. I... I wonder... Can I talk to her now? Well, she may be a bit drowsy, but if she's not asleep, yes. Now, I'd like to suggest some doc oh, doctor... Doctor, I want you to. I, I have to go into the village to pick up the post... Would you mind dropping me? We can talk on the way. I am splendid. I'll only be a minute. I want to go back to Beth. Meet you at your car. Oh, it's you, Charles. Is she asleep? No. No, I'm awake. Charles. Yes, darling. Don't leave me. Stay with me. Don't leave me. Of course I won't leave you. You can't get rid of me. I've been very silly, haven't I? I can't quite remember. There's nothing to remember. What you need is a nice, long sleep. And while you're having it, I'm going to the village for a few minutes, get the post, and a few things we need for dinner. And the post? Uh, mail? Oh, 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 yes, don't forget to mail my letters. I should say not. Have them right here in my pocket. You won't be... You won't be long. No, not over an hour. And Nora will be right here with you. Every moment I'm gone. Beth, dear, don't you worry. Charles and I know just how to take care of you. Yes? Oh, how do you do? Are Mr. and Mrs. Rudley at home? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Mr. Rudley's off to the village, and I'm afraid Mrs. Rudley is, is indisposed. Oh, I'm sorry. Not serious, I hope. Oh, no, just a little bout with the flu. May I say who was calling? Oh, yes, of course. Alfred Finchley. Oh, well, are you a friend of Mrs. Rudley's? Uh, no, no, not really. Old army chum of her father's. Oh. Just happened to be driving by, and I'd heard she'd been married, and I wanted to, well, you know, pay my respects. Oh, well, I know Beth will be so sorry not to have seen you. I'm her sister-in-law, by oh, the way. How do you do? <laughs> Now, perhaps later this afternoon, if there was some place she could call you. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm driving back to London. Eh, hey, well, that's a lot, Mr. Rudley. You owe me tuppence on the one overweight letter. There you are, Mr. Morgan. Anything to go out, sir? No, no letters this time. I thought I saw some in your pocket. Uh, no, these are not going to be posted. I'll take care of those myself. As you will, sir. It's uh, just opening time. Want to step in the pub and have a nice warm and beer? Not this time, Mr. Morgan. Got quite a long walk home. That'll be on my way if I hope to make it by lunch. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Hey, that's it. Elevenses. All open for business. <laughs> Not one ruddy customer. Oh. Afternoon, Governor. Just ten minutes before two, so if you want one, better step lively into the bar before closing time. I, um, thank you, Barkey. I think I will. Name is Margate, sir. Donald Margate, proprietor. And what'll it be? Well, uh, I think I shall have a gin and, if you don't mind. Yep. <laughs> Coming right up. Just passing through. Yes. Lovely country. Oh, we like it. Yeah, quite a bit of work going on at... Chauncey Castle. <laughs> There's the gin answer. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes, yes. Going to be good for business. 
Oh, so? Going to open it to the public, the family is. Hmm. Make a tourist attraction. Ah, well, I thought it was because the present incumbent has got married. Present incumbent? Oh, you mean the doddery old duke? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I meant young Mr. Rudley. Oh, him? Why, Lord bless your soul, he's not family, sir. Oh, really? No, no, he's just renting. Lease is almost up, I think. Rudley, hmm? I think I once knew a... Uh... What's he look like? <laughs> you should have been here when I opened. You could have seen for yourself. Tall, dark chap he is. Yes. He wouldn't by any chance be this chap in his picture, huh? Eh, well, no. That'd be hard to tell. I mean, Mr. Rudley's clean-shaven and a lot thinner than this chap. Still, take away the beard, cut off some of the hair... Eh, hey, no, I, I just wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, do you have a doctor in town? Oh, yes, sir, that'd be Dr. Yudel. You'd find him right across the green, sir. Good timing, too, because uh, I have to close. The timing couldn't be worse, Nora. She never mentioned she knew anyone in England. Oh, I don't think we have to worry. He was just a little wisp of a man, very inoffensive. You doctor her food at lunch. Get another of your special toddies into her before she goes to bed. We'll do it tonight. Well, it seems a bit soon. A lot faster than usual. But if you insist, darling, naturally we'll go ahead. Kiss me. Yes, sister dear. <laughs> well, at least she is the last one. She has enough money to leave you. So I can stop sharing you with the, the pigeons. <laughs> Inspector Finchley, Scotland Yard, Doctor. My credentials. Oh, dear me, a, a, a policeman, but why on earth? Uh, could you answer my question? Well, well of course. Uh, yes, I've called on her several times in the last ten days or so. Uh, what's the matter with her, Doctor? Well, that's rather difficult to say. She has um, uh, delusions. Caused by what? Oh, now, Inspector, that would take a psychiatrist to explain. Uh, she it. couldn't be under the influence of drugs, could she? Do why, I... Uh, does this man look at all familiar to you, Dr. Yule? No, I, I, I can't say. I, uh, no, just a minute, let me get my magnifying glass. Now, where did I... Oh, oh yes, here it is. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, by George. Uh, partly the facial structure, of course, but, but this is what did it. You, you see that old scar there bisecting the left eyebrow, more or less? Yes. Mm, something a doctor would notice because it wasn't a very good job of suturing. Yes, I think I could swear. Uh, shave off the mustache, the beard, and the sideburns. And by George, you'd have Charles Rudley. Or George Humbert. <laughs> God for the help of Elizabeth's phantom steed. I thought we'd never get her downstairs. You wouldn't think she'd be so heavy. Dead weight, brother dear. Not quite yet. Poor Beth. A pity. Oh, no time for sentiment. She's worth a lot more to us. Dead. Now help me get her off the horse and then get him back to the stable and call the doctor. After you throw her over into the moat, you'd better make very sure she's dead. I'll make sure. All right. I'll get her off the horse. Stand still, Rudley. Just hold it right there. What? I've got you covered. This is the police. Don't move. Oh, you fool. Well, they're not going to get me. It's too late. Get out of my way. <laughs> Watch it. Don't shoot off the horse. We don't want to harm the girl. <laughs> just can't believe it, Uncle Alfie. Well, I can't blame you, my dear. Nasty chap you got mixed up with. Three others before you he got away with. The same way? Mm, with variations. He got a little too fancy on this one. The false portrait, but the apparent nervous ailments and the sleepwalking were the key to all of them. I, I feel as though I'm going to be sick. Well, it'll pass, dear. He was a bad lot. Worth not one single tear. And Nora. She she was the one on horseback. Uh, with the costume rigged to appear as if the wearer was headless. 
And a papier-mâché head made from your life mask. I think... I think she's almost worse than him. And to think she got away scot-free. Uh, not quite, my dear. We'll catch up with her. Now, you rest a while and don't worry. I'm right outside. As long as I'm around, you'll never have to worry again. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Uncle Alfie. All right, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes, she'll be fine. You, uh, you say you did catch up with the woman? Nora. Yeah. A lot more than just police caught up with her. You know the work they're doing on the castle? How's it called? Well, apparently they found some structural weakness in the arch of the main gate. So they supported it by stretching a thin steel cable from one side to the other. Well over normal head height, of course, if you're walking. But unfortunately, not high enough to clear someone on horseback. Good Lord, no. Oh, yes. Cut her head off as clean as a whistle. Charles Rudley was eventually convicted of murder of one of his earlier wives. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. His common law wife, Nora, lost her life and, of course, her head. It's nice to consider that, in her case at least, the punishment fit the crime. I'll be back shortly. Well, good evening, uh, Mystery Theater fans. This is uh, Gene Shepard, and we're sitting here having a very friendly roundtable discussion with many of our listeners who gather nightly here at uh, the 710 spot on the dial. And if you'd like to join our little evening gatherings, I'm on every night at, uh, let's see, it's 9.15 now. 9.15. You write that down. And make sure that uh, you bring all the things you need to be prepared for a fantastic evening. I'm on every night from 9.15 until 10. Join our little group some night. We sit around and discuss the world and enjoy life and, and uh, walk around in the weeds and uh, just be people. 9.15 on WOR. From the WR Newsroom, the winner of the 100th running of the Kentucky Derby, Cannonade. Details upcoming in the news at 6 with Roger Skibbenes. An invitation. This is Peter Roberts. Join us Sunday morning, 8.15 to 10, here on WOR for Rambling with Roberts. Two hours of music, especially uh, selected for Sunday morning listening pleasure, along with uh, old bits of weather information, news headlines, uh, bits of trivia, such as the fact that uh, a man from Onoa, Iowa, received a patent for what he called Eskimo pie, which was ice cream coated with chocolate. It all happened in 1922. It may not seem like very much in the way of history, but it does take place, these little bits of trivia and information, on Rambling with Roberts. So, of a Sunday morning, make a note. 8.15 to 10, right here at 7.10 on your dial, come rambling with Roberts. You don't have to give us an RSVP, just be on hand. Thank you. Uncle Alfie proved to be right about the resiliency of youth. It took a couple of years, but eventually Beth settled down and is happily married to a psychiatrist in Duluth. As for this fable itself, it also goes to prove that time not only heals all wounds, but eventually wounds all heals. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Nick Pryor, Bryna Rayburn, Ian Martin, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown, and now, a preview of our next tale. This is a voodoo doll. All of him is made with things that once belonged to Triedo. Only one last thing I needed to make the spell work. The weapon. Now, at last, I have in my hand the instrument of destruction. I straighten out the circle, turn the head to the sky, 
and death. The tail towards the ground and strike. What have I done, Mr. Ramsey? You... You drove the bracelet like a knife straight through the doll's head. From temple to temple. Hernando Trejado will be dead by midnight. And we will all be free. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W.R. Mystery Theater has been brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. And by Suburban Savings, with offices throughout North New Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Five o'clock, time for the news on the hour from the W.O.R. Newsroom. This is Roger Skibbenes reporting. Under sunny skies, 60 degrees now in midtown Manhattan. Clear and cool tonight, with a low 40 to 45 degrees. And it's going to be sunny and cool tomorrow with a high near 60. Fair, not as cool tomorrow night. More on the weather later on. Some $20 million in art treasures were recovered today in Ireland. Police in Dublin say the masterpieces stolen a week ago in what has been described as the biggest art robbery in history were found in West Cork. A woman is now being questioned. Yesterday, there was a ransom demand for $1.2 million dollars. Also, the note sent to police insisted that four persons imprisoned in New England be transferred to Irish jails. The owner of the painting, Sir Alfred Beatt, refused to pay any ransom, and the British refused to transfer the prisoners. The paintings, all of them, all $20 million worth, were described as not being harmed. Ron Ziegler, President Nixon's news secretary, today accused those who read the Watergate, Watergate transcripts and believe former White House counsel John Dean over President Nixon as being partisan. Ziegler, speaking to newsmen in Spokane, said the transcribed Watergate tapes show numerous and serious contradictions in the testimony of John Dean. Two Republicans on the Senate Watergate Committee, Howard Baker of Tennessee and Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, have made the comment that the transcripts seem to support Dean's testimony before the Senate panel. The president is in Spokane, Washington this afternoon for the opening of Expo 74. It follows on the heels of a public appearance in Phoenix, Arizona last night where he addressed a Republican rally and said it's time to move beyond Watergate and get on with the business of America. Seattle police have in their custody this afternoon a 21-year-old soldier from Fort Lewis, Washington. He was picked up with two weapons and a hefty supply of ammunition. He's accused of threatening the president's life. From Washington this afternoon comes word that the president has decided not to reduce the 10-year sentence against Lieutenant William Calley, charged with the killing of civilians during the massacre at My Lai in South Vietnam. Calley, presently out of jail on bond, would be eligible for parole after an additional six months' confinement. Here in New York, a 15-year-old is presently undergoing surgery for a bullet wound in the thigh. An unidentified woman was treated for a gunshot wound and discharged from Morrisania Hospital in the Bronx. The injuries occurred when transit police on a stakeout apparently intervened during an attempted holdup of a change booth at the 167th Grand Concourse station of the IND. According to police, the youth drew a gun, pointed it at an officer. The transit cop then fired five shots. It was later determined that the pistol pointed at the officer was a toy gun. It's believed that the three youths were involved. One apparently got away. Another is being questioned at the 44th Precinct in the Bronx. A citywide search is on at this hour by police in an effort to recapture two men who managed to escape from the Brooklyn House of Detention last night. The two are 26-year-old George Harper of 1463 Pacific Street in Brooklyn and 42-year-old Stephen Fraser of 132-05, 155th Street in Queens. Harper is charged with murder. Fraser is accused of assault and kidnapping. Both men are considered dangerous. Two other inmates attempted to break out with Fraser and Harper but were captured almost immediately. 
Before the weather, this word. What's so special about tomorrow's New York Times? Well, for one thing, the Sunday Times Book Review features a special 36-page section entirely about children's books. And besides this feature, which includes reviews of nearly 100 children's books, the travel section of tomorrow's New York Times is also special, because tomorrow it previews summer vacations. You'll get some great ideas on where to go this summer and how much it will cost. Even if you're staying home, you'll find excellent reading in the Sunday Times travel section, including a fascinating story of a man and his dog who sailed the dangerous route completely around Long Island and in a 12-foot sailboat. Also in tomorrow's New York Times, colorful coverage of the Kentucky Derby, a first-hand report on what life is like in Israel today, and helpful tips on how to get rid of plant diseases as well as weeds in your lawn. So be sure you get your copy of tomorrow's New York Times. And for information on home delivery of the Times, just call MU7-0700. That's area code 212, then dial MU7-0700. The New York Times. The WOR Weather Watch update, clear and cool tonight with a low 40 to 45 degrees. Tomorrow, sunny and cool. The high tomorrow near 60 degrees. And tomorrow night, the low near 50. Monday, increasing cloudiness with a chance of showers. Right now, 60 degrees under sunny skies in midtown Manhattan. And that's the news at 5 from the WOR Newsroom. Roger Skibben is reporting. For news as it happens, keep tuned to WOR New York, the talk of New York. The Wisdom of Father Brown by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 6 The Head of Caesar There is, somewhere in Brompton or Kensington, an interminable avenue of tall houses, rich but largely empty, that looks like a terrace of tombs. The very steps up to the dark front doors seem as steep as the side of pyramids. One would hesitate to knock at the door, lest it should be opened by a mummy. But a yet more depressing feature in the grey façade is its telescopic length and changeless continuity. The pilgrim walking down it begins to think he will never come to a break or a corner. But there is one exception, a very small one, but hailed by the pilgrim almost with a shout. There is a sort of muse between two of the tall mansions, a mere slit like the crack of a door by comparison with the street, but just large enough to permit a pygmy alehouse or eating-house, still allowed by the rich to their stable servants, to stand in the angle. There is something cheery in its very dinginess, and something free and elfin in its very insignificance. At the feet of those grey stone giants it looks like a lighted house of dwarves. Anyone passing the place during a certain autumn evening, itself almost fairy-like, might have seen a hand pull aside the red half-blind, which, along with some large white lettering, half hid the interior from the street, and a face peer out not unlike a rather innocent goblin's. It was, in fact, the face of one with the harmless human name of Brown, formerly priest of Cobhall in Essex, and now working in London. His friend, Flambeau, a semi-official investigator, was sitting opposite him and making his last notes of a case he had cleared up in the neighbourhood. They were sitting at a small table, close up to the window, when the priest pulled the curtain back and looked out. He waited till a stranger in the street had passed the window, to let the curtain fall into its place again. Then his round eyes rolled to the large white lettering on the window above his head, and then strayed to the next table, at which sat only a navvy with beer and cheese, and a young girl with red hair and a glass of milk. Then, seeing his friend put away the pocket-book, he said softly, "'If you've got ten minutes, I wish you'd follow that man with a false nose.' Flambeau looked up in surprise, but the girl with the red hair also looked up, and was something that was stronger than astonishment. 
She was simply and even loosely dressed in light brown sacking stuff, but she was a lady, and even, on a second glance, a rather needlessly haughty one. "'The man with a false nose,' repeated Flambeau. "'Who's he?' "'I haven't a notion,' asked Father Brown. "'I want you to find out. I ask it as a favour. He went down there, and he jerked his thumb over his shoulder in one of his undistinguished gestures. "'And can't have passed three lampposts yet. I only want to know the direction.' Flambeau gazed at his friend for some time, with an expression between perplexity and amusement, and then, rising from the table, squeezed his huge form out of the little door of the dwarf tavern, and melted into the twilight. Father Brown took a small book out of his pocket and began to read steadily. He betrayed no consciousness of the fact that the red-haired lady had left her own table and sat down opposite him. At last she leaned over and said in a low, strong voice, "'Why do you say that? How do you know it's false?' He lifted his rather heavy eyelids, which fluttered in considerable embarrassment. Then his dubious eye roamed again to the white lettering on the glass front of the public house. The young woman's eyes followed his and rested there also, but in pure puzzled them. No, said Father Brown, answering her thoughts, it doesn't say cellar like the thing in the Psalms. I read it like that myself when I was wool gathering just now. It says ales. Well, inquired the staring young lady, what does it matter what it says? His ruminating eye moved to the girl's light canvas sleeve, round the wrist of which ran a very slight thread of artistic pattern, just enough to distinguish it from a working dress of a common woman, and make it more like the working dress of a lady art student. He seemed to find much food for thought in this, but his reply was very slow and hesitant. "'You see, madam,' he said, "'from the outside the place looks, well, it is a perfectly decent place, but ladies like you don't, don't generally think so. They never go into such places from choice, except—' "'Well,' she repeated, "'except an unfortunate few who don't go in to drink milk.' "'You are a most singular person,' said the young lady.' What is your object in all this? Not to trouble you about it, he replied very gently, only to arm myself with knowledge enough to help you, if ever you freely ask my help. But why should I need help? He continued his dreamy monologue. You couldn't have come in to see protégés, humble friends, or that sort of thing, or you'd have gone through into the parlour. And you couldn't have come in because you were ill, or you'd have spoken to the woman of the place, who's obviously respectable. Besides, you don't look ill in that way, but only unhappy. This street is the only original long lane that has no turning. And the houses on both sides are shut up. I could only suppose that you'd seen somebody coming whom you didn't want to meet, and found the public house was the only shelter in this wilderness of stone. I don't think I went beyond the license of a stranger, in glancing at the only man who passed immediately after, and as I thought he looked like the wrong sort, and you looked like the right sort, I held myself ready to help, if he annoyed you, that is all. As for my friend, he'll be back soon, and he certainly can't find out anything by stumping down a road like this. I didn't think he could. Then why did you send him out, she cried, leaning forward with yet warmer curiosity. She had the proud, impetuous face that goes with reddish colouring and a Roman nose, as it did in Marie Antoinette. He looked at her steadily for the first time, and said, "'Because I hoped you would speak to me.' She looked back at him for some time with a heated face, in which there hung a red shadow of anger. Then, despite her anxieties, humour broke out of her eyes and the corners of her mouth, and she answered almost grimly, well, if you are so keen on my conversation, perhaps you'll answer my question. After a pause, she added, I had the honour to ask you why you thought the man's nose was false. The wax always spots like that, just a little in this weather, answered Father Brown with entire simplicity. But it's such a crooked nose, remonstrated the red-haired girl. The priest smiled in his turn. 
I don't say it's the sort of nose one would wear out of mere foppery, he admitted. This man, I think, wears it because his real nose is so much nicer. But why? she insisted. What is the nursery rhyme? observed Brown absent-mindedly. There was a crooked man, and he went a crooked mile. That man, I fancy, has gone a very crooked road by following his nose. Why? What's he done? she demanded rather shakily. I don't want to force your confidence by a hair, said Father Brown very quietly, but I think you could tell me more about that than I can tell you. The girl sprang to her feet and stood quietly, but with clenched hands like one about to stride away. Then her hands loosened slowly, and she sat down again. You are more of a mystery than all the others, she said desperately, but I feel there might be a heart in your mystery. What we all dread most, said the priest, in a low voice, is a maze with no centre. That is why atheism is only a nightmare. I will tell you everything, said the red-haired girl doggedly, except why I am telling you, and that I don't know. She picked at the darned tablecloth and went on, You look as if you knew what isn't snobbery as well as what is, and when I say that ours is a good family you'll understand it is a necessary part of the story. Indeed, my chief danger is in my brother's high and dry notions, noblesse oblige and all that. Well, my name is Christabel Carstairs, and my father was that Colonel Carstairs you've probably heard of, who made the famous Carstairs collection of Roman coins. I could never describe my father to you. The nearest I can say is that he was very like a Roman coin himself. He was as handsome and as genuine and as valuable and as metallic and as out of date. He was prouder of his collection than of his coat of arms. Nobody could say more than that. His extraordinary character came out most in his will. He had two sons and one daughter. He quarrelled with one son, my brother Giles, and sent him to Australia on a small allowance. He then made a will leaving the Carstairs collection, actually with a yet smaller allowance to my brother Arthur. He meant it as a reward, as the highest honour he could offer, in the acknowledgment of Arthur's loyalty and rectitude, and the distinctions he had already gained in mathematics and economics at Cambridge. He left me practically all his pretty large fortune, and I'm sure he meant it in contempt. Arthur, you may say, might well complain of this, but Arthur is my father over again. Though he had some differences with my father in early youth, no sooner had he taken over the collection than he became like a pagan priest dedicated to a temple. He mixed up these Roman halfpence with the honour of the Carstairs family in the same stiff, idolatrous way as his father before him. He acted as if Roman money must be guarded by all the Roman virtues. He took no pleasures, he spent nothing on himself, he lived for the collection. Often he would not trouble to dress for his simple meals, but pattered about among the corded brown paper parcels, which no one else was allowed to touch, in an old brown dressing gown. With its rope and tassel and his pale, thin, refined face, it made him look like an old ascetic monk. Every now and then, though, he would appear dressed like a decidedly fashionable gentleman, but that was only when he went up to the London sales, or shops, to make an addition to the Carstairs collection. Now, if you've known any young people, you won't be shocked if I say that I got into rather a low frame of mind with all this. The frame of mind in which one begins to say that the ancient Romans were all very well in their way. I'm not like my brother Arthur. I can't help enjoying enjoyment. I got a lot of romance and rubbish when I got my red hair from the other side of the family. Poor Giles was the same, and I think the atmosphere of coins might count in excuse for him though he really did wrong and nearly went to prison. But he didn't behave any worse than I did, as you shall hear. I come now to the silly part of the story. I think a man as clever as you can guess the sort of thing that would begin to relieve the monotony for an unruly girl of seventeen placed in such a position. But I am so rattled with more dreadful things that I can hardly read my own feeling, and don't know whether I despise it now as a flirtation or bear it as a broken heart. We lived then at a little seaside watering place in South Wales, and a retired sea captain living a few doors off had a son about five years older than myself, 
who had been a friend of Giles before he went to the colonies. His name does not affect my tale, but I tell you it was Philip Hawker, because I am telling you everything. We used to go shrimping together, and said and thought we were in love with each other. At least, he certainly said he was, and I certainly thought I was. If I tell you he had bronzed curly hair and a falconish sort of face, bronzed by the sea also, it is not for his sake, I assure you, but for the story, for it was the cause of a very curious coincidence. One summer afternoon, when I had promised to go shrimping along the sands with Philip, I was waiting rather impatiently in the front drawing-room, watching Arthur handle some packets of coins he had just purchased, and slowly shunt them one or two at a time into his own dark study and museum, which was at the back of the house. As soon as I heard the heavy door close on him finally, I made a bolt for my shrimping net and tam and was just going to slip out, when I saw that my brother had left behind him one coin that lay gleaming on the long bench by the window. It was a bronze coin, and the colour, combined with the exact curve of the Roman nose and something in the very lift of the long, wiry neck, made the head of Caesar on it the almost precise portrait of Philip Hawker. Then I suddenly remembered Giles telling Philip of a coin that was like him, and Philip wishing he had it. Perhaps you can fancy the wild, foolish thoughts with which my head went round. I felt as if I had had a gift from the fairies. It seemed to me that if I could only run away with this and give it to Philip like a wild sort of wedding ring, it would be a bond between us for ever. I felt a thousand such things at once. Then they yawned under me like the pit, the enormous, awful notion of what I was doing. Above all, the unbearable thought, which was like touching hot iron, of what Arthur would think of it, a caster as a thief, and a thief of the caster's treasure. I believe my brother could see me burned like a witch for such a thing. But then the very thought of such fanatical cruelty heightened my old hatred of his dingy old antiquarian fussiness, and my longing for the youth and liberty that called to me from the sea. Outside was strong sunlight with a wind, and a yellow head of some broom or gorse in the garden wrapped against the glass of the window. I thought of that living and growing gold calling to me from all the heaths of the world, and then of that dead, dull gold and bronze and brass of my brothers growing dustier and dustier as life went by. Nature and the Carstairs collection had come to grips at last. Nature is older than the Carstairs collection. As I ran down the streets to the sea, the coin clenched tight in my fist. I felt all the Roman Empire on my back, as well as the Carstairs pedigree. It was not only the old lion argent that was roaring in my ear, but all the eagles of the Caesars seemed flapping and screaming in pursuit of me. And yet my heart rose higher and higher like a child's kite, until I came over the very loose, dry sandhills, and to the flat, wet sands, where Philip stood already up to his ankles in the shallow, shining water, some hundred yards out to sea. There was a great red sunset, and the long stretch of low water, hardly rising over the ankle for half a mile, was like a lake of ruby flame. It was not till I had torn off my shoes and stockings, and waded out to where he stood, which was well away from the dry land, that I turned and looked around. We were quite alone in a circle of sea-water and wet sand, and I gave him the head of Caesar. At the very instant I had a shock of fancy, that a man far away on the sand-hills was looking at me intently. I must have felt immediately after that it was a mere leap of unreasonable nerves, for the man was only a dark dot in the distance, and I could only just see that he was standing quite still and gazing, with his head a little to one side. There was no earthly logical evidence that he was looking at me. He might have been looking at a ship, or the sunset, or the seagulls, or at any of the people who were still strayed here and there on the shore between us. Nevertheless, whatever my start sprang from was prophetic, for as I gazed he started walking briskly in a bee-line towards us across the wide wet sands. As he drew nearer and nearer I saw that he was dark and bearded, and that his eyes were marked with dark spectacles. He was dressed poorly but respectably in black, from the old black top hat on his head to the solid black boots on his feet. 
In spite of these, he walked straight into the sea without a flash of hesitation, and came on at me with the steadiness of a travelling bullet. I can't tell you the sense of monstrosity and miracle I had when he thus silently burst the barrier between land and water. It was as if he had walked straight off a cliff, and still marched steadily in mid-air. It was as if a house had flown up into the sky, or a man's head had fallen off. He was only wetting his boots, but he seemed to be a demon disregarding a law of nature. If he had hesitated an instant at the water's edge, it would have been nothing. As it was, he seemed to look so much at me alone as not to notice the ocean. Philip was some yards away, with his back to me, bending over his net. The stranger came on till he stood within two yards of me, the water washing halfway up his knees. Then he said, with a clearly modulated and rather mincing articulation, Would it discommode you to contribute elsewhere a coin with a somewhat different superscription? With one exception, there was nothing definably abnormal about him. His tinted glasses were not really opaque, but of a blue kind common enough, nor his eyes behind them shifty, but regarded me steadily. His dark beard was not really long or wild, but he looked rather hairy, because the beard began very high up in his face, just under the cheekbones. His complexion was neither sallow nor livid, but on the contrary rather clear and youthful. Yet this gave a pink-and-white waxed look, which somehow, I don't know why, rather increased the horror. The only oddity one could fix was that his nose, which was otherwise of a good shape, was just slightly turned sideways at the tip, as if, when it was soft, it had been tapped on one side with a toy hammer. The thing was hardly a deformity, yet I cannot tell you what a living nightmare it was to me. As he stood there in the sunset-stained water, he affected me as some hellish sea-monster just risen roaring out of a sea like blood. I don't know why a touch on the nose should affect my imagination so much. I think it seemed as if he could move his nose like a finger and as if he had just that moment moved it. Any little assistance, he continued with the same queer priggish accent, that may obviate the necessity of my communicating with the family. Then it rushed over me that I was being blackmailed for the theft of the bronze piece, and all my merely superstitious fears and doubts were swallowed up in one overpowering practical question. How could he have found out? I'd stolen the thing suddenly and on impulse. I was certainly alone, for I always made sure of being unobserved when I slipped out to see Philip in this way. I had not, to all appearances, been followed in the street, and if I had, they could not X-ray the coin in my closed hand. The man standing on the sand hills could no more have seen what I gave Philip than shoot a fly in one eye, like the man in the fairy tale. Philip, I cried helplessly, ask this man what he wants. When Philip lifted his head at last from mending his net, he looked rather red, as if sulky or ashamed. But it may have been only the exertion of stooping and the red evening light. I may have only had another of the morbid fancies that seemed to be dancing about me. He merely gruffly said to the man, You clear out of this, and motioning me to follow, set off wading shoreward without paying further attention to him. He stepped onto a stone breakwater that ran out from among the roots of the sandhills, and so struck homeward, perhaps thinking our incubus would find it less easy to walk on such rough stones, green and slippery with seaweed, than we who were young and used to it. But my persecutor walked as daintily as he talked, and he still followed me, picking his way and picking his phrases. I heard his delicate, detestable voice appealing to me over my shoulder, until at last— when we had crested the sand-hills, Philip's patience, which was by no means so conspicuous on most occasions, seemed to snap. He turned suddenly, saying, "'Go back, I can't talk to you now.' And as the man hovered and opened his mouth, Philip struck him a buffet on it that sent him flying from the top of the tallest sand-hill to the bottom. I saw him crawling out below, covered with sand. This stroke comforted me somehow, though it might well increase my peril but Philip showed none of his usual elation at his own prowess. Though as affectionate as ever, he still seemed cast down. And before I could ask him anything fully, he parted with me at his own gate, with two remarks that struck me as strange. 
he said that, all things considered, I ought to put the coin back in the collection, but that he himself would keep it for the present. And then he added, quite suddenly and irrelevantly, You know Giles is back from Australia. The door of the tavern opened, and the gigantic shadow of the investigator Flambeau fell across the table. Father Brown presented him to the lady in his own slight, persuasive style of speech, mentioning his knowledge and sympathy in such cases, and, almost without knowing, the girl was soon reiterating her story to two listeners. But Flambeau, as he bowed and sat down, handed the priest a small slip of paper. Brown accepted it with some surprise, and read on it, Cab to Wagga Wagga, 379 Mafeking Avenue, Putney. The girl was going on with her story. I went up the street to my own house with my head in a whirl. It had not begun to clear when I came to the doorstep, on which I found a milk can and the man with the twisted nose. The milk can told me the servants were all out, for, of course, Arthur, browsing about in his brown dressing gown in a brown study, would not hear or answer a bell. Thus there was no one to help me in the house except my brother, whose help must be my ruin. In desperation I thrust two shillings into the horrid thing's hand, and told him to call again in a few days when I had thought it out. He went off sulking, but more sheepishly than I had expected. Perhaps he had been shaken by his fall, and I watched the star of sand splashed on his back receding down the road with a horrid, vindictive pleasure. He turned a corner some six houses down. Then I let myself in, made myself some tea, and tried to think it out. I sat at the drawing-room window, looking on to the garden, which still glowed with the last full evening light. But I was too distracted and dreamy to look at the lawns and flower-pots and flower-beds with any concentration. So I took the shock the more sharply, because I'd seen it so slowly. The man or monster I'd sent away was standing quite still in the middle of the garden. Oh, we all read a lot about pale-faced phantoms in the dark, but this was more dreadful than anything of that kind could ever be, because, though he cast a long evening shadow, he still stood in warm sunlight, and because his face was not pale, but had that waxen bloom still upon it that belongs to a barber's dummy. He stood quite still, with his face towards me, and I can't tell you how horrid he looked among the tulips and all those tall, gaudy, almost hothouse-looking flowers. It looked as if we'd stuck up a waxwork instead of a statue in the centre of our garden. Yet almost the instant he saw me move in the window, he turned and ran out of the garden by the back gate, which stood open, and by which he had undoubtedly entered. This renewed timidity on his part was so different from the impudence with which he had walked into the sea, that I felt vaguely comforted. I fancied, perhaps, that he feared confronting Arthur more than I knew. Anyhow, I settled down at last, and had a quiet dinner alone, for it was against the rules to disturb Arthur when he was rearranging the museum. And my thoughts, a little released, fled to Philip and lost themselves, I suppose. Anyhow, I was looking blankly, but rather pleasantly than otherwise, at another window, uncurtained, but by this time black as slate with the final nightfall. It seemed to me that something like a snail was on the outside of the window-pane, but when I stared harder, it was more like a man's thumb pressed on the pane. It had that curled look that a thumb has. With my fear and courage reawakened together, I rushed at the window, and then recoiled with a strangled scream that any man but Arthur must have heard. For it was not a thumb, any more than it was a snail. It was the tip of a crooked nose crushed against the glass. It looked white with the pressure, and the staring face and eyes behind it were at first invisible, and afterwards grey like a ghost. I slammed the shutters together somehow, rushed up to my room, and locked myself in. But even as I passed, I could swear I saw a second black window with something on it that was like a snail. It might be best to go to Arthur after all. If the thing was crawling close all around the house like a cat, it might have purposes worse even than blackmail. My brother might cast me out and curse me forever, but he was a gentleman and would defend me on the spot. 
After ten minutes' curious thinking, I went down, knocked on the door, and then went in, to see the last and worst sight. My brother's chair was empty, and he was obviously out, but the man with the crooked nose was sitting waiting for his return, with his hat still insolently on his head, and actually reading one of my brother's books under my brother's lamp. His face was composed and occupied, but his nose tip still had the air of being the most mobile part of his face, as if it had just turned from left to right like an elephant's proboscis. I had thought him poisonous enough while he was pursuing and watching me, but I think his unconsciousness of my presence was more frightful still. I think I screamed loud and long, but that doesn't matter. What I did next does matter. I gave him all the money I had, including a good deal in paper, which, though it was mine, I dare say I had no right to touch. He went off at last, with hateful, tactful regrets all in long words, and I sat down feeling ruined in every sense. And yet I was saved that very night by a pure accident. Arthur had gone off suddenly to London, as he so often did, for bargains, and returned late but radiant, having nearly secured a treasure that was an added splendour even to the family collection. He was so resplendent that I was almost emboldened to confess the abstraction of the lesser gem. But he bore down all other topics with his overpowering projects. Because the bargain might still misfire at any moment, he insisted on my packing at once and going up with him to lodgings he had already taken in Fulham, to be near the curio shop in question. Thus, in spite of myself, I fled from my foe almost in the dead of night, but from Philip also. My brother was often at the South Kensington Museum, and, in order to make some sort of secondary life for myself, I paid for a few lessons at the art schools. I was coming back from them this evening, when I saw the abomination of desolation walking alive down the long straight street, and the rest is as this gentleman has said. I've got only one thing to say. I don't deserve to be helped, and I don't question or complain of my punishment. It is just. It ought to have happened. But I still question, with bursting brains, how it can have happened. Am I punished by miracle? Or how can any one but Philip and myself know I gave him a tiny coin in the middle of the sea? It is an extraordinary problem, admitted Flambeau. Not so extraordinary as the answer, remarked Father Brown rather gloomily. Miss Carstairs, will you be at home if we call at your Fulham place in an hour and a half hence? The girl looked at him, and then rose and put her gloves on. Yes, she said, I'll be there, and almost instantly left the place. That night the detective and the priest were still talking of the matter as they drew near the Fulham house, a tenement strangely mean even for the temporary residents of the Carstairs family. Of course the superficial, on reflection, said Flambeau, would think first of this Australian brother who's been in trouble before, who's come back so suddenly, and who's just the man to have shabby confederates. But I can't see how he can come into the thing by any process of thought unless— Well, asked his companion patiently. Flambeau lowered his voice, unless the girl's lover comes in too, and he would be the blacker villain. The Australian chap did know that Hawker wanted the coin— but I can't see how on earth he could know that Hawker had got it, unless Hawker signalled to him or his representative across the shore. That's true, assented the priest with respect. Have you noted another thing? went on Flambeau eagerly. This Hawker hears his love insulted, but doesn't strike till he's got to the soft sand hills, where he can be victor in a mere sham fight. If he'd struck amid rocks and sea, he might have hurt his ally. That's true again, said Father Brown, nodding. And now, take it from the start. It lies between few people, but at least three. You want one person for suicide, two people for murder, but at least three people for blackmail. Why? asked the priest softly. Well, obviously, cried his friend, there must be one to be exposed, one to threaten exposure, and one at least whom exposure would horrify. After a long, ruminant pause, the priest said, you miss a logical step. Three persons are needed as ideas, only two are needed as agents. What can you mean? asked the other. Why shouldn't a blackmailer, asked Brown in a low voice, threaten his victim with himself? 
Suppose a wife became a rigid teetotaler in order to frighten her husband into concealing his pub frequenting, and then wrote him blackmailing letters in another hand threatening to tell his wife. Why shouldn't it work? Suppose a father forbade a son to gamble, and then, following him in a good disguise, threatened the boy with his own sham paternal strictness. Suppose. But here we are, my friend. My God, cried Flambeau, you don't mean— An active figure ran down the steps of the house, and showed under the golden lamplight the unmistakable head that resembled the Roman coin. Miss Carstairs, said Hawker without ceremony, wouldn't go in till you came. Well, observed Brown confidently, don't you think it's the best thing she can do to stop outside, with you to look after her? You see, I rather guess you've guessed it all yourself. Yes, said the young man in an undertone. I guessed on the sands, and now I know. That's why I let him fall soft. Taking a latch key from the girl and a coin from Hawker, Flambeau let himself and his friend into the empty house and passed into the outer parlour. It was empty of all occupants but one. The man whom Father Brown had seen pass the tavern was standing against the wall as if at bay. Unchanged, save that he had taken off his black coat and was wearing a brown dressing gown. We have come, said Father Brown politely, to give back this coin to its owner. And he handed it to the man with the nose. Flambeau's eyes rolled. Is this man a coin collector? he asked. This man is Mr. Arthur Carstairs, said the priest positively, and he is a coin collector of a somewhat singular kind. The man changed colour so horribly that the crooked nose stood out on his face like a separate and comic thing. He spoke, nevertheless, with a sort of despairing dignity. "'You shall see, then,' he said, "'that I have not lost all the family's qualities,' as he turned suddenly and strode into an inner room, slamming the door. "'Stop him!' shouted Father Brown, bounding and half-falling over a chair. And, after a wrench or two, Flambeau had the door open but it was too late. In dead silence, Flambeau strode across and telephoned for a doctor and police. An empty medicine bottle lay on the floor. Across the table, the body of the man in the brown dressing gown lay amid his burst and gaping brown paper parcels, out of which poured and rolled, not Roman, but very modern, English coins. The priest held up the bronze head of Caesar. This, he said, was all that was left of the Carstairs collection. After a silence he went on with more than common gentleness. It was a cruel will that his father made, and you see he did resent it a little. He hated the Roman money he had, and grew fonder of the real money denied him. He not only sold the collection bit by bit, but sank bit by bit to the basest ways of making money, even to blackmailing his own family in disguise. He blackmailed his brother from Australia for his little forgotten crime. That is why he took the cab to Wagga Wagga, in Putney. He blackmailed his sister for the theft he alone could have noticed. And that, by the way, is why she had that supernatural guess when he was away on the sand dunes. Mere figure and gait, however distant, are more likely to remind us of somebody than a well-made-up face quite close. There was another silence. Well, growled the detective. And so this great numismatist and coin collector was nothing but a vulgar miser. Is there so great a difference? asked Father Brown in the same strange, indulgent tone. What is there wrong about a miser that is not often as wrong about a collector? What is wrong except thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them, for I but we must go and see how the poor young couple are getting on. I think, said Flambeau, that in spite of everything, they are probably getting on very well. End of chapter. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines. 
Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you a star, Mr. Orson Welles. This will be the first of two consecutive performances by Mr. Welles, in which he will appear as the protagonist of Kurt Siodmak's novel, Donovan's Brain. The producer of Suspense and its sponsors, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, feel that this story is so unusual that it merits more than our usual time. So in somewhat of a departure from established radio formulas, we will bring you the story of Donovan's Brain in two parts. Part one you will hear tonight, and part two next Monday night at this same time. Before we take you to the scene of our drama, let's take a little journey of a different kind. We'll let a bottle of Roma wine serve as Aladdin's lamp. I touch the label, and presto, we are all transported to that capital of gaiety, Havana, Cuba. And now we find ourselves in the charming Pan American Club. At a table nearby, an American has just voiced his delight at the uncommon beauty of the scene. And then his Cuban companion responds, well, you in America also have much that is uncommon to boast of. Such is this marvelous tasting wine we are enjoying this minute. To enjoy uncommon fine quality, Cuba imports this wine from your own distant California. It is your superb Roma wine. Now just realize what it means when other countries import Roma wines from such great distances. Such international esteem must mean that Roma wines are truly magnificent in quality. And then consider this. You here in America need pay no high import duty, no expensive shipping charges. For these fine Roma wines come from Roma's own wineries in the heart of the rich California wine grape districts. Because so many Americans do realize this good fortune, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. So why deny yourself this taste delight? Try an inexpensive bottle of tangy appetizing Roma sherry or the hearty Roma burgundy or any of the marvelously enjoyable Roma wines. But remember... These days, your favorite dealer may be temporarily out of the type we prefer. Then please try again. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with part one of Donovan's Brain, and with the performance of Orson Welles as Dr. Patrick Corey, we again hope to keep you in suspense. As I sit now outside my laboratory door writing under the heading Experiment 87, this final entry in my casebook, I know that these are the last words I shall ever write upon this earth. I neither ask nor expect forgiveness now or hereafter, but for those who seek some explanation, I refer them simply to this casebook. Let them read it carefully from its first entry on that ill-starred day of July the 13th. <laughs> July 13th. Today I bought a small capuchin monkey from an organ grinder. The animal trembled with fear when I took it into my laboratory and when I tried to pet it, it bit me. But I had to make it trust me completely. Fear causes an excess secretion of adrenaline resulting in an abnormal condition of the bloodstream which would throw off my observations. So I fed it and finally the creature voluntarily crept up into my arms uttering little whimpers of content. When it laid its head against my shoulder, I stabbed it with a surgical lancet. It died instantly. <laughs> Well, David, what do you think of it? Well, it, it's pretty amazing, all right. See what I've done, don't you? I, I think so. You think so? Good Lord, don't you know? Well, after all that, I'm only a second-year medical I student. I know, but what if I was a second-year student? Who is it? It's me, Janet. Come in, darling. Patrick, Dr. Schrott is here to see you. Oh, come on in, doctor. You know our son, David, of course. Yes, of course. How are you, my boy? Fine, thanks, doctor. Well, Patrick, hard at it as usual, uh -huh. I see. Patrick, you didn't eat the lunch I sent in to you. Well, what is it this time, Patrick? A brain. What? A brain, a brain, a monkey's brain. Oh. What about the brain, Patrick? I've been trying to see how long I can keep the tissue alive. Oh, is that it in that jar? Oh, there's considerably more to it than just a jar, though. Want to see how it works? Is it 
Still alive? In a way, yes. It's a fairly simple device, actually, Doctor. Variation on Corell's mechanical heart. The brain lies in a bath of blood serum. These rubber arteries are fixed to the vertebral and internal carotid arteries of the brain. The blood substance is forced through the cycle of Willis, feed the tissue. Over here, I've installed a small rotary pump that forces the blood circulation, you see? But how do you know it's alive? It's very easy to determine. The brain, when functioning, gives off infinitesimal electrical impulses. They can be measured. As a matter of fact, I've hooked the encephalograph up to a small amplifying system. The brain impulses can actually be heard. Here, I'll turn it on. You see? <laughs> Quite effective, isn't it? Yes, it's effective. And it's... it's wrong, Patrick. Terribly wrong. Oh, I've tried wrong. to tell him, Dr. Schrott. In it's heaven's only... name, what's wrong with it? Oh, Patrick, you and your mechanistic philosophy, trying to reduce life to a mere matter of chemicals and test tubes. The origin of life is from a higher domain than that, Patrick. And you're profaning. Nonsense. You can't stop the progress of science. Every discovery of whatever kind is a step forward. If I can prove that the brain can perform certain functions outside the body... Who knows where we may be able to go from there. Oh, Patrick, how, how do you know that thing in there doesn't feel pain? How do you know it isn't writhing in agony? The brain tissue itself is insensitive, you know that? Just a feeling look. I'll switch on the encephalograph. See? There. Notice the faintness of the amplified alpha rays. Notice the comparatively slow rate of pulsation now. Notice what happens... My tap on the glass jar. See? Huh. It feels. It thinks. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but it certainly shows marked reaction to an external stimulus. I wouldn't have believed it possible. <laughs> the trouble with you, Schrott, is that you don't really believe in science. Uh, have it your own way, Patrick. That's when you can manufacture love and sympathy and... Kindness in a test tube. I'll be back. You leaving, old boy? Yes. Patrick. Hmm? Do me a favor, Patrick. Shut off the pump and let that poor thing in there die. Let it die? Huh. If it were within my power to grant that little brain would live forever. <laughs> July 18th. I'm utterly exhausted from lack of sleep at the events of the past five days have been of such tremendous importance that I must set them down while every last detail is still fresh in my mind. I've had no time to make an entry in this record since that day last week. It seems a month ago now and I had my first partial success with the brain of the Capuchin monkey. At that time, however, it seemed that I was doomed to disappointment. In spite of all my efforts, the brain of the monkey ceased to live at 12.14 that night. Tired and disheartened, I lay down to sleep on the cot in my laboratory, but at that very moment, fate was contriving an occurrence which now seems destined to have the most profound effect not only upon my own existence, but perhaps upon that of all mankind. Huh? Hello? Hello, what is it? Dad. Oh, David. Come in, come in. What's the matter? It's Dr. Schrott. There's been an accident or something. He's oh. pretty upset. All right, I'll come. Oh, Patrick, oh, Patrick, Patrick, thank heavens, my boy. What's the matter, boy? There's, there's been a plane crash on the mountain. Only one of them was left alive, and I've, I've brought him this far, but he, he needs an immediate oh, operation. Sorry, that's your job, your county physician. <clears throat> Patrick, it's, it's multiple fractures of both legs. Oh, the no. arteries are severed, and the legs will have to be amputated. Huh? You're not in any shape to do the job. Well, I... Well, that's not my fault. Take him to the Phoenix Hospital. I'm not going to take responsibility. Oh, it's too far. Really we we'd never it. get there in time. Patrick, please, it, it may mean a man's life and... And, and I... your job as county physician. No, no, I'm not mm, thinking of right. that, but it's it's an important man. William H. Donovan. Donovan? Don... The Wall Street Donovan? Yes. You've got to help me, Patrick. Donovan. Hmm. What are his chances? About even, if we hurry. Well, bring him in. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. You'd better get some things on, David. You may have to help. Yes, uh, and you will use the laboratory table. Before you go, put the instruments, the sterilizer. And don't forget the Geely saw. Right. Oh, but... But, uh, but what? I thought the Geely saw was only used for... For, for brain surgery. Hmm. Not always. Hurry. They'll bring him in now from the car. Okay, Dad. Yeah. In here. Careful now. That's right. Easy, does. Around the Doc. table, please. Yes, Doctor. Easy, is it? You better get yourself a gown and gloves, Doctor, right over there. You won't have time to scrub. Yes, thanks, mm -hmm. Doctor. Bad, isn't he? Pulse rapid. 
Hard to be faint. I wasn't sure. Uh, David, uh, yes, half cc of adrenaline, David, one to 1,000 into Venus. Right. You men can go now. Is there anything else we no, can do? No, thank you. Patrick, don't you I'd think... I'd rather we were alone if you don't mind, gentlemen. Yes. Yes. Good night, then, Dr. Schreier. Good, Good night. Good night. Now, David, David, if you remove the blanket from his legs, that's it. All right. Hmm. You see, fortunately, a forest ranger got to him right after the crash and had sense enough to put a tourniquet on each leg. Even so, yeah. <sighs> Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. We'll get it. Sure, sure, sure. What's he saying? Uh, something like, sure, sure, sure. He said it over and over. Huh. I hadn't realized he was deformed. It doesn't show as much in his pictures. Patrick, don't you think we ought to begin? Oh, there's no use amputating those legs. No use? he would be dead anyway by morning. Well, won't it? Well... Suppose you're right, Patrick. You know I'm right. But still, we ought to try. We can't refuse to operate just We are because... going to operate. Syringe, please, David, the large one. Here you are, Dad. Spinal anesthetic. Will you give it, Dr. Schrock? Right. Scalpel, please, David. Scalpel and the Geely saw. Geely saw? Patrick. Well? No, 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 Patrick. I won't let you. After your performance tonight? Well, I have... But, Patrick, he's still alive. Precisely. My mistake with the monkey was that he was dead. I don't intend to make that mistake again. Come on, David, Patrick, the scalpel. Patrick, are you out of your mind? You're, you're, you're taking a man's life. I'm giving him life. Donovan would die anyway. But for a while, at least, Donovan's brain will live. <laughs> Better hurry, they'll be coming for the body pretty soon. Yeah, you can go now, David. I David, think I will, uh, then. You understand, of course? Yes, I understand. Not a word, not a word to your mother or to anyone. I understand. Yeah, did you put something in the skull cavity oh, so yeah. the eyes won't fall? I, I filled it with cotton, bandaged the whole cranium. It looked like any head injury. I hope nobody gets any ideas about an autopsy. You're the coroner. You can stop there. Look, Schwartz. This is a chance that comes once in a lifetime. William Donovan had one of the greatest minds, has one of the greatest brains in the world today. And now you have it. Uh, it's Turn madness, on the encephalograph. Uh, simple alpha, simple alpha waves, 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 of course, no different from the monkeys. You can't take a human brain out of its body and expect it to function. I suppose not, but... Trot! Did it ever occur to you that the brain might simply be asleep? Asleep? Certainly. An operation like that is a severe shock. Tap on the glass. Good Lord, Patrick. Delta waves. It was asleep you woke it up. It's actually conscious. You see, you see, the three of us. Three of us conducting this experiment now. You, and me, and William Horace Donovan. July 25th, I moved my bed into the laboratory, but I've scarcely slept in six days. I mean, no longer any doubt that the brain responds like a sensitive seismograph to vibrations near it, including the sound of my voice. Yet I've found no method of communication with it. I've devised a simplified Morse code consisting of taps on the glass container, together with voice vibrations. Perhaps, perhaps I can teach the brain. July 30th, Schrott has come to stay with me, half out of a feeling that he shares with me a common guilt, half out of scientific curiosity. So I've scarcely seen him, and both David and Janice have been avoiding me, not that I really care. They've been tapping out my code on the side of the brain's container endlessly, day and night, over and over, a thousand times, so that a baby could learn it, if the brain can learn. I sleep only when the brain itself falls into exhausted slumber. When it wakes again, I resume my tapping. Come on, get up, hurry! 
Come on, I want to show something you something. Something the matter? Yes, old boy, I want to show you something. Patrick, you look like a ghost. Where are we going? Back to the laboratory. I can't believe it myself. I, I may have been dreaming delirious. What's happened? Come on. You hear that? Delta waves. Seems disturbed. You've got to check my observations for me. If my reasoning is wrong, tell me. I can't be sure of anything anymore. Yes, sir. Now listen carefully. You know that I've been trying to communicate with the brain in code now. If I were able to cause a distinctive pattern of the brain's delta waves by a specific command in code, if the brain responded with the same pattern of sound each time I issued the command, it would prove that I'd succeeded in communicating with the brain, wouldn't it? Yes, Frederick, I think it would. Now, listen... Donovan! Donovan! If you understand, think three times of the word talk. Three times. Talk. 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 It answered. It spoke. Then I'm right. It's true. This thing has learned to talk. To talk. July 31st. Charlotte's romanticizing, of course, the Delta pattern is so infinitely complex that it would be utterly impossible ever to break it down into specific words, yet that it understands me, that it's trying to communicate with me, is certain. Schott suggests mental telepathy, that I try to make my mind a blank, as the mediums call it, while at the same time increasing the energy content of the plasma that feeds the brain in the hope of stepping up the brain's electrical potential as one would step up the power of a radio station. Naturally, telepathy is nonsense, but... The feeding theory intrigues me. I shall try it. August 12th. Notice today for the first time two distinct nodules of new brain cells on the frontal lobe X. The electrical potential has increased to 510 microvolts. I, I, I've become smoking cigars. I, although I've always hated cigars before... Nerves, I expect. August 22nd, nodule still growing, electrical potential 1450, but with no observable results. Lately felt a compelling urge to know more of Donovan's life and have collected every available scrap of information about him. A strange man he was. Strange, ruthless, actually evil in many ways but nonetheless an extraordinarily brilliant mind. Wake you up, Patrick. You were moaning asleep. in your sleep, talking. Uh, talking? What did I say? I'm not sure, but your voice was so strange that... Janice, Janice, what's the matter? There's nothing, nothing. I was dreaming, that's all. Janice woke me up. Patrick, let me see your hand. My hand? What you no, the other one. For? What about it? You're not left-handed, are you? No. Then why have you got ink on the fingers of your left hand? Well, I don't know. Were you writing anything tonight? Oh. You must have been, Patrick. Here it is, right here on your desk. Nonsense. Wait, let me see it. Well, you've been writing his name, William H. William Donovan. H. Donovan Schrott, that's not my handwriting. It's... What? Don't you see what it means? The brain has communicated with me. Patrick, you don't... Look here. Look at this magazine article. Here's a reproduction of his signature... And he was left-handed, too. It says so here. Why, it is. It, it oh, is exactly the what same. What a fool I've been. Look at this picture smoking a cigar. With his left hand, I wondered why it suddenly started smoking cigars. The same brand, too. Janice, try to remember what you heard me saying just before you woke me up. Come on, Janice. Think. <laughs> <laughs> 
Patrick, I, I can't believe... Think, Janice. All I heard was something like... Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Of course. Don't you remember, Schrott? He said it that night. It was the only thing we ever heard him say. It, it, it was an expression of his. It tells about that in one of the articles, too. Yes, it, there it is. It right wasn't there. your voice, Patrick. It wasn't Patrick. my voice. You see, the brain has grown. And it's strong enough to influence not only the higher functions, the frontal lobe, but the speech centers, the motor centers of another brain. Patrick, if this is true, then your experiment has been successful. It's ended. Ended? Oh, it's only begun. Patrick. Don't you see what this means? Patrick, listen to me. Oh, what, Janice? What? You've got to stop. Stop? I can't stand it any longer. Can't you see where it's led you? When you cut yourself off from your family, when you neglected your health, began having fits of temper and were like... like someone I hardly recognize as the man I married. All that I tried to understand... But don't you see what you've done? You are a murderer, Patrick, a murderer. Oh, Janice, darling. David told me the whole thing. That poor boy is half insane himself from worry. Insane? What do you mean by that? What I say. You killed Donovan. Janice, Maybe darling. he wouldn't have lived anyway. But you killed him. And now this, this thing has gained such power over your mind that it can make you do things you don't even know about. For all you know, it could make you do anything. Anything. You've got to choose, Patrick. Oh, Janice, please. I suppose you're right, but I'm utterly exhausted. I can't even think anymore. You've got to think. Give me until tomorrow. Let me sleep, and then tomorrow I'll do something. I promise you. All right, Patrick. Tomorrow. But if you don't do something, if you don't destroy that this... thing, I will. The brain. It's almost as though it heard you and were raging. Raging at you. <laughs> This way, please, Dr. Come Corey. Come on, darling. But, Patrick, why hmm? are we going in here? A psychiatric clinic? I told you I'd do something, Janice. I've, I've got an idea. You I... mean you're you're having yourself psychoanalyzed? Well... Something like that? Something like that. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. First, I want, I want you to talk to this man alone. Dr. Zanger, this is Dr. Corey. Oh. How do you do, Dr. Cole? How do you I've heard do, something Dr. of your work. Oh, yes. And this is Mrs. Corey. Of course, excuse me. I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Corey. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, won't you come in tomorrow? Uh, I, I will certainly. Janice, would you mind, darling, waiting in the reception room? We'll be out in just a moment. Thank you. Why, certainly, do. In here, please, Doctor. Very well. Well, Doctor, she seems quite normal. I'd expected from what you told me on the telephone. That... I... I know, I... No, I, I... I can assure you, I... I, I, I hate to tell you this, but... Uh, doctor... She's quite insane. I see. Yes. Uh, uh, paranoia. She, she's always been, you know... Jealous of my work. And... Well... Last little while, she started. She's got a, a a delusion that she thinks I've made some kind of a monster in up in in my laboratory that controls my mind and and controls my actions. Huh. So I, I'm I'm putting her completely in your hands. Oh, well. It's... It's, of course, a little unusual, but since you are yourself a medical man... That's right. Uh, you definitely wish to commit her, then, huh? Yes. Yes. You have the papers. Oh, yes. Here you are. Uh, just your signature will be enough, though. Ah. There you are. Uh, you, you let me know about everything, won't oh, you? Oh, naturally, Doctor. We keep okay. you informed. Thank you. Well, goodbye then, Dr. Corey. We, we'll do what we can. Oh, right. Uh, Patrick? Uh, Mrs. Corey is staying with us, Miss Wilcox. Yes, Dr. Zanger. Uh, Patrick? Come back! Patrick! Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Corey. Just come with me, please. Patrick! No. Where are you going? Let me go! Let me go! Oh, Dr. Corey? Yes? Oh, about the bill, how do you wish it to be handled? 
Uh, the bill. The... The bill. Sure, sure, sure. I, I'll take care of it by the week. The checks will be signed to uh, William H. Donovan. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> August 20th. It's nearly three weeks now since Janice went away. I can't understand how she could have left me just when I needed her most. When I try to question Shrott or David about it, they only look at me strangely and change the subject. Clearly, they too now are in on the conspiracy. Sometimes it seems the only person I can trust is Donovan. The brain communicates with me more freely now each day. I know it has some great plan in mind for me, for both of us. I'm waiting, patiently waiting. <laughs> Donovan? Donovan, I I'm listening, Donovan. Don't be angry, Donovan. I'm trying to understand. I I'm listening, Donovan. I'm listening. I I I'm li <laughs> Sure. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> And so closes Donovan's Brain, part one, the first of two half-hour presentations of Kutsyod Mack's story, presenting Orson Welles as star of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the performance of Orson Welles and that of the whole cast tonight in our Roma Suspense play, and that you'll make a note to be sure not to miss the completion of this story next week. The Roma Wine Company would like to express its thanks for the many letters of appreciation from listeners which we are constantly receiving saying how much you enjoy these broadcasts. And here's a thought. To discover the enjoyment these suspense programs offer, you first had to sample one. And so you must first sample one of the many delicious Roma wines to discover for yourself their wonderful taste and quality, the excellence that makes Roma America's largest selling wines. You'll discover, as of other millions before you, that Roma wines are super quality, are super tasting, and are super easy on your pocketbook, too, costing only pennies a glass. Be sure you get R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The greatest and most profitable investment you can make in your country's future is to buy war bonds. Don't forget, then... Next Monday, you will hear part two of Donovan's Brain, starring Orson Welles, in the completion of this remarkable tale of suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we again bring you Mr. Orson Welles. 
in the second of two consecutive performances starring Mr. Wells as the protagonist of Kurt Siodmak's novel, Donovan's Brain. The producer of Suspense and its sponsors, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, felt this story so unusual that it merited more than our usual time. So in somewhat of a departure from established radio formulas, we are bringing you the story of Donovan's Brain in two parts. Part one you heard last Thursday, and tonight you will hear part two, the completion of Donovan's Brain. But before we raise the curtain on our suspense play, let's for a moment wish ourselves away to Havana, Cuba, seated at a table in the fashionable Hotel de Nacional de Cuba. Near us, a, gr a group of Cubans are entertaining an American visitor. Our American has just remarked that in point of great enjoyment, the Cuban rumba is one of America's most delightful imported dances. And then, raising his wine glass, the Cuban host responds, then we have perhaps discharged some part of our debt to you Americans for this wonderful tasting wine that gives us such great enjoyment. It is wine that Cuba imports from your faraway California. It is Roma wine. Americans didn't have to wait for wine connoisseurs of other lands to discover the greatness of California's wine districts, the superb quality of Roma California wine. So many millions made this discovery for themselves that Roma wines have long been America's largest selling wines. But these millions discovered something more. In Roma wines, they discovered an easy and expensive way to increase the delights of daily living. Yes, millions have discovered that Roma wines, as a beverage on the table, and when used in entertaining, add a charm of a special and wholesome kind. I told you Roma wines cost little. That's because here in America, you pay no high import duty, no expensive shipping charges. And two, Roma wines come from Roma's own wineries in the heart of choice California vineyard districts. So cost to you is only pennies a glass for R-O-M-A Roma wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with part two of Donovan's Brain and with the performance of Orson Welles as Dr. Patrick Corey. We again hope to keep you in suspense. As I sit now outside my laboratory door writing, under the heading Experiment 87, this final entry in my case book, I know that these are the last words I shall ever write upon this earth. For those who seek some explanation, I refer them simply to this case book. Let them read it carefully. Perhaps they may then in some measure understand, if not condone, the awful circumstances under which I have been driven to the most appalling crime against God and nature that it has ever been the fate of mortal man to perpetrate. August 24th. It's now six weeks, exactly 42 days since I began the experiment. For six weeks, by artificial means alone, I have kept alive a human brain, completely detached from the body, floating in a bath of serum nourished by a synthetic blood plasma fed through its arteries by an electric pump. It has remained alive, not only alive, but I have succeeded in communicating with it. For I have even induced new growth of brain cells and so tremendously increased its mental faculties that by sheer brain power alone, has actually been able to communicate its thoughts to me, and each day my communion with that living, pulsing mass of grey matter that was the brain of William Donovan becomes stronger and stronger. Even now I sense it's striving to reveal some plan to me, something so truly world-shaking in its implications, that only such an organism, developed to a point thousands of years ahead of its time, could ever have conceived it. So far I sense this only, but soon I shall know... Indeed, I shall be partner in its execution. What a fool I was ever to have considered for a moment my wife's demand that I end the experiment. It's because I refused, of course, that Janice left me a week ago without so much as a word of explanation or farewell. Even my son David and my assistant Shrat are privy to this conspiracy to thwart me, for when I ask about Janice, they pretend to know nothing. They seek to avoid my questions. But the brain will live. Yes, I can hear it now. Its delta waves quite audible over the amplifying system I've arranged for it. Almost as though it were calling to me, trying to speak to me. The brain will live.
Donovan? What is it? What are you trying to tell me? Go on, Donovan. I'm listening. Go on. Go on. Go. Who is it? What do you want? You want to talk to you, Dave? I have no time to talk. I'm busy. Open I'm sorry. Door, Go away, I tell you. I'm busy. Please, Patrick. Can't you two leave me alone? All right, all right. What oh, is Patrick. it? What is it? Patrick, won't you come into the study with us for a few minutes? What have you got to say? You say right here. You know I can't leave the laboratory. Well, Dad, it's only that well, we wanted to talk to you in, in private. Well, don't tell me that you're afraid of this poor mass of brain cells here. It's not that, Dad, but we... Well, never mind, David. <laughs> At least turn that thing off then, will you, Patrick? <laughs> what difference would it make? It could still hear, couldn't it? Well, what is it then? Well, it's... it's about Mother. So, she put you up to this, did she? I thought the truth would come out sometime. Dad, listen... She's trying to stop this experiment from the beginning. She thought she could blackmail me into quitting by leaving me, and she still does. Now Patrick. she's using you as a go-between. Patrick, That's true, listen it? a I've minute, won't enough. you? We haven't heard a word from Janice. We don't even know where she is. That's what we've come to talk to you about. Oh, have you? Well, how could I know where she is? Well, because you were the last person seen with her, Dad. I was. Don't you remember, Patrick? You took her into town with uh, you. you. You wouldn't tell any of us why. Yes, of course, the moment I've forgotten, but what of it? Well, don't you remember what happened then? Of course I remember. She left me, that's all. Well, where, Dad? Where did she leave you? Well, what I, were you doing? I don't know. We were in some big public building, city hall, courthouse, taxis or something... Next thing I knew, she'd simply disappeared. I... Is that all? Didn't yeah. she say anything? Didn't she at least tell you why she was going? No, I remember what she said. It's been a week or more. I've hardly slept. You know, I've been working night and day. Yes, that's just it, Patrick. What do you mean by that? Patrick, you say this. The, the brain communicates well, with you. Tells yes. you things about his past life. Suggests thoughts. Yes, Well, yes. if the brain can make you think of things, mightn't it also be able to make you forget things? You're out of your mind. Dad, are you sure... Are you sure you don't know what's happened to Mother? No, I tell you, no, I but don't Patrick, know. Patrick, don't you see what you might have done? What? In heaven's name, stop now while there's still time. Get out of here. While there's still time to help Janice, if there is. While there's still time to help yourself. Shut off the current. Get Let the brain out. die. Kill it, Patrick. Kill it. Get out, both of you. Get out. Get out. <laughs> August 26th, the brain continues to communicate thought fragments more and more easily, but nothing further on what I've come to think of as the plan. I'm now sleeping a great deal, but my dreams are becoming increasingly troublesome, although I'm at a loss to analyze them. Most frequent is a sort of vast cosmic ballet presided over by the colossal figure of a young man whom I seem to recognize, yet I never, never see his face. It's as though the entire population of the Earth were moving past him in review at his command. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Now. Do it now. Now. Sure, sure, now. Help! Help me, someone! Help! Shrap! Dad, let go, Dad! David! Head to Dad. Never mind, I hear help me with Shrap. He's fainted. No, no, David, don't let him. It's yeah. all right now. Here's a glass of water. Yeah. What's the matter? You're trembling all over. I... You're looking I at can't... me that way for you. Look, you look uh, frightened after death. Dad, you... What happened here? Anyway, I came and found you on the floor with your hands around your own throat. Dad went for me. Why is your luggage all packed? I was going to leave. Leave? In the middle of the night? Why? Because The fuse I... box has been opened. It was you, Schrott. You were going to shut off the current. You were going to kill the brain. Patrick, you tried to strangle me. What? It's true, Dad. That's why I had to slap you. But that's absurd. I came in here and found Schrott with his hands around his own throat. He was strangling himself. Dad, please, think a minute. Nobody can strangle himself. Look at these marks on my throat. No. You think I could have done that? What's it? Not possible, and yet... It's true, Patrick, that I tried to shut off the current. I was afraid for you. 
But as I opened the fuse box, I heard the delta waves in the laboratory suddenly become stronger and louder than they'd ever been before. And then... Then... Then I... Yes. Then the brain knew... You even spoke in Donovan's voice, Donovan's Patrick. Voice, his that voice. recurring phrase of his, sure, 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 in his very tones, sure, his very sure, accent. Sure. You've created a monster, Patrick. It has the power to make me commit murder. The brain, the brain must die. Pull the switch in the fuse box, Patrick. It will only be a matter of seconds, yes. and then. Yes, I, I. But I. But I... You've got to, Patrick. Shrot, David, help me. I can't move. Come yes, to me. You... Pull the switch, honey. Shrot, David, go on. You? You too? It's paralyzed, this huh? The brain won't let itself be killed. Then, then it has the power to live on. And on. To command us as long as we live. To make us do anything it wants. To kill. Murder. Dead. What are we going to do? Listen. Uh, it's the brain. It's... It's... Laughing. Laughing. September 7th, Schrott has left. He had to, of course, for his own protection, if nothing else. Before he left, he swore to eternal secrecy and was going to try to find Janice. The very thought that any harm might come to her through me is enough to drive me almost mad. As for David, although he's strong enough to prevent any untoward accidents, I don't know, he's, he's volunteered to stay with me. I, he'll sleep at night behind locked doors. We must devote every faculty we possess together and independently to finding a way of destroying the brain. Perhaps while it sleeps, although it seems to have developed tremendous powers of the subconscious which operate even in sleep. The recurring dream, the now oppressive sense of some further task to be performed continues. If Janice were only here, even her presence I know would help immeasurably to combat this fearful thing terrible thought crosses my mind. Could Trot have left if the brain had not, for some reasons of its own, actually wanted him to leave? September 10th. My thoughts are less and less my own. The dream of the young giant bestriding the earth, the figure without a face, pursues me now, even in my waking hours. Increasingly, I seem to live in a world of evil fantasy, peopled and controlled by the mind of William Donovan. It's not much time, but time enough. Time enough. Sure, sure, sure. Time enough. Sure, sure. Uh, hello? Who is it? Patrick. Oh, Janice. Janice, my darling. Janice. Hello, Patrick. Oh, sweetheart. How oh. Are you, Patrick? Oh, I'm well enough. I'm well enough. But, Dennis, where have you been? Janice, why did you leave me that day? Why didn't you at least tell me? Where did you go down here? I was with friends. Well, did Trot tell you anything? No, nothing special. Well, Janice, I know I haven't been a very good husband these last months. I haven't been very kind or very considerate or even civilized. I, I haven't been myself, Janice. I know, Patrick. My poor darling. If you'd only known how I missed you after you left, how I needed you... I need your help, Jess. I Terrible. know, Patrick. Terrible. I, I came back to help you. But... But what? Where's David? Well, he's asleep in the next room. That is, lately he's tried to make the point to sleep only when I didn't. I'm trying to keep an eye on things. Patrick, I'm going to help you. Oh, All I can. Any way I can. 
But first, uh, I want to take David away. David? Why? Because I don't think it's good for him to be here. No? I don't think that you... Uh, Patrick, I don't want to torment you. It's only that perhaps we can find a way, if we know all the facts. What, Janice? I... Don't you know, really, where I was? No, how could I? Don't you remember where you took me? Where? I took you? I don't... You took me to a psychiatric, psychiatric clinic. Psychiatric clinic? You had me committed to a madhouse. Madhouse, Janice. No, that... Not you, Donovan. Donovan. It was because I tried to make you stop the experiment. Yes. Kill the brain. As you left me there, you even spoke in Donovan's voice. Sure, 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 you said. Sure, sure. I thought they were the last words I would ever hear you speak. Oh, Janice, forgive me. Forgive me, Ben. I couldn't persuade anyone. I was sane. Oh, sweet. After what you told them. Everything I said only made them think I was mad. Hmm. I'm not mad. Am I, Patrick? I'm not mad. Am I? Am I? Janice will be gone for some three hours. I've sent her into town for Dr. Zanger, the psychiatrist. Maybe he can help, but now suddenly I'm... I, I, I'm... I'm overcome with the thought of the humiliation I shall have to suffer when other, other medical men become aware of the position I'm in. It'll be the end of my career and my reputation or my hopes. But folly to think that Zanger would keep it to himself, indeed, I... He'd have no right to. I, I I, can bear it if I must, but another way, a possibility, occurs to me, and I've, I've been thinking it over. There's no harm in trying it in any event. I, I must try. I, I have three hours. David! David! Yes, sir? Da David, what's your blood type? Do you know your blood type? Matter of fact, I, well, I don't think I do. Why? Uh, no matter. We can easily find out. David, I, I think at last I know a way. To kill the brain? It's simple. It's perfectly natural. And yet nine chances out of ten is something Donovan has never known about. I, I'll do it myself. Unfortunately, my blood type and his are... Uh, they're the same. Transfusion? Uh, of course. I have to replenish the blood substance periodically. Anyway, it's about time to do it again. I, I've always used my own because it was the same type as his. But if you, you, yours is a different type. The right type, David. You mean the wrong type? You, you, yes, you've given the wrong... The brain... The, the brain will die, given the wrong type. Yeah, it's possible. I, I, I'm sure of that. I know it. But suppose uh, the brain yes. knows it, it, knows other things. I, I, I've thought of that. It's a chance we'll have to take if you're willing, David, my boy. Of course I am, uh, Then Dad. we'll take the blood sample now. Come into the laboratory. We only have the right blood type. Sure. Rather the wrong type. Now, if you haven't, we'll find someone who has, maybe. Maybe Schrott. Now, lie down there on the table, David. We, we want a tourniquet on your arm here. A I'll small put it on. syringe will do it. Go ahead. I'm ready. David, don't watch me. It'll be easier if you easier if you don't. For me. That's a funny one. Coming from you. Well, the doctors are never quite as steady with members of their own family, you know. Ready? Sure. Ready? <clears throat> here we are. You you all right? Yeah. Yeah. You'll be through in just a second. You, you're getting it all yes, right? Yes, sure, sure. Just a second now. Dad, I... I'm sleepy. You'll be over it in a minute. But what's the matter? Why am, why am I so sleepy? You'll be all right. Sleepy. So sleepy. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. That's what an anesthetic is for. Make you sleep. I was somewhat surprised to find the instrument sterilized, already laid out, but I worked more rapidly and skillfully than ever before in my life, I think. 
I made an incision just below the hairline, laying back the scalp as far as the base of the skull. I trepanned the cranium at two centimeter intervals, working back and downwards to the upper edge of the occipital bone. With the Geely saw, I cut through the connecting bone structure and removed the entire top of the cranium, placing it in saline solution to preserve it. I made a semicircular incision in the dura mater, laying it to one side, exposing the brain. As I dissected out the facial, auditory, and pneumogastric nerves to free the medulla oblongata, I, I, I became conscious of an insistent clamoring, something like a mounting hysteria in the distant reaches of my mind. I, almost as strong as the irresistible compulsion that drove me on. But my hand did not falter. With a sure stroke, I severed the spinal cord just below the first cervical nerve. As I make this last entry with that awful guilt upon my soul, even now I cannot fully comprehend how it has been possible for any man by mortal or immortal means to be driven to such a crime. Even the divinity himself did not demand of Abraham that final sacrifice of expiation. When he, with his only begotten son, ascended the Mount of Olives. Hmm. Perhaps Schrott is right. Perhaps there is indeed in man some spark of the divine that will elude our test tubes and our laboratories until the end of time. Perhaps that is the one thing that even Donovan did not foresee. I only know that at the instant my son died under my own hand, I was set free. At that instant, I saw and understood for the first time that monstrous plan born in the brain of William Donovan, of which I was to be the instrument. It was the plan I had glimpsed but never grasped in the recurring dream. Donovan did aspire to the domination of the world. And with those tremendous mental faculties that I myself had given him, it was literally within his power to become the absolute ruler of all mankind. Only one thing was lacking, a body, a body, a young, strong body into which those ever-growing brain cells could graft and affix themselves to live on, and on perhaps for centuries. He chose the body of my son, and now my son, last too late. I am free to destroy this foul thing of my creation. I know it as surely as I know that my own life must be forfeit. And the brain also knows. I can hear the disturbed, erratic oscillations of the delta waves coming through the laboratory door. But there's no room left in me now for fear. I shall take the six steps from the desk where I'm writing this across to the laboratory door. How often I've taken them in happier times. I shall open the door, close it behind me for the last time, and write finis to the mortal life of Patrick Arthur Corey and the brain of William Horace Donovan. May others learn from the record I leave here the lessons I have learned so bitterly and profit by them. And for the things that I have done, may God have mercy on my soul. Phoenix, Arizona, September the 15th. 
The bodies of Dr. Patrick Arthur Corey and his son David were found in Dr. Corey's own laboratory early today. Young Corey had apparently died on the operating table as a result of a delicate brain operation performed by his father. In the case of Dr. Corey, medical authorities gave us their opinion that he might have died of shock as a result of the unsuccessful operation on his son. A curious feature of the case was the fact that numerous pieces of tissue identified as being from a human brain were found scattered about the laboratory floor, while a larger section of brain was found in the midst of an elaborate apparatus, evidently part of a scientific experiment. Medical authorities stated, however, that they were unable to explain the nature of the apparatus and that the brain itself was in such a state of decomposition as to indicate that it had been dead and slowly decaying for at least three months. Dr. Corey is survived by his wife, Janice. She was committed to the county asylum for the insane late this afternoon. Burial of Dr. Corey will be at the Mount of Olives Cemetery. And so closes Donovan's Brain, Part 2. The completion of two half-hour presentations of Kutz Yodmak's story presenting Orson Welles as star of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Did you know that these Roma Wine suspense dramas are setting a record for the millions of delighted listeners they are attracting? We want you to feel that by tuning in the suspense program every week, you can count on real radio enjoyment. Well, in even more dramatic style, the popularity of Roma Wines is also record-breaking because Roma Wines are by far... America's largest selling wines. Millions make sure of great wine enjoyment simply by asking for Roma wines. Here's something else these millions have discovered. You don't need fancy glassware or a special occasion to enjoy these zestful, taste-delighting Roma California wines. Roma wines possess lip-smacking flavor and zest because they come from Roma Wines' own wineries right in the heart of the magnificent California wine grape districts. And you can enjoy them as a daily delight, because the cost is only pennies a glass. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Orson Welles. Next week, Mr. William Spear tells me, and he'd like me to pass the information on to you, that suspense will bring two exceptionally fine artists, Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, in a play by one of radio's outstanding authors, Lucille Fletcher. I want to hear that, and I know you will too. Money invested in war bonds now helps ensure a healthy, prosperous post-war America, the kind of America we will want for our children as well as ourselves. Don't forget, then, next Thursday you will hear Ida Lupino and Vincent Price in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.